Meteorites are not observed at this time. Dominated 24,000 years ago. Living conditions are optimal. What is the left? Despite the favorable conditions for the developed consumerist format of society has been predominant last 6,000 years. Probability of civilizations. Analysis. Analyzing development scenarios specific to humans, the current consumerist format of society. The probability of zero. Is there any chance for civilization to survive? A chance. The probability of prolonging humanity's life is in the format of society, from consumerist to creative. Contact with alien intelligence? Contact is taking The contact is taking place. What would humanity has the right to know? Welcome to the GLOW Project, Kaleidoscope of Facts, number 10. Topic about Anunnaki. We are live and brought in 26 languages simultaneously and thousand platforms. Today, we will learn about Anunnaki and their mission here on Earth and read the truth from the fiction in the sea of information. Thanks to the programs with particular vision and need of on Alatar TV, today we have valuable facts. To thank every single volunteer of Alatra International Public Movement that had together this important information forward. How secret that there are millions of others that have life on them. So we cannot say Earth is the only one that supports life. Stand that paleo contact has existed and exists. There is a lot of evidence that proves this. Yet it is revealed to us. But why wait and rely on? Let's examine, study, and research the topic of us together right now. Again, we are looking forward to your comments and questions. Please write them in the Share this broadcast on social media with your friends, as you know that they'd be left out. We have seen and read many of your questions before many emails and people cannot wait any longer. We are excited. So let's begin. Humanity deserves
Миллиарды светлых для того, чтобы добыть здесь The most beautiful, the most magnificent super ships crash on our planet. The modern human doesn't understand that there are perfect things. Will there be official contact with humanity? Blink. We live in such exciting times that we have representatives of Anunnaki making a direct contact with us. This means that humanity still has a chance to unite and build a creative society. Otherwise, do you think they would waste their time on us? The being answered by Jana, the Anunnaki. This TikTok account is visited by millions of people worldwide. It gathers millions of views and hundreds of thousands of comments in all languages. It is incredible that today we have an opportunity to communicate with the highly developed species, the Anunnaki and ask questions directly. You might recognize Jana by her blinking that no one can repeat. She reveals prophecies about our time and the future. She shares facts and information about Anunnaki and even showed her spaceship at someone's comment request. And now, the whole world community is impatiently waiting for the next videos to come out. An account, LNSoul28, is being run by an assistant curated by Jana, who has entered an agreement and is responsible for her account on TikTok. An assistant is answering the questions based on Jana's direct communication or ask her our questions when he doesn't know the answers. From all the comments, what we know so far is that Anunnaki is a human race who serves God, friendly, highly developed, and peaceful. They're here to help us advance and unite in order to survive the upcoming global cataclysms. Anunnaki can help us to develop both morally and technologically so we can start colonizing other planets. Figuratively speaking, they are a repairman of the universe. Janna is from the closest planet to us, Vamfim, an artificial planet Anunnaki created for themselves. Many are wishing to take an interview with Janna, but we are all in the same conditions where she answers the questions we ask on TikTok. We are her assistant. No special treatment. This is a unique chance for every person, no matter the status or location, to get a direct access to the information. 
And this is what we call transparency and openness of information for all in a creative society. Let's watch some fragments with Jeanne from TikTok and learn more about Planet One theme. Anunnaki. In one of the programs you said that the Anunnaki come from the planet Nibiru or Nubiru, which means... I'll say it again, everywhere is written as Nibiru and many pronounce Nibiru. There was no such expression or such a phrase as Nibi. It was Nubi from that side. Nubira. Yes, and Ra was precisely the concept of the sun, well, one God and the sun. And at that time you said that it is precisely translated as from behind the sun, right? But you also said that it is not the real name of the planet. And the question is the following, what is the real name of this planet? Shall we tell them? Well, tell them, come on, it is not a secret. Vamfim. I hope you're satisfied. Is it a native planet of the Anunnaki? No, it is the closest planet where the Anunnaki live. It is the closest to planet Earth in general. Let's say in addition to Vamfim, the Anunnaki have thousands of planets where the human race, we call it this way, of the Anunnaki lives. Vamfim. Archaeological facts. In the temple of the sun, Koricancha in Cusco, Peru, a planet is depicted. Supposedly, it is a planet Vamfim. Moreover, an artifact depicts a moment when alien creatures transfer knowledge to the Earthlings. On the Sumerian cylinder VA243, there is a celestial map. It depicts recently discovered planets as well as the mysterious planet Vamfim. In our times, Vamfim was mentioned by the famous Bulgarian soothsayer Banga. She said that the Earth is attended by the extraterrestrial spaceships which we so primitively call flying sorcerers, from the planet that is called Vamfim in the language of its inhabitants. You cannot see that, but a lot of strange aircraft are now in the sky. I see three people inside every aircraft. I hear words, a great event is being prepared. They don't explain what kind of event, they say that they want to help us. All of them are healers, they can cure many diseases, they are transparent, they look like a human reflection in the water, they constantly observe us. Jana, people ask, is it true that Anunnaki can see all people on the planet in real time? Yes, it's true. Anunnaki can indeed see all intelligent beings, and not only on your planet, but in the entire universe, wherever they are. Could you please tell us, how long will it take for a spaceship to fly from one theme to Earth? Well, almost instantaneously. Actually, most of the time is spent on the Earth's atmosphere, because it is very dense and energy is needed to pass through it. It takes a little time, at that it is also necessary to remain invisible. Sometimes one of the aliens takes me by the hand and leads to their Earth. When I come there, I walk on the ground through to the stars, as if I trample on them. Those who take me there move very fast. On their Earth, everything is amazingly beautiful. I just lack words to describe the beauty of their nature. According to earthly standards, a day on one theme is 25 hours and the force of gravitation is 37% less than on Terra. By the way, this is absolutely the same as you had on Terra just a few million years ago. Jana, could you please tell us, is there a winter on one theme? Of course not. We have a very pleasant and stable climate all over the planet, because Vamfim is an artificial planet, and unlike Earth, it doesn't depend on a star. We do not have salt waters, but there is an ocean of fresh water, while exotic fish species that on your planet live in salt water, on our planet live either in aquariums or on specialized farms. Does it rain on Vamfim? Of course it does. 
are the trains only according to a schedule and on Manfim we have over a million different varieties of flowers, including some from the earth. Do not you have a kindergarten, schools and universities? We certainly don't have schools and universities. Information and skills are acquired almost instantaneously. Because why spend so much time on that? Don't like you have a president, deputies, a government or a leader, a king? Is there anyone in charge? Of course not. And Anunnaki have no concept of power because it's a highly developed civilization. Everyone is equal there. Everyone is responsible for each other. And we have long had what you call the ideal society. Jana, could you please tell us? Do Anunnaki know what love is? Of course, because this is what we solely live by. It gets even more interesting. In a minute, you will see a video. On Jana's suit, we can see a reflection of a dancing silhouette. Please write your comments now if you can see it too, or write what you can see. We would love to hear from you. This is what we were able to compare it to. Don't blink. Let's watch that video now. So this is what we can see, a silhouette dancing, we can, we can see that he or she has something that looks like a watch and is holding a bag which could be an artificial additional consciousness. Guys, we really do find a lot of artifacts around the globe that have these attributes with such indications. Also, from TikTok comments, we know that Anunnaki are repairmen of the universe. Wow, such a huge job! True, we cannot even fix a refrigerator when it breaks. Talking about fixing a universe is way beyond my imagination. Dear friends, thanks for watching us live. Stay tuned, as we have many topics to discuss today. We will even travel to the Vatican for answers. We also know that contacts have always happened. Please share with us in the comments, what would you do if you met an alien right now? You know what? Even I have seen UFOs flying above my head. And I really think that now there are more people that have seen UFOs today than there are ones that have never seen them. Guys, please comment if you have seen any UFOs in the comments below. And speaking of spaceships, we are happy to have Rodrigo Fuenzalida, director of ION and professional ufologist from Chile. Uh, Rodrigo, welcome. Please tell us more about the types of crafts that you've been observing. My 
My name is Rodrigo Fuenzalida. I am a ufologist trained in the social sciences and with research in sociology and hypnotherapy. I would say most observations in terms of percents report spherical objects. Yes, I would say exactly spherical objects were seen in 50% of all observations. Some say this statistic is larger, over 70% of UFOs are spherical. Their sizes range from 2 meters, the so-called Foo Fighters, up to 200 meters in diameter. Some photos were taken of the sky over Sao Paulo and something strange was discovered with special devices in 1986. That's when the presence of unidentified flying objects was registered. These 25 UFOs were intercepted by five Brazilian Air Force planes. There were between 5 and 12 Mirage F-5E planes, and in the documents related to this investigation it was noted that each of those objects was on average about 200 meters in diameter. And that was very intriguing, because the Brazilian Air Force planes followed the UFOs during the first minutes, and then the UFOs chased back the airplanes. They seemed to be playing with each other. And there is also a certain percentage of all observations, about 10%, when elongated structures are witnessed. Sometimes they are more than one kilometer long. This 10% mentioned above corresponds to elongated cylindrical objects. Discoidal, discoid objects are observed in about 25% of cases. And the sizes of these discoidal objects range from 25-30 meters down to much smaller shapes that actually resemble flying saucers. Some of them are up to 2 meters in diameter on average. A very interesting incident took place in the 80s in France, in Transin-Provence, where Renato Nicolai watched as some similar type small-sized objects were lifting up, leaving burn marks behind them. So, France police, having analyzed these marks, provided a very interesting report. They indicated that the chemical structure of the plants had been altered due to the influence of electromagnetic fields, probably produced by this object. I would say most of the observations around the world witness exactly small spheres, ranging from 50 centimeters or even less up to 1 meter in diameter. The smaller spheres often hover over mountains, over cities, and at times they enter homes. To my understanding, these are the same phenomena that we called Foo Fighters during the Second World War. This gives the idea that some continuous monitoring by these sentient beings is going on through these kind of spheres. These spheres, these devices, they seem to be like UFO drones. They really like their drones. Despite the popularity of drones in the world nowadays, I keep thinking, oh, that's the past of the Foo Fighters. We are mimicking the aliens. And I'm talking about a very high percentage of such observations in various places. I think this is a more rational approach to be near us using some compact device like a scanner without the need to actually being there directly. Now, there are also interesting facts about unidentified submerged objects. These objects make up about 5% of the overall observations, and they look like elongated submarines. For example, unidentified submerged objects in Chile. We know of case when two commercial aircraft registered an object about 18 meters in diameter to north of Chile. Just imagine, 80 meters of some structure moving underwater, and there are such cases almost all over the world. I believe that we need to rub our eyes well regarding this issue, because the idea exists, because the idea exists, these intelligent beings stand much higher than our reality. 
much higher than we can imagine. So this is more or less indicative ratios of these so-called types of the UFOs. And of course there are triangular UFOs that we might say have been quite in fashion. Triangular UFOs were very famous in 1989-1990. I remember how Belgium Major General Wilfried de Brouwer testified he had seen these objects, which were neither NATO planes nor anything else. So these objects make up about 10% of cases in the statistics of observations. And these triangles can be of different sizes. Some of them are about 30 meters in diameter, while other triangular objects are the size of a football field. Such big triangular objects have been found in Europe, America and Southeast Asia. There are also interesting reports of triangular UFOs from Russia in the 1960s. It was a rather global phenomenon that is usually mistaken for experimental prototypes, mainly North American ones. But unlike experimental prototypes, triangular UFOs accelerate to high speeds at an angle of 90 degrees, and no known traditional technology is capable of doing this. I recall an incident we studied here in Chile. It was about a girl who had been abducted by aliens in 1983. We investigated this incident in the 1990s, and it struck me that at that moment the abducted girl saw a rotating orange sphere, and this was confirmed by eyewitness accounts and her neighbors who saw the process. She says that going up inside this sphere, she found herself in a huge space, inside a huge giant space with columns like a hall, like a temple, and it didn't have any technological characteristics either, it was as if you were transferred to another reality. There were several such cases when people entered those objects and appeared in another structure of reality. Therefore, I think that UFOs in some cases are not exactly machines, but but are real stargate portals or teleporters that shift a person to another level of reality. There are other objects, if they are actually machines, that are very high-tech. But I think that this intelligence has surpassed the concept of the machine in our habitual understanding. I mean, they are able to control time. They can move in space the way that seems like magic to us, it is likely that these objects, many of them, are much more than just machines. And about 76% of people have had extremely positive experience. This is the kind of experience that many of them would like to repeat again. It changes their lives. Also about 70% have had experiences of a paranormal nature. Curious, isn't it? In 50% of cases, there was a remission of illnesses, without people actually expecting that. In other words, we are talking about 1,300 people, 50% of 2,600, who had this experience. They had severe illnesses, and they were healed without even asking for it. Thank you, Rodrigo. The videos on TikTok, especially those from the spaceship and the Anunnaki sound music track, made a lot of waves and gained in popularity. They also attracted the attention of many people, including a famous blogger who used to confirm the authenticity of the phenomenon of uh, Jeanne Nazais and her other peculiarities. But after seeing the video recorded from the spaceship, he made a superficial examination and said that these videos were fake. On this basis, the author of the TikTok channel Alien Soul 28, thanks to our friends, referred to experts who conducted authentication of the videos and provided it to us a couple of hours ago, especially for today's kaleidoscope of facts. We are immensely grateful for it and can't wait to watch it together with you. This will be epic.
video authentication. We were asked to verify and authenticate the video posted on the TikTok service on the Alien Soul 28 account and to express our opinion on the matter. Our department is professionally engaged in the detection of information security threats, video technical expertise in a variety of areas, including audio forensics, examination determining falsification of records, detection of signs of video editing, and other changes made to the content of video material during a production process or after its completion. Thanks to technical capabilities and special software, we are able to detect practically any interference in video and audio materials. We were provided with the source material of the whole video in high resolution. The video shows a woman named Jana in a room with a porthole through which our planet is visually observed. We were interested in the video material sent to us and we proceeded to study it. In addition, there was an attached video content from a video blogger who conducted his own independent research and expressed a critical attitude to the version of this video posted on the TikTok service and that was the reason for contacting us. The material we received was tested using specialized software and detailed analysis. This video material was also sent to our colleagues from other departments for independent study. Looking ahead, we should say that they also received a result that confirms our research. A comprehensive analysis confirms that the video is authentic and no external interference is detected. But when comparing it with the video version posted on TikTok, the fact of video editing was established, a small piece of patch that does not change the essence of the initial video and does not affect its authenticity. After the first test, the software showed that the video is authentic. But frankly, we were scared, as we had never encountered anything like this before. Already at the first stage, during the visual examination of the authentic video provided for the detection of obvious signs of editing. Distortion or falsification of the analyzed material. Interruption of the recording and characteristic jumps of the image indicating camera movement at the moment of stopping the recording. Sudden and abrupt changes in lighting. Position of shadows. Sudden changes in other filming parameters were not detected in the source video materials. Other technical aspects were investigated at further stages to establish the originality and the authenticity of the video recording, such as the correlation of the event recorded on the video to the time and place of the filming. A detailed examination of the overall duration of the video recording as such. The authenticity of the video was further confirmed by the following indicators. 1. Uninterrupted video recording throughout its entire duration, 6 minutes 55 seconds. 2. Clarity of the video recording. The quality level of the recording allows to clearly detect the captured objects and small details. 3. The completeness of the video recording. Absence of fragments in the recording where the loss of the image or the sound component could be observed. The echolocation experts also analyzed the room noise using the audio recordings, which also allowed us to determine the approximate volume of the room. The obtained results absolutely strike imagination. What is the size of the entire spaceship if only this one room where Jana was recorded is comparable to the internal volume of the entire ISS? We sent the audio material to the laboratory for audio forensics experts for its detailed analysis. During the audio forensics examination of the full version of the initial audio recording, it was determined that given audio file doesn't have any breaks throughout the entire audio recording. Given audio file is characterized by content completeness of the audio information, absence of technical data denoting the application of software methods of format modification. As well as the use of audio editing software, the absence of evidence of the use of psychoacoustic codecs, as well as marks indicating the use of specialized software 
for processing digital recordings. The absence of signs of anti-aliasing filter application in the recording. The absence of sudden change of the spectral profile in the recorded speech. The absence of sudden distortion of the sound elements of the acoustic space. The absence of changes in the spectral time parameters of the background noise present in the recording, which were not caused by the circumstances in which the audio recording was made. The absence of spectral auditory evidence of a sudden change in the acoustic depth of the recorded speech fragments. The absence of phase shift of low frequency harmonics. The presence of integrity of noise and speech elements of the audio recordings detected during the autocorrelation study. The absence of unexpected jumps in the constant component of the audio signal and the absence of precisely congruent segments of the audio recordings. All the data obtained during the expertise confirm the originality and authenticity of the audio recording. When analyzing the audio recording, special attention was drawn to its background noise. We don't know exactly what experts the blogger was referring to, but what he called a white noise encoding the consciousness of listeners, our experts identified as the hum of our planet and neighboring ones. Spectrograms, frequency analysis, sound analyzers confirmed it. To clarify this point, the hum coming from our planet can be detected in near-Earth orbit. Depending on the coordinates of the object from which the observation is made on the object's location relative to the Earth, this hum will be different. Analysis of the audio recording gives grounds to assert that the hum present on this recording fully corresponds to the object location coordinates in the Earth's orbit, which can also be observed visually. The recording was indeed done at an orbit of corresponding altitude. We have come to the conclusion that a background noise is an additional hint about the position of the object at the moment of recording. Because when the orbit and position of the object changes, the hum changes, which is traceable when comparing the start and the end of the whole video recording. Our attention was also attracted by a fragment of a 17-second piece of music, which was present in the video recording provided to us. At our request, we were kindly provided with a full version of the audio track in high quality with a duration of 86 seconds. We were interested in the fact that throughout this extraordinary musical composition, sounds resembling cosmic noise were clearly present. At our request, our NASA colleagues kindly provided us with audio recordings of near space and outer space noise recorded by Voyager 1 and other spacecraft. This enabled us to compare those sounds to the sounds in the given musical composition. A comparative analysis showed that there are clear similarities between them, but they are not identical. Audio forensics experts confirmed the presence of various transformed vibrations and acoustic signals that could only have been recorded in space. It was detected that these are not sounds synthesized on Earth but a real conversion of electromagnetic vibrations of deep space events into the range of frequencies perceivable by the ear. However, interestingly, the experts concluded that this transformation of acoustic signals emitted by astronomical objects was clearly not made on Earth equipment. Our colleagues have found that the human auditory system is unable to fully decipher the sound image of this audio material because its frequency range far exceeds the range of human auditory perception. With the help of specialized software, in particular, spectrum analyzers, it was possible to detect a lot of acoustic signals going beyond the capabilities of the human auditory system. And only when the original signal was converted did they become available to the human ear. Hence, the question arises, why was it necessary 
to create music with such a frequency spectrum, which the human ear is unable to perceive, and which can be recorded only with a special equipment. This indicates only one fact. The frequency perception range of the creators of this music far surpasses the capacity of the human auditory system. We involved our colleagues, neurophysiologists, specialists in psychoacoustics, cognitive neurobiology of music, as well as other specialists to hold a detailed analysis of the provided audio material. Their expert opinion confirmed the complexity of the composition structure, the logic of compositional thinking, and the use of ultra and infra frequencies, which the human ear is incapable of hearing. But even in the human audible range, a tremendous effect is observed. When listening to this musical composition with headphones, live pictures are emerging in the mind, flowing in continuous motion. The multi-layered sound images and sound spaces immerse all listeners in the sonic atmosphere of space. This cannot be called usual music, because we have not encountered anything similar before. The semantic and aesthetic information embedded in this musical composition is radically different from what human perception is accustomed to. According to neurophysiologists, these sounds evoke a strong brain response, creating live, moving images that form a live picture of the cosmos. Psychophysiological studies have shown that while the subjects were listening to this musical composition, electroencephalograph recorded a significant increase in intracortical interactions and strong increase in the activity of the left brain hemisphere, as evidenced by a decrease of spectral power in alpha and theta frequency. The data obtained indicated that this music has a remarkable positive impact on brain structures. Our colleagues have come to the conclusion that the creators of this musical composition have a completely different mindset. The music content of this work and the very logic of compositional thinking remain a mystery to us. But it is obvious that for the creators of this music, it is alive. It integrates into the work of brain neurons and creates live pictures. Achieving such synchronization of music with the work of brain structures is extremely difficult. Experts are confident that what we were able to perceive is only a small spectrum of what is contained in this composition. It is impossible to create such a musical composition in earthly conditions. Based on the fact that this musical composition revealed sounds of clearly unearthly origin, spreading into infra and ultra sound, which exceeds the range of human auditory perception, and its compositional technique is based on principles unknown to us. Our colleagues concluded that obviously this musical composition was not created for the human ear, but for beings with an expanded perception of sound for whom it reveals itself in full. Thus, we came to the conclusion that the provided video is real. We understand the people who have contacted us. What we saw and heard was really astonishing, and it brought up many questions. In addition, according to our analysis, we do not understand how the blogger, who is the reason for contacting us, could not notice or correlate so many details and analyze this video in such a superficial way. We have watched his content, where he conducts the research on various video and photo materials, quite competently at an amateur level, and he has a rather detached, independent, comprehensive research approach. Along with that, the software he uses is good enough and can detect 99.9% .9 of fakes. In his videos, the mentioned video blogger recognizes and proves the authenticity of abnormal manifestations in Jana's physiology and of additional membranes in her eyes as well as other deviations from the usual forms. Despite all this, when faced with a video fragment with Jana on a spaceship, this blogger immediately called the video a fake, practically without examining it. Even more surprising for us was that he drew conclusions by analyzing the video posted on TikTok service, which compresses the video quality by many times, and makes it difficult to determine the authenticity of the video, because it is much easier 
to carry out an objective examination by studying the uninterrupted original video material or video in good quality. At the same time, we noted that the presentation of information in the video provided to us was very uncharacteristic for the blogger's presentation style. The blogger made a very quick and superficial analysis. And while watching this video, you can clearly see the individual fear. Obviously, he was just scared. Most likely, his conclusions are a defensive mechanism of his consciousness, a banal cognitive dissonance. While denying the obvious, he thus tries to keep inner comfort by rejecting the reality of what he saw. Frankly speaking, we were also very scared when we faced this video and conducted the research. This is where the difference between a professional and an amateur lies, because a professional relies on real facts, not on a personal subjective opinion. In addition, we decided to use the software that this blogger uses in his videos in order to check whether this software could really indicate that this video material is falsified. And for understanding and visual objectivity, we will compare this investigated video material with many other high-quality pictures taken from the official sources. Such software, which is freely available on the internet, can be also used by anyone to conduct his own research. So, let us proceed directly to the research itself done with the special software used by the blogger. And now together with you, we will see if this software really gave the blogger even the slightest reason to doubt the authenticity of this video, or was it a domination of his human fear over reality? We are now showing a freeze frame from a video that we have authenticated and do not doubt its originality. This is the video with Jana. This freeze frame is taken from the video version posted on the TikTok service in order to analyze the video in the same conditions as this blogger did his research. First, we will examine this image with an application of error level analysis filter. This filter shows whether the photo is completely authentic or the parts from other images have been added to it. Namely, each image has individual characteristics. Each image has its own size, its own noise structure, which is not repeated in any of the other images, its own contrast, brightness, and many other characteristics. Therefore, in case when different photos are combined in one image or different parts of video are combined in one, using software to check authenticity, you will be able to see extraneous details. Those details will stand out for their brightness, for their individual color, present only on those subjects and not seen anywhere else in the image. Also, they will stand out for their noise structure and noise size, wherein all these details will change disproportionately to other details with the loss of quality. However, in this case, by checking the freeze frame of Jana on the spaceship using this filter, we can independently verify that signs of tampering are not detected in the video. The only sign of overlapping can be noted with a gradual decrease of the image quality and is slightly visible to the right of Jana. It is a small overlapping layer that changes its color, which differs from the surrounding background. But we will consider it in more detail further. The rest of the image, although it is compressed in quality, changes quite evenly and equally throughout the photo. All the colors present in the photo are evenly distributed throughout the image. All glares and light areas are visible throughout the entire processing with this filter, and they change with the same intensity throughout the photo as the image quality changes. All noise in the image is uniform, of the same size and structure. There are no distinct details which are radically different in color from the others. Next, let us analyze the same freeze frame using the noise analysis filter. When this filter is applied, no parts are radically different in color or in structure from the noise of the surroundings. The image noise and all the colors present in it are quite evenly distributed throughout the image. The size of the noise grains in the different parts is the same. This indicates that this video is authentic. Now, let us see what the falsified images look like. 
At first glance, with superficial visual examination, it is not immediately clear whether the picture is authentic or not. However, after checking the image with the error level analysis filter, the inserted detail immediately catches the eye. It looks very bright compared to the rest of the image and differs in color from the surrounding background. By reducing the image quality with this filter, we see that the original background is very different from the inserted object in color, structure, and size of noise grains. In addition, when the image quality is compressed, this object acquires a bright yellow color, which is observed only on this inserted object. On closer examination, you can notice that the size and structure of the noise in the inserted object differs not only from the original background, but also the details inside this object differ in the structure and size of the noise grains. This indicates that the image is combined from details of different quality. Let us also look at this image with the noise analysis filter. It is immediately noticeable that the original background is absolutely different from the inserted object, which has a bright yellow color that stands out. This color is present only on this object. When checking it using this filter, you can notice that the size of the noise grains and its structure in the inserted object are different from the original background. For an additional example, let us analyze well-known images of the lunar program, which can be found independently on the NASA official website. These images are in the public domain. Anyone can download them and conduct a similar examination with us. To begin with, we will examine some of the images taken during the Apollo 11 mission. As an example, we will analyze this picture. Already at the first visual examination, we can see that some details, particularly the astronaut, the section of the lunar module, and the flag look less contrasting to the background and therefore are not realistic enough. Let us note the astronaut and lunar module depicted in the image. Upon visual exploration, it is necessary to consider the factors that are specific to the shooting location. Since the moon has no atmosphere, the shadows and everything within them are supposed to be charcoal black. But while in the shadows, the astronaut and lunar module appear to be illuminated from all sides. Who illuminates them? If they were additionally illuminated from the viewer's side, the shadow would drop in a different direction or in completely another way. If we look at the flag, it has no drop shadow, even though there are both well-illuminated areas and shadows on the very flag. This indicates that this object has been artificially inserted. Moreover, the flag appears to be fluttering in the wind, which is impossible on the moon. Due to the lack of atmosphere on the moon, the stars in the sky should be well visible in the picture even in the daytime. However, in this case, both on this and on all other pictures of the lunar program, the stars are not observed, which is also questionable because technically it would not be difficult to capture them. Therefore, this detail is another reason to assume that the pictures were taken in the pavilion. We proceed to examine this image using software. Now, we are going to look at this image with the application of the air level analysis filter. When this filter is applied, the bright details immediately become noticeable. Namely, a bright flag that stands out in colors is noticed at once. The color and noise structure of this object are very different from the color and noise structure of the background. The objects on the right, the lunar module, the astronaut, and the glow from the sun also stand out in a different color. These objects differ in color, size, and noise structure from the flag and background, indicating that all these details were taken from different images that have different characteristics and quality. By reducing the quality of the image with this filter, it can be observed that the changes in all these details occur differently and independently of each other, which once again confirms the fact that the photo is compiled from different parts of different pictures. Further on, let us look at this picture using the noise analysis filter. Using this filter, we can see that the flag differs in color and noise structure from the main background. All the details to the right of the background are different in color. 
they have a more colorful noise, which is also different in size and structure from the main background of the picture. Within the background, we can see that the noise has a different size, structure, and density, which indicates that the background has been edited as well. This program allows viewing the metadata of the picture, which stores information about the parameters of the picture, the conditions of its creation, and in what particular software it was edited. This information can partially be found in the properties of the picture as well. In this case, we see that the image was edited using Adobe Photoshop CS2 software. The Windows operating system was used for this purpose. The last editing took place in May 2009. There is an indication of the exact time when the image was last edited in this software, as well as the approximate geographical location where it was edited. This software also includes a string extraction function which displays strings that show the sequence of all the tasks performed when creating this image. As we can see, this image was initially processed in the Adobe Photoshop 3.0 software, where a certain number of actions were performed. Later, the image was already edited using the Adobe Photoshop CS2 software, with the help of the Windows operating system in 2009. With this function, you can see the code of all the actions when creating this picture, which sites this photo was additionally uploaded to, and which licenses were used in this process. A similar history of photo editor's usage can be traced when examining many other lunar program photos from NASA official website. If even software programs that are in the public domain give such results and show such accurate data, then our software programs have tremendous possibilities. With such programs, it is possible to get not only details about a document's date of creation, which programs were used for editing, the number of operations to whom the files were sent, and through which sites the exchange occurred, but also get detailed information about all the persons who perform these manipulations with the files, their addresses and IP addresses of all the persons directly or indirectly involved in the creation of this material. This information is not necessary for you, thus we will not disclose it. After all, digital information does not disappear as long as the carrier exists a photo or a video. No matter how hard one tries to hide the data, we can easily identify it. After all, one can only try to hide information from amateur software programs, which are in the public domain, but not from professional software programs. The only way to hide data is to destroy the file. As long as the file exists, the information that it contains and which is stored within the file will not disappear. As for the video material from Jana Spaceship, a detailed examination of the information contained in this video revealed no traces of tampering by third-party software or editing tools. Going back to the lunar program, let us briefly analyze some more images. The first thing you notice when visually examining this photo is the absence of stars in the sky, which is impossible even when this side of the moon is illuminated by the sun. As mentioned earlier, it would not be difficult to capture the stars on camera unless it was filmed in the pavilion. The illogical placement of the object's shadow is noticeable. Only the shadows from the device in the foreground are fully visible. The shadow falling from the astronaut is almost invisible. And on the astronaut himself, the shadow looks very transparent, although it should look black and non-transparent. Under the large size lunar module, in the background there is a small and barely perceptible shadow drop from its legs. After all, the ship is quite large and it has both a well-lighted side and a shaded side from which a fairly large shadow must have been projected onto the lower plane. If we look at the flag, which is located near the lunar module, when it is zoomed in 
instead of a red color, a blue one is displayed on it. Looking at this photo with the air level analysis filter, we see that the details of the main background are highlighted in a different color, and sky is completely distinct from the main image in color, structure, and noise size. This indicates its artificial origin and disharmony in relation to other details of the photo. We have found that this image has been re-uploaded to the NASA website. In the general collage, we have shown the data of the software in which the image was re-edited. But let us compare again the metadata of these images. It only indicates that the images are constantly being refined and improved. Let us look at another image. Visual examination also shows the absence of stars in the sky. Moreover, inconsistency is immediately noticeable in the fact that the flag flutters in the wind, which is impossible on the moon. The flag fabric casts a shadow on the flagpole, but does not cast a shadow on the surface of the moon, indicating that the image has been inserted. When checking the photo using the air level analysis filter, it is visible that flag, sky, and shadows differ in color from the rest of the background details. Now, we will demonstrate the rest of the images of the lunar program, which were analyzed both visually and with the software, which also clearly reveals photo editing. Based on all the research done on these lunar program images, we can assume that they obviously used a pavilion, models, the best equipment at the time, the best specialists were involved, and great resources were spent to create them. Nevertheless, modern software can uncover a fake, even if creation of this material is done at this level of process organization. Once these images were digitized, it became possible to track all further manipulations and attempts to improve this photographic material. Track a detailed history of all actions as well as all information related to this material. Thanks to special software, we see everything. We clearly see that despite the number of times these images have been modified and resaved, they are still disproven both by visual examination and by software analysis. Now let us take another look at what the original spaceship was Jana looks like and compare it to the images from the ISS space station, which you can take from the NASA official website. This is how the image of Jana on the spaceship looks like when the noise analysis filter is applied. Everything looks very harmonious. The noise is evenly and homogeneously distributed throughout the image. There are no separate bright, standout objects in the picture. Let us look again at this freeze frame by applying the air level analysis filter, which shows that this image doesn't contain any bright standing out parts, which would be additionally inserted in it except for the previously mentioned patch. Now, let us look at the images of the ISS astronauts. As the air level analysis filter shows, the noise is homogeneous throughout the image with the same structure and color. There are no separate, distinctive details on the image. The colors are evenly distributed and each color is present in different parts of the image throughout the picture. You can see that the image looks completely uniform. Noise appears to be of the same size throughout the picture. If we analyze this picture with the noise analysis filter, we will see that the noise all over it looks homogeneous monotonous, the same colors are present in all areas of the picture. That is, it is evenly distributed noise. Let us look at some more pictures from the ISS. In this picture, we see that all the objects fit perfectly into the environment. All the colors are evenly distributed throughout the picture. Exactly the same thing we can observe when applying the noise analysis filter. Noise looks uniform throughout the entire image. There are no bright distinctive details. All the colors present in the picture are present in different parts of the image. The same result can be observed in other pictures with astronauts aboard the ISS.
For the purity of the experiment, we check pictures from other sources. For example, let us analyze a picture taken in completely different conditions and under completely different lighting than the previous pictures. However, in this image, we can also see a similar case as in the other pictures. That is, after applying the air level analysis filter, we do not see any bright standalone objects. The size and structure of the noise grains are homogeneous throughout the picture, as well as the colors are evenly distributed throughout the image, and each color is present in all areas of the picture. The same result can be seen when the noise analysis filter is applied to this image. We were surprised by the fact that the blogger who positions himself as an expert said that Jana's head was separately edited in the video. Supposedly, the head was really filmed and the suit and the video background were artificially made with video editing software. Here is an example of another filter that can be used to check this. With this filter, we can see that Jana's head looks different and more embossed than the rest of the picture. At the same time, the background looks dull and merges with the suit. This blogger assumes that the suit and the background were created separately with the help of video editing software, and the head was filmed on a chroma key and edited into the video. Since in this image, we can see that the face is also different in relief from the hair we can assume that only the face was shot on camera and edited into the video, which is impossible. If we analyze this freeze frame ourselves with this filter, we can see that the suit really fits the environment very well in terms of texture and lighting uniformity. The only fragment that was edited in and which was detected with this filter is the fragment to the right of Jana. This is the only sign of editing, the patch, to which we will return further on. In this video, we can notice a small halo and a turquoise glow around this patch. And by applying this filter, we can see a small relief on the wall that shows the edge of the patch that is added to the background as an overlapping layer. If we look closely at Jana's contour, we are able to see that it is discontinuous, fuzzy, and porous, indicating that there are no sharp, separately inserted details in the image. The objects in the photo fit very well with the surroundings. We can see that Jana's head has a more distinct relief in relation to the surroundings. It looks brighter and more voluminous. However, Jana's background and suit look much duller. After analyzing a large number of photos with similar lighting, we concluded that all the lighted details of the picture look as voluminous as Jana's face, while all the unlit details look duller and flatter, and may blend together and lose object detailization, unlike the well-lit details. So. The fact that Jana's head looks more voluminous compared to the rest of the details in the image indicates the only fact that this part of the photo is more illuminated than all other areas in the picture. We can also pay attention to the clouds covering the planet. Their color is different and their degree of illumination also differs from the surrounding environment. So they look more embossed and volumetric than the surrounding background. Now, we will look at pictures with similar lighting, as in the freeze frame of the video from Jana's spaceship. These are photos of astronauts aboard the ISS that were taken under the same conditions with the same lighting. Now, we can compare the original picture of Jana from the spaceship and the picture of the astronaut on board the ISS. The image from the ISS looks the same as Jana's image in terms of illumination. The surroundings in the picture are darker, face and hands are most illuminated. The earth, visible in the porthole, is also sufficiently illuminated. Now, we will look at this picture using the filter we used earlier to analyze the freeze frame of Jana. So, we see a similar result to the one we had when examining the freeze frame from Jana's spaceship. Namely, the dark details appear dimmer and also look less clear and merge with each other.
a well-illuminated face differs in its brightness and contrast from the darker and dimmer details in the clothing and the surroundings. That is, by comparing the original image and the image with the application of this filter, we clearly see that all the brightened details look volumetric, while all the dark details look dimly and merge into a homogeneous background. On top of that, the earth seen in the porthole looks identical to the earth seen in the porthole on Jana's spaceship. On the earth, shown in the ISS picture, you can see all the voluminous bright areas of the planet, as well as all the dimmer and more homogeneous areas that are less illuminated. In both cases, the clouds that are lighter look more volumetric after applying this filter, and all the darker areas look more homogeneous and dim. You can also see that both women have dark colored hair, and that is why their hair looks concave in relation to their faces after applying this filter. Looking at many other light details, we can see that they appear more voluminous while the dark details merge in low light areas of the image. Let us examine more pictures on board the ISS, which can be found on the official sources. Here, you can see that the image was made with a similar illumination. That is, a person is located near a porthole where both more illuminated and more darkened areas are present. The astronaut's face and arms also stand out for brighter illumination while his clothing is of darker and dimmer colors, as well as the surrounding background. If we apply the same filter to this picture, we will see an identical result when the face is completely separated from the background and is brighter than the surrounding details. In addition, we see that the arms which are lit just as well as the face also stand out for their relief and brightness from the surrounding background. In the porthole, we observe the same result, showing that the light clouds look more voluminous than the solid background. We can see from this picture that the more light falls on the object, the more volume and play of light can be seen on it when this filter is applied. We can analyze another picture showing a woman aboard the ISS. In this image, the woman is in a dark room and dark clothing. The face is well lightened, and there are many highlighted areas on the earth, which can be seen in the porthole. There are also small areas on her hands and clothing that are less lightened. When applying this filter to this picture, we can observe that all the light areas look voluminous and bright, while all the dark areas look dim and uniform, and there are almost no details visible in the dark areas of the image. Proceeding from the results that this picture shows, we can assume that only her face is real, while the woman's body and ship are dim and not authentic and are made with computer graphics software. If not to take into account the fact that the relief of the image, which can be observed by applying this filter, is an indicator of the light intensity of the objects in the picture. For the purity of the experiment, we can additionally analyze any other image downloaded from the internet with a similar type of lighting. In our case, it is an interview with famous people, which was shot with a similar lighting as on board of Jana's ship. In this shot, the face and arms, as well as a few other details of clothing, are well lightened, while the surrounding background is darker. By analyzing this image with this filter, we can also detect that all the dark details in the surroundings and the people's clothes merge with each other and are dimmer in relation to the face, the hands, and the light details of the clothes. Based on this, it is clear that well-lighted areas and darker areas of the photo look different when checked with this software. Therefore, all light areas look more expressive and bright than homogeneous, almost merging dark areas. A true professional, before making rash conclusions, should consider all the facts. Before giving his opinion, he has to understand basic things and especially the software which he uses. To analyze and compare a large number of similar pictures in order to see 
if the examined video is authentic or not. Using the same software and TikTok video which the blogger used, along with you, we have now come to a completely different conclusion. The given video with Jana is absolutely real. We believe that software examination of video material is not the only and main criterion for determining video authenticity. An important aspect is also visual examination in which by comparing and analyzing the factors observed, it is possible to identify many details that cannot be forethought and falsified. Or on the contrary, it is possible to reveal the details that were not taken into account while falsifying the video. During a long-term visual examination, applying the knowledge of biomechanics, it was determined that the head is not separate from the body. With all current software abilities, it is impossible to model the muscle movement in such a perfect and accurate way, and to coordinate movements of body elements. We also drew attention to the location of the glares coming from the light sources, which are completely identical on the suit, in the eyes and within the room in accordance to Jana's movements. Speaking of the suit, the suit tightly fits the body and follows all its curves. Its material has different thickness and density. What attracted our attention most is the material of which the suit is made. We examined Jana's suit in detail under maximum magnification. To date, our database contains samples of all types of existing materials, including fabrics made by nanotechnology. However, this material cannot be matched to any of them. It follows, this is a high-tech, non-woven, multi-layered material not yet known to us. It is unique. Proceeding from all the observations and comparisons, we came to the conclusion that this material is of unearthly origin. Considering all the facts, we assume that the suit is multifunctional and technologically advanced. To date, there is nothing similar to it. In a small video fragment, we notice the appearance of an unknown subject in a reflection on Jana's suit. Zooming in on the video, we could see that the subject moves absolutely synchronously and identically both in the reflection on the suit and in the reflection in the eyes. This is an additional important fact determining the authenticity of occurring phenomena. It is impossible to convey with such accuracy the appearance and all the movements of the subject, taking into account the relief, the surface reflectivity, the placement of light, and many other factors. For a more detailed study, we zoomed in on the suit where this subject is reflected. According to observations, his suit is presumably light gray in color. Its material is obviously similar to Jana's one, taking into account the spatial location, the camera view angle, the reflection relief on Jana's suit, the ratio of the subject's body proportions, in particular the head size in relation to other parts of the body, does not correspond to human parameters. There were also noted unusual, not quite human-like movements of the subject. When comparing the source material and the video version published on TikTok, we notice one difference, which is, according to our research results, the only sign of outside interference in the video. We previously pointed it out. Namely, the TikTok video version appeared to have an overlapping layer on top of the initial frame on a small section of the video image to the right of Jana. It can be easily detected by visual examination. Observing how the shadow on the spaceship surface partially disappears under the static overlapping layer. This can be visually observed in all the fragments of the TikTok video version. A slight turquoise glow around this overlapping layer is also noticeable. A turquoise glow is also seen on the woman's right shoulder. The source of this light was detected during the examination of the initial material. In addition, Turquoise reflections seen on Jana's suit in the lower part of the chest, which had episodic nature, were obviously coming from a certain device located on the bottom front. The turquoise glow 
is also present in the area of the left hand. As we have detected, this glow is emitted from a static device, a part of which is reflected in the porthole as well. It is hardly noticeable in the TikTok video version because the service compresses the quality. However, with a detailed examination of the source material, we were able to examine its appearance. We are unaware of the functional purpose of this device. Moreover, this device cannot be compared to anything else. In the source video, which is much wider than the video posted on TikTok, there are reflections on the right part of the porthole as well as behind it. These are reflections from other devices, which we were asked not to show. For us personally, these and other details became an additional confirmation of the video authenticity. When spaceship material behind the woman is examined under maximum magnification, we can clearly see its structure resembling titanium. By detailed examination and analysis, we detected that it is not titanium. In addition, we compared this material to all of the currently known metal samples present in our database and did not find a single one to have a 100% match with it. This metal is of gold olive color. There are no signs of painting or other coating. The material structure is homogeneous. We cannot name exactly what it is, but it resembles an alloy of certain metals. Let us go back to the porthole. At the first observations, the material of the porthole is transparent, rather thickened. When examining it at highest video magnification while studying and comparing it with different materials, we detected that the structure of this material is very similar to the structure of a crystal. This material appears to be very durable. Due to the fact that we were provided with uninterrupted source material of the video recording, we had the opportunity to watch the video in its entirety and make our observations of the planet movement in the porthole. Now you are watching a speeded up version of the video with the porthole. We are unaware whether this spaceship took off from our planet or not, but according to observations, it is moving away from the Earth. It is quite fast at that. Even proceeding from the fact that the spaceship is moving away from the Earth, shooting this video in terrestrial conditions would require at least a special pavilion with a preliminarily created spaceship model. We emphasize a real model, not a chroma key, taking into account the combination of light and shadows on the woman's suit and in her surroundings. This cannot be repeated with a chroma key. It would require a real model with a real porthole that has an image of the Earth behind it. Once again, this underscores the authenticity of the video and the fact that it is impossible to falsify it. That is, if the Earth were depicted on the screen behind a porthole, a specific glow and shimmer coming from the image would be noticeable. Along with that, the Earth would look completely flat. It would be different from this video in contrast, as well as in other visual attributes. But in the source video, the planet looks as it should. It is voluminous. It absolutely fits into the video according to all parameters, to visual observations and to the results of examination with various software. There is also a very important detail that we could not ignore. The star map is visible in the sky. It is impossible to fake this detail in the conditions of filming in the pavilion. For instance, we all remember the images of the lunar program with no stars depicted in them, which is a cause for concern because the stars are very well visible in outer space. Yet, the star map is clearly seen in the source video. We noted and carefully analyzed the location of the stars relative to the coordinates of the spaceship to the planet Earth and determined that they correspond to the first half of March 2021. It matches the time when this video was supposed to be recorded. That is almost before the release of these video fragments on the TikTok service. Therefore, it is impossible to make a similar film in terrestrial conditions. We find it unreal to create a similar model of a spaceship section in a filming pavilion, taking so many details into account, using currently 
unknown materials and equipment, spending a large number of resources for this work. According to our opinion, it would be much easier to construct a real spaceship and to film a video from orbit. But the question remains, what is the purpose of doing this? To show on the TikTok? From our point of view, this is too much even for Elon Musk. However, we as people would like it to be Elon Musk's project. If it is not his project, then there are even more questions. Because otherwise, we will all have to accept the fact of the existence of higher civilizations. In conclusion, we would like to express our gratitude for addressing us with this video, which not only gave us pleasure in studying it in detail, but also expanded the horizons of subjective perception of a world far beyond our comprehension. Wow, guys. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express our gratitude to uh, the author of uh, the TikTok account Alien Soul 28 for providing us this authentication video. I don't know how about you, but I don't even know where to start. Uh, I mean, <laughs> a lot of things uh, are just running through my mind. Uh, what is happening? Uh, of course, the uh, uh, moon uh, shots, uh, they were debated for a long time, but we are today we are talking about the Anunnaki. And, um, well, we have the proof that uh, Janna shot this video from the spacecraft and uh, everything is authentic. Uh, not saying the same from for the NASA photos. But, uh, you know, uh, what uh, is uh, really comforting is that Anunnaki are here with us and they're communicating with us here and now. Uh, we can ask uh, questions through comments uh, on TikTok and they are often answered. So guys, um, please write your comments down below under this video and uh, tell us what you think about what we just saw. Yes, you know what? And it's also interesting. I really uh, would like to find out what it did say on that little sign that was taken away because it did say some kind of words or some kind of, you know, symbols. So I really like to find out what they are. So it's very interesting because it looks like everything Jana and her assistant for the TikTok account do is not just because it seems like everything they do is on purpose and for us to find out what it is and this was just eye-opening for me i don't know about you but this type of reveal is what we as civilization needed so we can move on and really get to know our friends Anunnaki and don't question that if they're real or fake anymore because it has been proven that they are flying above our heads now. Yes, the expertise is um, really interesting and the first video which was published uh, from space and as engineer uh, was really interesting to consider, to look in, at all the details and I had no uh, doubt that this is the video from space. But after this expertise, after this examination, uh, there is no doubt at all. Also, I would like to share my understandings regarding music because as a viewer, and the viewers on TikTok notice incredible sensations. And when I was listening, you had a feeling that you're flying in space and you see this picture and you hear uh, the sound of the planet and the fact that it's real is just um, wonderful. And that's why everyone was noticing the state, like each cell of your body is reacting to this huge gratitude for, for Anunnaki, for this amazing music. And uh, we also would like to know that I myself was watching this um, examination, which was published by this blogger, and I, it's really disappointed me because it was um, superficially worked. The, the image with the spaceship of Jana, it's um, ideal. 
Right now we encounter with extraterrestrial civilizations such technology to which we still have to grow for a really long time, and this material, as we considered on the last kaleidoscope of facts, in the previous kaleidoscope of facts, where we saw objects which are observed near the sun and they observe the sunlight. And they are um, visible to us, and this is something which is difficult to understand for us. And considering such facts, we clearly see the reflection on the costume, and when you actually pay attention to this, such details, you understand that there can be no doubts. As well as we notice that the spaceship is moving around the orbit, or orbit, I was uh, looking into these details for a little long time, you can see the hail there, Hello there, and it was interesting which position a spaceship happened. I myself made a small examination as well, and I would like to share with you. I tried to calculate the speed with which the spaceship is flying. At first, it could, um, you could think that um, it is floating on air, but it, it was uh, as it was seen in ex um, examination that it's flying. I made two uh, screenshots from first fragment and last fragment and um, compared them, the flashlights together. And it appears that the picture and that the Earth moved to um, by 244 kilometers, and we know that the Earth velocity orbit equals um, 28,783 um, kilometers for uh, 15 seconds. So we can make a conclusion that uh, the spaceship is moving them with the same speed as Earth. 13, uh, 13 and uh, 49 kilometers per second. Uh, why do I say that it's minimum? That and how do you understand uh, that they move in uh, with, this, with the same direction as Earth? We always, all of us, have seen the picture. Um, and uh, when you are in a train and the train goes in opposite direction, the speed doubles. And when we see that the, like the Earth slows down, it means that they fly in one direction. So I uh, wanted to understand if the spaceship uh, goes faster or slower than Earth. That's why I said that uh, 40, uh, 48,500 uh, kilometers is the, just minimum speed. Because when the spaceship goes faster than Earth, you can multiply by two the speed, so you can imagine how fast is it. So uh, the other thing which I was interested in, that, um, I was doing this uh, scaling, I tried to calculate the uh, height of the spaceship. We can approximately um, understand the size of Jean's head, and from, uh, from this we can approximately calculate the size of the Earth, which we see in the window. And uh, from my calculations, I um, calculate that the spaceship is 3,000 kilometers away from Earth. We must say the spaceship right now fly over uh, 100, from 100 to 500 kilometers from Earth. Hubble telescope, it's uh, his height of 550 kilometers from Earth, and it's visited by uh, people from Earth, and this is highest point which uh, people visit. And then we see Jana, in an altitude of 3,000 kilometers from Earth, with a speed minimum um, 48,000 kilometers per hour. And she calmly enjoying the music, and you cannot uh, even tell that the sh ship is actually going really fast. Also, I was uh, wondering which maximum speeds are spaceship can have. And right now, the fastest uh, spacecraft in the mankind history it's considered Saturn V, which had 64,000 kilometers per hour. It's a little faster, but here you should pay attention 
This is rocket, which in 1967 was used in the program Apollo 5. And we have just seen the analysis of the images after this uh, program, so we still have more questions than answers. And right now, those designers, uh, those who develop the monthly expedition to Mars, they usually calculate the speed of Orion should be approximately 32,000 kilometers per hour. This is much less than the speed um, of the spacecraft uh, where Jana was. So I had no doubt of the extraterrestrial origin of the spaceship. And after this uh, um, expertise and my analysis, I just convinced more and I just um, have wonderful explanations. Also, I wonder how big is that ship? It's, it looks like it is pretty big. So let's move on. Anunnaki technology is obviously way beyond what we can imagine. We could not even think of having a cell phone 30 years ago, while Anunnaki's technology is millions of years ahead of us, which makes it impossible for us to understand their technology just yet. Jana, is there a gravity on your ships? Or is there weightlessness on them? As you can see, there is gravity. Artificial gravity has existed on all our ships for about 3 billion years, according to the Earth chronology. Our ships are not prehistoric pots, after all. Jana, there is such a question. Could you please say, are there flying saucers? Yes, of course. Flying sources exist. But they don't fly on them, they eat from them. And we travel, in our terms, on hyperlight or, to be more precise, on isosmic spaceships. Well, to make it more clear, at the speed of gravitational interaction between cosmic bodies. Well, I hope everyone had a good laugh. Well, notice that even the term a flying saucer, while funny, downplays the significance of the object it describes. The term flying saucer had been in use since 1890s to describe a clay pigeon shooting target that looks like similar to the classic disc UFO shape. But the rise in popularity shot up when the US newspapers started using it in 1947. We can't even comprehend the uh, technologies used uh, in uh, these crafts, yet we make fun of them. We can't even agree on terms. Yet we believe that our scientists have reverse engineered these very objects. What's also interesting is that people believe the stories about the UFO crashes, or even worse, that we have reverse engineered these very objects. This idea is very funny and preposterous. Yeah, this implies fundamental understanding of classical and quantum mechanics and all the principles that govern them. Do we have a quantum computer yet or what? How do you even go about reverse engineering something working on principles we don't understand and physics models we do not accept, well, at least openly? Go reverse engineer that. You know, guys, tinfoils like myself celebrated the release of these documents these classified documents. How many have we seen released over the many years? Several of these super secret government documents are even unknown and not shared with the very US president. 
Yeah, sure. These were prepared several decades ago and ready for prime time today, sitting in someone's desk for the paper to become yellow and the ink to fade. Well, at least this makes them more authentic. Hey, Alexei, how many of our fossil fuel driven vehicles have crashed? I guess most of them. <laughs> Seriously, now let's imagine just for a second that these saucers have crashed and the military or corporations have reverse engineered them. Why would we not use this technology? Seriously. Well, yeah. we have reverse engineered all this and have known it for years. We haven't gone to space to get our golden diamonds, platinum or graphene from asteroids made entirely of these materials. Well, doesn't this make you laugh? Well, it, it sure, sure does. does. Yeah. It sure does. We even believe that our military shot down several of these crafts. Guys, those who come here in these spaceships value energy and elemental particles used in our projectiles, which they can use to create anything. Well, they value too much to refuse capturing what we shoot at them. While we are expending energy to shoot pieces of metal with uranium into the sky, for any advanced civilization, these are valuable resources. It's like throwing banknotes at a bank and expecting them to be harmed. You know, as to the flying saucers that are crashing, why are we not trying to use critical thinking when analyzing or digesting this information? Our voluptuous appetite for sensationalism won't even allow us to acknowledge that beings that conquered traveling space would not already have engineered these defects out of their machines and prevented crashes and things of that nature. They have flown for billions of years already. Okay, that's, that's billions of years in space. Are we to believe that they wouldn't have engineered that out? Would their mathematical algorithms be so inefficient to not take into account these very facts. Yeah, flying billions of light years to come here and crash. Isn't that funny? Especially on a primitive planet. That is very funny. Oh, yeah. Well, guys, uh, no discussion on the topic of UFOs would be complete without an eyewitness recount. Let's hear what Peter from the Netherlands says about his experience. Was when I was about 21 years old. And I live in an apartment about uh, 16 high. It's very high. And uh, uh, the first thing I noticed were two, two big lights in the sky. But uh, in my brain, it goes, ah, it's a car. But it cannot be a car because it's not uh, fly cars here in the, in the sky. So uh, I go outside on the balcony and... A, 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 a black triangle. It's, I think, uh, in size about 30 meters, 30 meters. And uh, it was totally black. And uh, it uh, keeps stationary. It's hanging. And I'm looking at it, but I, in, my, in my feeling, I had they looking also at me. Like, like uh, they aware of me. And it keep hanging there for a while. But my feelings say, hmm, it, it, it felt not good, this experience. And uh, I want to go inside, but this craft start uh, turn around very slow. No sound, no lights. And with a very high speed, go straight in the air, and like uh, uh, 
like a, an, uh, a portal opening, like a light, and and go, like like uh, it it closed, and it was finished. It was gone. That was the first sighting I had, and from that sighting it went on and on and on because even when I uh, go uh, on the bicycle. Uh, ships above me fly, but it were different different forms. Black, black, totally black. No, no sound, but it follow me. But for for me, it was not really scary. I was not afraid, but I was thinking, ah, it's it's for me, it was normal. And. Uh, the other sighting I had, first I hear I hear a noise, like like a zoom, a zoom, and I was walking with the dog, but the dog stay calm, not not bark or not uh, afraid, and uh, a very big big uh, like uh, uh, saucer around with many 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 lights but all kind of different lights, like a rainbow around. And the first thing I noticed, it fly above me and it had little circles in the middle and uh, one circle turned with the clock and the other, other circle go the other way around. And you hear, you hear a very soft click Every time, click, 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 that. It that was very strange, but it was it was not not scary or not uh, anything else. But it flew it, it it fly very very slow, so I can follow it. But I was curious because I was thinking, what is above? Because I only can look from from the from the bottom thank you so much peter that was so interesting and the theme about spaceships is very hot we all know you have been waiting for this the first hottest topic on tiktok is Jana's eyes, especially her blinking. It is such a unique manifestation that everyone is puzzled and most have a misunderstanding of what it can be. In many comments we read on TikTok, we see that people say that it's nothing special, just a cat eye syndrome. Hmm, do you guys know about this syndrome? And let's compare it to Shana's blinking. Yes, I was reading such comments and I was uh, really curious, what is it? I was really important to figure out it myself, so let's figure out it together. Please, technical support, could you please show the first image? Here we can see this is a cat eye syndrome and this is a rare congenital genetic pathology caused by the presence in a patient's here at the top of a small extra chromosomal material derived from chromosome 22. We see right now more images. And in the screen, when a person has a such a syndrome, he has the same eyes all the time. It's permanent. It has permanent nature. And um, as you see right now, another image. And now let's compare it to the Jana's eyes. I would like right now to ask to show the video. Где Жанна моргает. 
Here you can see the difference is just huge. The eyes of Jana change for a moment and get back to the previous state. Wow, thank you so much. That makes sense. In many other comments, people write that it is the third eyelid that Jana has. This is an interesting observation. Let's see if that could be the case. <laughs> Yes, I also saw such comments, and I have something to say here. What is, what is it? So what is the third eyelid is the blinking movable membrane animals, birds and reptiles that lubricates and moisturize the eyes when blinking. So let's see the how birds have it, this third eyelid. This bird is called the Chibis. You can see his eye. And here we see different birds. And birds have it for the, as a guarantee of safety. They just uh, need it. And right now we have um, uh, amphibians also have it. We see it in the pictures. Right now, ponder if a uh, person have a third eye. A third eye lift. All people have it. It's a rudiment and it's called lunate fold, lunar fold. So many animals have it as well. And uh, if we would like to, if we would find information ourselves that this is not illness, this is not sickness. Yes, that makes sense too. Also, on TikTok, we see some comments about how it is so easy and super fast to do such eye effects with filters that can be found on Instagram or TikTok. Have we tested that theory yet? Yeah, I was, I was really interested to find these effects and this application. I would like to share with you what I found, but I, I will tell you right away that I haven't found anything. Uh, only we found something on the symbol of a head, cat eye. But let's look. As you have seen, this completely different effect and the quality, of course. And this effect will be seen on the first filter, which we have now considered in the examination and expertise. But you can see it with a naked eye that this mask is constantly goes away uh, from the eye. But of course, it's coming down really quickly. But this is just a fleeting effect. 
Now also I remember that some TikTok users wrote that blinking is not a big deal and they can do it too. The author of the page always comments back and asks them to record a stitch or a duet on TikTok to show it to us. Let's just say we're still patiently waiting. But if you can blink like Jana, please share it with us and tag LNSoul28 account. Yes, we are waiting. And right now, this is really um, such a widespread topic. Many people started to make various expertise. And famous Spanish Spanish blogger Nacho Rojo asked for an examination of a specialist, and, and they proved that Jana's eyes is a real phenomenon. Uh, thanks to him, uh, thanks very much. Uh, he had a really serious approach to this issue from investigational point of view and he also independently analyzed the effects with the eyes of the american scientific fantastic media franchise start track and right now let's see at first image yes we see these eyes we see uh, on the second image we already see how the iris and the pupil are closing and the image of the eyes is already blurred. And the, in the third image, it's without glare completely. And let's look at the eyes of Jana. We see that there is not, nothing blur, everything clear, all the glare is clear and everything is, looks beautiful. Right now we see many uh, movies, video clips uh, with the same eye effect uh, where eyes are vertical, this fashionable trend, and uh, many, um, huge amount of money are being spent on that, but they can't, can't even make the same effect as Jana does. I made a small review of fake eyes. As an artist, I was really interested to figure out this issue. And it is noticeable that all these effects are artificial, sometimes not even uh, sometimes not ridiculous. So let's see the photo uh, from the interviews uh, with celebrities. This is also uh, really a hot topic and right now we see that uh, on the left side is original frame and on the right side it's fake and we see that uh, the images blur all the effects are not so clear and when the video um, video has a lower quality it's simpler to make some manipulations with this video you can find this video yourself and see yourself how artificially these eyes change, change. you see this blurness but when the video have a high quality and this uh, eyes doesn't look um, real at all well, that was a bust. You know, there is one lady on TikTok that came super close to blinking like that. So I was wondering if we guys got a chance to study it and we can see that as well. Yes, we have seen this blinking as well. And we need to say that this is the best attempt to repeat the blinking of Anunnaki, but it's also really uh, easy to expose. It is also an editing. Uh, let's right now see video clip. First of all, as Marshall already said, that in different videos, uh, when she blinks, um, she has blurness, and uh, you can see clearly how it was edited. Or you can see how 
чтобы наложить It занимающиеся вот эти шторки. Это, кстати, очень also, uh, course, это очень сложный процесс. Это очень сложный процесс. Это очень сложный процесс. Это очень сложный процесс. And the, uh, the lines of the eye is not uh, so sharp as well. And everyone can uh, notice that in this video where you have seen that they try to make it really precisely, but uh, when you zoom in, you can see that they are not really precise, not really attaching sometimes the uh, eyes. But each time differently, but this was really a good attempt. Okay, great. So let's come back to Jana's blinking. What did we figure out? So before we continue and um, uh, discuss the blinking of Jana, we would like also touch upon the topic uh, uh, of lenses. Yes, I'm as an artist, I I'm usually in kind of trends uh, watching what is uh, right now. Is, and I agree completely that uh, the eyes of Jana is a phenomenon which is completely real. I would like to suggest you all to look at the Jana's eyes closely zoomed in. Please um, watch it attentively how clearly everything is seen. You can even see uh, this um, and this all, everything is really clear and precise. Even though that in TikTok it's a little lower quality, Still, we can see the pupil of the eye. Sometimes I meet the comments where it is said that the genre wear lenses. You know, even in the most um, uh, popular movies, lenses in the actor's eyes always are notice noticeable and fans always um, observe it and see it. And right now we could uh, see the sh uh, short video. We see that the eyes of Jana completely clear. Everything is precise and beautiful. Could you please uh, show this video? And maybe we will show it again later. So we made a conclusion. Olya, would you would like to add it? regarding this point. I'm also um, surprised by these comments. It would be good that someone would invent such lenses, but uh, there is uh, right now there is no such lenses which would move inside the eye, and so the human would control it, so I didn't hear about such a, a new lenses. And of course, you can say that in Hollywood they can do any effect. Of course you can, but first of all, there are no uh, such eyes as Jana has with such a quality, so they can be exposed uh, with the help of the filters which you have seen in this examination this expertise uh, that like each person can do there is no such thing in Hollywood and another point is um, the, uh, each uh, frame you need to uh, paint for 30 minutes so one second will be paint for 12 hours can you imagine how um, detailed job is that and you can see the huge amount of videos which Rana has which are published on TikTok and of course it's impossible to edit all these videos because it's uh, such a precise job and uh, also we have um, there are comments under the videos of Jana and uh, there are answers as well and uh, were those uh, videos uh, well people who try to make the same effect as Jana does uh, they um, publish videos really rarely so right now we see that there's such a phenomenon in Jana's eyes and this is just um, a manifestation similar to the skyfish. You right now can see uh, this video 
on the screen. We can leave a, a link in the comment section. In our understanding, this is not material beings, and you can see them only with the help of cameras in a special mode. And uh, we, if we talk about Jana's eyes, only one from nine cameras capture this phenomenon. You can see, you can't see this with the naked eye. Uh, in the video with uh, participation of uh, Jana on Alatra TV, uh, you can see that this blinking is phenomenal. Many people were saying that they will do, do the same, but during this last two years, there wasn't a single one successful attempt. But we're still waiting for your videos. Also, we would like to highlight the fact that Anunnaki is not quite material beings in our understanding. First of all, they are spiritual beings. We pay so much of attention on blinking, but you should listen carefully what Jana talks about in her videos in TikTok and with the, in videos with participation of Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. She says that Anunnaki doesn't believe in God. They know him and they live only by love. They clearly emphasize that there is she and there is the body and only the body dies, but, not, uh, but Anunnaki doesn't die. Even the account is called alien soul. The material structure is on the second place for Anunnaki. They can manipulate any matter and change their physical appearance when they need. So many people are wondering who are Anunnaki in their essence and if they can settle and other bodies or to someone we read in comments in TikTok that Anunnaki can and be from any age in the human body here on Earth. But we will know more about, about it in the video. Jana, could you please say, can Anunnaki enter or inhabit someone else's body? Yes, of course they can but only with the permission of the personality. Well, except in extremely cases, of course. You have touched upon the particle and the wave, and science fiction writers also have an opinion that there are still some beings living in the universe who can change their nature, and from physical nature to the wave. The sixth level of development, those very... We again go back to our favorite Anunnaki, so... These are not quite material beings, in our understanding. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Thus they can, for instance, it is said, can they settle in people? Of course they can, easily, why not? And what's the difference? After all, consciousness can settle in. Again, if we take religion, demons settle in and so on, but if demons settle in, why cannot something good settle in? A simple question, friends. Why? Well, that's it. Even religious scholars won't be able to argue. Since something bad settles in, hence something good also can. People will say, oh no, something good cannot. Yet what about the Holy Spirit? Doesn't He come in excess to those whose door is open? I mean the gate of a person's soul. Isn't that right? They can. Well, those who deal with repair and maintenance of this world, meaning those who Imagine a whole race that serves the spiritual world. They consciously serve. They simply have such a job. They're actually in close contact with the spiritual world. Certainly, their capabilities are enormous. Guys, for those who have just joined us, we are live in more than 20 languages simultaneously translated. And we have discussed the videos on TikTok published by Alien Soul 28 on behalf of Janna the Anunnaki, as well as the valuable information given in the comment section by the author. We have also seen extensive authentication of her TikTok videos. We also talked about how advanced Anunnaki technologies are. Guys, do you realize that today we are openly communicating with a representative of the most advanced, highly spiritual human race? For all those who have been waiting for this moment, is this not enough? For sure, it is not exactly as we've seen in the movies, 
but the contact is happening and everyone can ask question just by leaving a comment on alien soul 28 tiktok account stay with us as we have a ton of interesting information to show you we will travel back in history we will visit the vatican chat about igigi and crop circles all of it we have noticed that a lot of people interested in the ufo phenomena are also interested in out of body and near-death experiences so before moving forward we want to tell you about another global event on the platform of the alatra international public movement life after death fiction and facts which will be streamed live on all major online platforms on may 22nd let's watch a short trailer now There is a question that every person asks themselves. We address science and religion to find the answer to it. Already, for 6,000 years, we have been trying to find out. Is there life after death? For the first time in history, scientists, physicians, clergymen, and eyewitnesses will seek the answer all together. Does reincarnation exist? Fear of death, what is its nature? How do we, alive people, know what death is? Who benefits from hiding facts about a person's after-death fate? Human consciousness is outside the body. The prophets knew the truth about the afterlife fate of humans. What does science say? Is the state of heaven and hell explained by physics? What are we here for? Answers to the most important questions for every person. May 22nd, 2021. International Online Conference. Life after death. Fiction and facts. Dear friends, now we will learn about the legends of Anunnaki and explore the past with you. Please stay tuned. We are live now and this international conference is being broadcasted to more than 20 languages simultaneously, all done by volunteers. Please comment and share with friends as we go. Anunnaki have been with us for a long time and we can trace it back to historical facts through legends. Now let's hear about them. Anunnaki, the ancient peoples of Mesopotamia, the inhabitants of Sumer and Babylonia, had the god Anu, who was considered the highest supreme god, worshiped since ancient times. Originally, he was associated with the goddess Ki. Until now, in the East, that is, India, China, Japan, the term Ki is used to refer to energy. In the Chechen pagan pantheon of gods, there is also the god of the sky, Ana. In Sanskrit, the word Anu, Atam, is the title of the supreme creator, Brahma. Translated from Sanskrit, the word Brahma means sacred power that imparts action. The word Anu appears in the Sumerian language in the name of this god and the gods of the Anunnaki, and in Egyptian in the names Ampu, Anubis, and Anukis. In all these cases, Sirius is also mentioned. In one of the ancient Egyptian hymns, Osiris is called the god An of millions of years. Homage to thee, O An, in Antis, Perakuti, who dost with long strides march across the heavens, 
The cuneiform text relating to the solar god Ra reads, Thou couplest under the stars and the moon. Thou drawst the ship of Aten in heaven and on earth like the tirelessly revolving stars. The inscription on the pyramid, Thou art he who directs the sonship of millions of years. If we take, for example, the Anunnaki, this is the sixth level of development. They are completely free. This is, imagine, a civilization of spiritually free, higher beings. Do you know what their function is? Interesting. It is said that they are able to practically change the laws of physics. They can do anything. Create new universes. Is it really so? They can do anything. Yet their task is not to create new universes, but, let's put it so to make it clear, let's imagine a liner a huge ship with a lot of vacationers and the like. Everyone has their own cabins, they have a rest, everything is fine. But here we are talking about the vacationers, while there are service personnel. For the liner to exist and for people to feel comfortable. What are they doing? They fix the ship, they take care of people, they do not enter people's cabins, but they can clean up there when it is necessary, so that people feel comfortable. They don't get into their lives, into everyone's cabins, and do not tell them what to do. However, they… thanks to them, the ship moves, and thanks to them, the others feel comfortable. So the function of the highest civilization, the one we call Anunnaki, is that the ship, universe, moves in a strictly defined direction, so that nothing breaks, or that everything is repaired in time. And what does it mean, repaired in time? This is exactly the influence on matter. Repairs, maintenance, putting things in order, and again, so that those like the Apexians would not develop their appetites too much. And many more things. That is, there are certain laws which are precisely monitored by such a highly developed human race, why? Because the Anunnaki is actually a human race. The Egyptians spoke of the first time, Zeptepi, when the gods ruled their country. That it was the Golden Age. That was when the waters of the abyss receded, the primeval darkness disappeared, and the gifts of civilization were offered to the newly born humanity. Osiris was a kind king, and he was loved because he taught people the arts and sciences, and supported their aspirations for spiritual development and a peaceful life. Isis taught people the art of healing, as well as growing corn and making clothes. Orion and the star Sirius are the celestial home of Isis and Osiris, the gods who came down to Earth in ancient times and created the Egyptian kingdoms and its inhabitants. God Veracocha there is a legend among the Incas that in the time immemorial that aliens lived among them, white-bearded man-gods who later left them, promising to return one day. And in memory of these white gods, on the shores of Lake Titicaca, four giant stone pillars have been preserved, on which gods with bearded faces are carved. Not far from the shores of Lake Titicaca, on the ruins of the Tiwanaku Temple City, there is an arched gate built of stone megaliths, depicting the creator god Veracocha. All peoples of the Andean region have memories of a time when the Great Flood hit the earth and the Great Darkness fell, caused by the sun's disappearance. Society was in chaos and people suffered. Then, there suddenly appeared, coming from the south, a white man of large stature. He was dressed in a white robe, holding a staff and a book in his hands. This man had such great power that he changed the hills into valleys and from the valleys made great hills, causing streams to flow from the living stone. This man traveled along the highland route to the north, working marvels as he went, and that they never saw him again. They say that in many places he gave men instructions on how they should live, speaking to them with great love and kindness, admonishing them to be good and to do no damage or injury to one another, but to love one another and show 
charity to all. The myths of the Horachiri people in the central Andes confirm that it was the Viracocha who showed people how to create earth terraces and build an irrigation system. According to artifacts, Viracocha came from an exoplanet near the constellation of Orion. The researchers also link Veracocha's personality to Osiris, who walked around the world and taught people. The Dogon The researcher Juan Jose Benitez wrote down the story narrated by a Hogan about arrival of gods in detail. Hogans are those whom the Dogon consider saints, the keepers of the cosmogony that the Nomo passed on to humans. A star called the Star of the Tenth Moon appeared during the day, and a giant round object emerged from it, rotating around its axes. When it landed, it looked like a basket with a square base and a hole inside. The sound of thunder rumbled, the earth shook, and high columns of sand and dust shot up into the sky. The Nomo came out of the ship. The Dogon people described them as beautiful and powerful fishmen who breathed with their collarbone. The Nomo came down to earth to teach and spiritualize people. They taught the Dogon to cultivate the land, melt metals, and make tools. The Nomo have promised to return, and that will happen when the star of the tenth moon rises again. The Finns The Finno-Ugric Venomoinen, having accomplished numerous feats on earth, flew away on a golden boat, promising to return when the people really needed it. At the same time, it is a curious fact that the Finns call the constellation Orion by his name. The Kayapo people, the Kayapo Indian tribe in the upper Amazon. Many generations ago, the nearest mountain was shaken and covered with smoke and fire, from which the inhabitants escaped in the village. After a while, the young hunters plucked up courage and tried to kill the alien who appeared from this beban. It was not possible to identify what a beban is, but poisoned arrows, sticks and spears bounce off him. He mocked the brave warriors. Then he stayed for a while in the village. The villagers got used to his presence and learned his language. Then he taught them to use weapons for hunting, established a school, and taught them the rules of agriculture. He called himself Ben Kororoti, which means I have come from the universe. The Hopi. The archaeologist Gary David, in his writing, tells of flying shields or flying saucers that the Hopi Indians have met for centuries. These flying shields flew in and visited them in their village. These creatures that came out of their shields, the Hopi called Kachinas. Kachina is a kind of spirit messenger. They look like angels. As the legends say, the aliens from heaven were kind to people. They taught the Indians farming and the art of healing. The Hopi Indians still have annual dances in the village squares dedicated to Kachinas. They wear masks during the dance, which are an obligatory ritual, and portray Kachinas. The masks are very similar to space helmets. The Anu The Ainu people of northern Japan and Sakhalin believe they are descended from celestial ancestors. Legends of the New Hebrides or Aborigines also claim that the earthlings are descendants of the sons of heaven. The legends of the Demiurges tell of those who came down from the sky and taught people the skills and wisdom of a higher culture. The Queen Charlotte Islands holds memories of the great sages who came from the stars on fire ships. The Navajo Indians of North America speak of teachers who came from the sky, stayed on earth for a long time, and then returned to their world. The Japanese book Saitoki states that a divine man descended from heaven in 2300 BC in Korea and ruled the nation for a thousand years. The ancient Chinese had widespread legends about the sons of heaven. According to one ancient legend, the Chinese civilization began when the white god Wan Di arrived in a heavenly chariot and taught them everything to cultivate rice, build dams, boats and chariots, dig wells, make musical instruments, receive acupuncture treatment, sew clothes, and so on. He gave them a calendar and writing, taught them to write in hieroglyphs. In every corner of the planet, in legends and myths, in archaeological finds and petroglyphs, we find evidence of teachers from other planets. Their descriptions may vary, but their main essence is to bring knowledge, peace, and prosperity 
to the peoples they visited. Awesome. We've just seen from the legends that the knowledge was brought from one source. And uh, guys, just before we move forward, I wanted to address one thing. We are really, really live. Uh, it is, I don't know if the camera will focus, but it is, um, uh, we are May 13 and it's 21.56 Dubai time. And um, we are really live. So please leave your comments down below and we will try to answer them a little bit later. And, you know, also today we are happy to have with us uh, our friend who frequently speaks at our events, researcher and best-selling author of numerous books, Mr. Laird Scranton. Laird, can you please tell us if your findings from studying ancient languages and civilizations confirm that fact that knowledge was brought from one source? And is it correct to assume that ancient words have only one meaning? Cosmological words carry multiple meanings and many ancient words that that's true. They carry multiple meanings. And so trying to arrive at a single translation of a word becomes difficult. Um, this instructed tradition I'm talking about begins at Gobek. Our first evidence of it is at Gobekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey at around 10,000 BC or sometime after 10,000 BC. One of the translated names one of the names that, that's popularly given as the translation of the name Gobekli Tepe is Central Hill. That's the same translation in Greek of the suffix opolis, which is what was assigned to temple hills in ancient Greece. If we look geographically, the region of the Fertile Crescent, the region of southeastern Turkey and, um, and uh, western Iraq and, and that area of the world, is centrally lo located to many different land masses. It's easy access to China, to um, in the region of India, to Egypt, to Africa, to parts of Europe, to Tibet and that area. Um, so the suggestion for many different reasons is that that Gobekli Tepe region was the site of, an er of the earliest instruction we know about. Um, we also, that, that idea is upheld by the fact that many civilizing elements made their first appearance in that same region at that same time. The first cultivated plants, the first domesticated animals, the first metallurgy and creation of metal tools, the first stoneworking tradition, the first pottery, um, the first weaving of cloth. All of these civilizing skills appear in that same general region, in that same general era. It, it seems the, those, those objective facts seem to support the idea that education was going on at Gobekli Tepe, civilizing education. Now, the symbolism that was being represented by the cosmological plan that goes with that civilizing education, they're talking about concepts of physics that, that we ourselves do not have a grasp of yet. So, any group of teachers, to my way of thinking, any group of teachers who were talking correctly about those concepts of science during that era would not have had any problem whatsoever moving around the planet. Getting around the planet would, be, would have been the least of their concerns. The Dogen say that the way the tradition worked was, the instructed tradition worked was, that there were concerns about effects on the health of, of humans um, in, the con in the proximity to these non-material teachers. And so the Dogen's teachers made the deliberate choice to, to limit the, the risk of those effects by selecting eight tribe members from any particular tribal group and transporting them to the remote location, which I take to be Gobekli Tepe, instructing them in these skills and then sending them back to instruct all of their tribe members. And that, that's a di that dynamic is one of the archetypes of Jung. It, it occurs all around the planet. There are myths of, of 
ancient mythical, quasi-mythical bringers of civilizing skills. Sometimes they're emperors, sometimes they're ancestors, sometimes they're um, treated as gurus. Um, but the same paradigm of the eight bringers of civilizing skills plays out all over the world. It looks to me as if this was global instruction or the effort was to make a global instruction. And the method was to bring the instructed students to the site, teach them and send them back. We have a second round of instruction that happens in a similar way in a, a very accessible site by C uh, around 3200 BC, sometime after 3600 BC in Northern Scotland on Orkney Island, where to all outward appearances, it looks as if civilizing instruction was also being carried out there in that era, um, relating to the same symbolism, the same symbolic system, same civilizing plan, with same emphasis on agriculture, same emphasis on uh, myths. We actually have overarching mythic mythological themes and storylines that connect the Gobekli Tepe era to the Orkney Island era, 3200 BC. Any culture that used the cubit as a unit of measure was influenced by this tradition. An another signature is the idea that there's a wheel or a chariot associated with Orion. When we look at Orion, there's no intuitive reason for a person to imagine a wheel associated with it. There's only a scientific reason to understand that, and that relates to Barnard's loop, which we can't see. Um, the dimension of Barnard's loop in light years is a match for the dimensions of the Great Pyramid in cubits. The Dogen myths, um, I could see from the Dogen myths that the way they were being presented were, was setting up an association between light years and cubits as, as concepts. Um, and through a complicated process, you can trace that to the Great Pyramid as the origin of our understanding of how long a cubit was. And then you realize the Great Pyramid's measures are a match for the light year measures of Barnard's loop. That's what was been trying to be represented by those three um, large pyramids that reflect the, the configuration of the belt stars. Mm -hmm. So there were many more than eight groups around the world that I think were influenced and, and pretty much any of these archetypes that Jung points to is a really good indicator that the group was influenced by the same instructional plan because that's where those archetypes come from, from my point of view. That the reason these cultures all have those same representations is because they all benefited from instruction from the same group of teachers. <laughs>
ancient uh, power of God. Ne is the uh, upper sky that was on the lower sky. And uh, in myth, they uh, were not uh, related to the higher gods. And uh, Anunnaki uh, were not included in uh, hierarchy of gods. Uh, so uh, they were not included uh, to the gods of uh, Sh Shumer and Babylon. And uh, it looks like they were walking by themselves on the earth and living like people uh, on the earth. In, according to various texts, the numbers of Anunnaki uh, is from seven to six hundred. Uh, according to Akkadian texts, um, the Anunnaki were the uh, species from the uh, underworld and in uh, Indian mythology there are Nagas from the underworld uh, uh, Unag um, Anunnaki are the uh, snakes they are aggressive uh, and powerful gods from the underworld and they uh, symbolize the dark forces of the person but we understand that uh, these dark forces, Nagas, they cannot be Anunnaki, and Anunnaki cannot be Nagas instead. And um, Anunnaki, they had their holy city of living, it's the city of Nippur. And Enki built houses uh, for them in the cities and set up fields for them in the valley. There was a secretary of Anunnaki in Babylon, uh, Ekagula, the house of great uh, Gale. Uh, people expressed their respect to the Anunnaki, uh, and uh, Enlil addressed to the Anunnaki, great gods, what else we have to do? Uh, friends, let's think. Uh, we know that Enlil is the uh, son of El, and um, he is the second god, the second from An. And so we know that there is the father of gods who uh, creates the uh, destiny of the gods. According to the facts from the film Atlantis, a man named El seized power, used the discovery of the prolonging life beyond the species limit and called himself an immortal and supreme god. El was uh, depicted as the, an old man with a beard sitting on a throne, a symbol of supreme power. And maybe El in different languages, uh, maybe in different in different texts, different languages as Il, Ilu, Elim, Elim, etc. And uh, these names are epithets of one of the seven messengers of the spiritual world, Ahriman. El appointed uh, his children as gods, giving them the names of the messengers of the spiritual worlds. And the council of seven gods, headed by El, determined the course of human events. The name Anunnaki is separated from the phenomena when people began to call the seven messengers of the spiritual world, uh, world gods in legends. Uh, friends, it's very important because in myths we do not find descriptions of the Anunnaki by the behavior of the gods. After all, the god, these gods, they were evil, rude, cruel. All these um, decisions are often explained by the within's uh, drunkenness, ambition, selfishness, and so on. And this behavior was typical for Atlantis. We know them from the previous kaleidoscope of facts. But this, uh, these uh, people, these gods, they um, copied the history of long-lived El and his elite. The uh, dissidents of the Atlantis have lost their spiritual knowledge and exist under El's power. Anunnaki, at the sixth level of development, they uh, didn't uh, took part in different wars, they didn't control people, they just um, uh, observed the actions of people and did not restrict their freedom. But in different uh, texts, we can see that there is a, um, a, a dividing um, between the Anunnaki. In Babylon, Akkadian mythology, the power of the main identity of the 
uh, earthlings of the Anunnaki was shown that uh, they were kind of subordinate to him as well as people. But um, that Anunnaki uh, Mm. We see the message in the Shumerian text that uh, Anunnaki were attributed to Marduk. And this uh, was described as um, um, symbols of power, powers. And uh, we know that uh, Buddha, he preserved um, to the positive image of Anunnaki and uh, mentioned that uh, they g gave him power. Um, we know that uh, Anunnaki, these uh, creatures from the sky, they're uh, peace lovers, world lovers. And um, we can find translations of these tables of Shamer in British Museum, in Museum of Oxford, in California, in different others. Anunnaki people, uh, they are with peace, without hostility, without aggressions. Uh, the same information is found in the legend of Incas, the Yurochiki, the Dogon, the Hopi Indians, the Ainu, the ancient Chinese. Uh, we can uh, look through the ancient texts and uh, find that the function of Anunnaki, Anunnakis is the external protection. They kept order on the earth and in the sky. Uh, to make people take a step in development, the Anunnaki help them in everyday conditions. The king of Shulga, of the king of the third dynasty of Ur, tells about the presentation of the table of abundance by him and uh, by him, uh, the Anunnaki. To, sorry, to him by Anunnaki. Uh, to demonstrate the power of the Gudea, they uh, performed a ritual in honor to the Anunnaki using the positive image of the uh, pleasant themselves. Um, uh, they, this truly spiritual creatures, Anunnaki, uh, they serve to the one God, Ra, live in love and freedom and surrender themselves with the sign of Alatra. And uh, uh, they teach people to uh, be a, a person attentive to love and respect each other. Um, they gave pure energy uh, of the, the attention of person, the choice uh, of what to invent in it. And uh, we can see that um, uh, as uh, historians has uh, translated that Anunnaki are the uh, winged uh, genius uh, depicted flying, uh, fighting with the winged balls. And these genius creatures are Anunnaki. Wings are a symbol of spiritual development. Uh, in ancient Egypt, a shining sphere was placed over the head of alien creatures. In ancient kaleidoscope, of, in previous kaleidoscope of facts, information were presented about the possession of Egyptian and uh, Trupinian representatives uh, of knowledge about the essence of spiritual practices how uh, do how they do that uh, we believe that this knowledge have been transmitted by the Anunnaki just as Osiris brought knowledge to the inhabitants of Tripilia. Osiris supported people's desire for spiritual development and peaceful life uh, and um, I would like to stop about uh, your attention and stop and see the video Janna, is it true that the Anunnaki brought corn to earth? Of course it's true, and not just corn, but also wheat and many other things. Interesting facts about plants. Corn cobs are not able to propagate themselves. The wild ancestors of this agricultural crop have not yet been found. According to Mayan legend, human became human when the gods gave him corn. He no longer had to wander on the earth in search of food. He buried grains in the ground and waited when they come to life and give him food. 
In the Chalam Balam, epic of the indigenous peoples of America, one can find a legend that corn was hidden in the green stone of the gods in jade. The gods split it and gave corn to people for food and jade for decoration. The Soviet botanist and breeder Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov conducted a global study of different varieties of wheat. As a result, he identified three independent areas of origin of this crop. The difference in wheat varieties is in the set of chromosomes. It is surprising that wild and durum wheat have the same set of chromosomes, 28 in number. However, in Ethiopia, the homeland of the cultivated variety of durum wheat, there are absolutely no wild relatives of this plant. And the distance between the foci of vegetation of species with different sets of chromosomes, 42 and 28, is so large that it leaves researchers perplexed. How could wild wheat varieties move to a completely different region and they're somehow miraculously transformed into a new variety with almost twice as many chromosomes, while no intermediate species derived from the plant breeding were found between the distribution areas of the two varieties. And doubling or tripling the entire chromosome set requires gene-level intervention. And such a difference between wheat varieties existed at the earliest stages of the development of agriculture. So how were these varieties bred, and how did they get into human hands? Jeanne, what is there on one theme that you can't find anywhere else? Anywhere like on one theme, even in, well, even in the nearest galaxies. It is believed that it is believed that the ancient Egyptian god Osiris taught people how to cultivate cereal crops and grow vines. In the text of the pyramids, Osiris is called the Lord of the Vine. He was always depicted with some kind of a plant, and often this plant was a vine or a bunch of grapes. The symbol of the vine is a tree with seven branches. On the Egyptian planisphere, it was placed as a constellation with its roots in a water reservoir in the south and with a top in the north. This tree is located among the deacons of Virgo, the star Epsilon, and the constellation of Virgo is called Vindamiatrix, that is, vineyard, winery. In ancient legends of the Garden of Eden, grapes are associated with the tree of life and with the tree of knowledge. In the New Testament, Jesus figuratively compares himself to the son of the wine grower and to the vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. According to legend, the vine was the very first plant planted by Noah after the flood. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Genesis 9.20 The work against heresies by Bishop Irenaeus of Lyons, the second century AD, contains an extract from the book Papias, which describes one episode from a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. In this discourse, Jesus describes the kingdom of God primarily as a kingdom of complete material prosperity. There will be abundance of wheat and vineyards shall grow, having each 10,000 main shoots, and all animals will submit themselves to men. Guys, can you believe that grapes can be so controversial and exciting? Also, foremost, that Jesus described the type of conditions that we need to create on earth first, so our animal nature will not dominate over us. So it seemed that we need to build a creative society now. Then we will have access to many advances we are lacking today. Just a reminder to friends that just joined us, we are talking about Anunnaki. This conference is broadcasted live in more than 20 languages simultaneously, all done by volunteers of Alatra International Public Movement under the Kaleidoscope of Facts project. We live in an amazing time 
of primordial knowledge. Now let's move on and see what we can learn from the Hopi Native American tribe and why did they call Anunnaki and friends? Let's find out. Hello, and I would like to tell you a little about Hopi. One of the most intriguing legends in Hopi talks about Ant-Man, who twice saved the Hopi people during the destruction of the world. The first destruction took place when there was a very large-scale cosmic event, a strong coronal ejection or the fall of a large asteroid. The second destruction of the world was due to the invasion of ice, possibly due to a change of poles. During these two devastating events, the Ant-Man hid the Hopi people in their underground caves and provided them with food and water. In these legends, the Ant-Man are portrayed as generous and hard-working people who also taught the Hopi the secrets of storing food for a long time without spoiling it. In ancient petroglyphs around the world, and in particular on the, this one, from North America, you can often find images of unusual creatures with antenne horns on their heads. Hobby legends indicate a connection with, with the ant men of ordinary ants. Allegedly, once ordinary ant obtained food for the ant men, and they themselves were un underfeed, and therefore they have such a thin waist. Although ant men are ordinary ants, have a connection with the constellation Orion. The ceremony is dedicated to a god named Anu Sino, who long ago taught the Hopi how to grow beans and save them from hunger. At the same time, there is an interesting coincidence with the fact that there is a Babylonian god with the same name Anu, and that ant in the Hopi language is also called the word Anu. And the phrase Anunnaki, which is translated from the Hopi language as friends ants, is surprisingly similar to the Sumerian word Anunnaki, which means creatures that flew to earth from heaven. Ant-men were probably also known in ancient Egypt. The Egyptian word Sahu means Orion star. In the Hopi language, the same word Sahu also means star. And the most important star for the Hopi was the stars of the constellation Orion. Right now, I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, as a Gerald Alert, the consultant with the entrepreneur and motivational coach. He will tell us more about the ancestors from the stars. Well, for me, uh, where I'm at here on Turtle Island, I was told that my ancestors come from the Pleiades, from the Palladian star system. Mm -hmm. And I have brothers and sisters that I know of in Hawaii. Their creation story talks about the land of the guardians, of where they see their ancestors are coming from. And that's so, but every race of the human family, we all have ancestors from the stars. My Caucasian brothers and sisters, my yellow brothers and sisters, my African brothers and sisters, and us as a red people, we all have ancestors, and uh, but not necessarily just from where we're at on Mother Earth, right? So, And this great awakening that is happening, there's more human beings starting to talk about this and are not afraid to be chastised to be ostracized or to be labeled because of what they're sharing. And that, that's a part of this whole great awakening that the ancestors talked about, that we, we would be in this time. And that's when I was, I was told by the elders and the ancestors that we are in the time of the women and men of wisdom would gather, the rainbow warriors would rise, and the ancestors from the stars would return. So that's kind of where we're at. That's how we believe, and that's what we, we've been told. So. And it's good that the world is finally starting to catch up to what it is that our elders 
and our ancestors have always spoke about through prophecy since the beginning of time. So, Anu Naki that they they bring that knowledge, they bring that understanding to to the I think he, like you had said the hope. And that so, because if they bring good tidings, then that means they're, and that's what we're supposed to do as humans. We're supposed to share this knowledge and understanding with each other. Well, I know there's one of the medicines that we know that I was told by one of my elders came came from came from the stars, and it grows here on Mother Earth. It's one of the medicines that. I know where I was shared with the, my elder, one of my elders that shared that with me. But when you talk about the Anunnaki and the ones that what they brought to the Hopi, I've actually was privileged to sit in ceremony with the Hopi a couple of years back because I wanted to go and visit Prophet Ra that talks about the prophecy of the true white brother that would return at this time at the same time, and the true white brother would have a red brother, a younger brother who was from the red nation, and they would come together at this time as the world was going through this great awakening. But the Anunnaki that you talk about, or the Hopi, those are the ones that we, I've come, that we know are the ones who work for the Creator, who know the Creator, who understand the Creator, and work for the Creator. Those are the good ones. And that, but again, they themselves have been given free will. And that's a part of it, right? It's what we do with this knowledge, this technology that we're given. If you use it to make the world a better place, then you're honoring it for what it is. If you take this technology and abuse it to bring chaos into the world, not only have you broken law, natural law, but there will be consequences for it, right? So, and that's how... The elders and the ancestors that I that I've come to know, that I will continue to know, and I will seek to know even more so, is this knowledge is sacred for a reason, right? So, yeah. So the ones that you talk about, I would say, were the good ones, <laughs> the ones that are connected and understand the Creator, and we're not disconnected from the Creator. When we say the ancestors from the stars, those are when you look up into the night sky. There's millions, billions of ancestors from the stars that, that, that exist. So for us, when we were told it, back in 2017, actually, I had gone and sat out on the land with the elders and the ancestors. And uh, we were told that there's going to come a day, and that day's not that far off, where humanity will see a flash of light in the stars. And they'll shift the consciousness of humanity forever on that day. Thank you, Gerald, for this interesting Beitrag. Thank you, Gerald, for this interesting story. And I would like to talk about the meaning of the Maltese cross. And I'll continue the Gerald's story about the Hopi Indians. This Maltese cross can be seen in many cultures. Und, um, schauen wir uns seine Bedeutung an bei den Let's see what it means. Among the Hopi Indians, we find the following legend. This is a Hopi rock painting, which you will see right now in the image. Yeah. So, this clearly shows the Maltese cross. Prophecy Rock is a rock painting on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona. It describes the evolutionary path of our world. According to the Hopi prophecy, since then we have been moving towards the end of the world as we know it. People had two paths to choose from. The upper horizontal line corresponds to the materialistic path, the lower one corresponds to the spiritual one. A thick vertical line is the last chance for a modern person to return to the spiritual path. If he does it in time, he will survive and enter the joy and fullness of the new world. After this point, the materialistic path becomes uneven and dissolved. 
The Hopi believe that humanity will soon reach the point of great purification. And we see that at this exit, as a possible destination, a final destination, the same cross is visible again. In Hopi's prophecies also, it is said that the great purification will be announced by a sign, the trees will die, the climate will change, the masses of the earth will rise and fall, and blue, blue, blue star will appear that is not visible yet. In the next picture, we see the image, Quetzalcoatl, in human form. In translation, his name means a luminous tailed serpent. He is a deity of several Mesopotamian cultures, including the Tex, Altec, Aztecs, and Mayans. Beavers and birds are signs of the belonging to the spiritual world, and on his shield we see the sign of the Maltese cross. This image comes from the time of the Sumerian civilization. It depicts Anunnaki with the sign of the Maltese cross. This highly developed race has always served to the spiritual world and continues to do so to this day. It serves life in the highest sense of this understanding. There are many artifacts that shows that highly involved, evolved beings were the sign of Maltese cross. This cross symbolizes service to the higher powers, service to the spiritual world, and represents a force of movement or movement that acts to expand from within to external, like everything divine that is aimed on expansion. In the traditions of African Dagon tribe, we found a drawing that schematically accurate corresponds to the real representation of Sirius. In this picture, you can also see resemblance to the Maltese cross. The Dogons known for the fact that they possess unique cosmological knowledge, which was only later scientifically described. And on the next image, we see a Sirius. You can see this picture right now. Sirius B overshadows his partner as he is the brighter X3 source. Also, we, uh, the drawing corresponds to the photo. The next image should also be noted here. Next, we see the diffraction peak and the effect of atmospheric turbulence. I would like to show right now the video which shows this refraction of light. Under certain conditions, it shows how the density of the air changes, the effect of tur turbulence occurs, and this is how we see the refraction of light. In this wave-like radiation, we see a light cross. This is exactly what the Maltese cross represents. This is the image of this Luciform radiance. And now let's watch a video together in which legends and which peoples have mentions of the Sirius star. Sirius is one of the closest and the brightest stars in the sky, revered since ancient times in different parts of the world. The Ainu Legends of the Ainu people, the oldest inhabitants of the Japanese islands, say that their ancestors came from the Sirius system. This explains why, at the dawn of mankind, the Ainu already had a sufficiently developed civilization and the knowledge that Sirius is a double star, with two suns that orbit around a common center of masses. The Dogen 
And in Central Africa there is a tribe of the Dogen, living rather isolated from other tribes and nationalities. However, it became known in our time, the Dogen knew the details not only of the structure of the Sirius star system, but also possessed knowledge that our science has yet to uncover. Ancient Egypt One of the most revered gods of Egypt was the goddess Isis, symbolizing Sirius and her husband, the god Osiris, symbolizing the Orion constellation. Wallace Budge cites passages from Egyptian texts that speak of the sacred emanations emitted by Sirius and Orion. Interestingly, the Dogen say the same thing. In their view, the seeds that impart life force to the world are emitted by the Sirius system. The heliacal rise of Sirius played such an important role for the Egyptians that the central corridor of their gigantic temples were oriented exactly towards the point where the star was expected to appear, like the Dogen. The ancient Egyptians believed that the soul of the dead go to the Sirius system. Turkey Gebekli Tepe is the oldest structure on our planet, which is located in the southeast of Turkey. The main temple of Gebekli Tepe is clearly oriented towards Sirius, and the colonnade of the temple stands in such a way that Sirius rises in its very center. Other structures were also dedicated to the rising of Sirius at different times of the year, and drawings carved in stone repeat the outlines of the constellations. The locals, as well as other cultures in this region, worshipped the star Sirius thousands of years later. Armenia The most famous staging site in the Armenian highlands is the Metsamor archaeological site where ancient inhabitants observed the rising Sirius early in the morning on the summer solstice in the rays of the rising sun. Zoroastrianism In Zoroastrianism, one of the world's oldest religions, the name of the god Tistra, who personified Sirius among the ancient Iranians, come from the old Indo-European term meaning three stars, and the name of the prophet Zarathustra is translated as Golden Sirius. Zara Golden and Tistria Sirius. Only this name is considered worthy of the Prophet. There are the following lines in the Avesta. I will sacrifice unto Tistra the bright and glorious star, from Ahura Mazda has established as a lord and overseer above all stars, in the same way as he established Zarathustra above man. India and in ancient Indian mythology, Sirius is referred to by the word Tishya, which means the divine arrow that smites the demon of drought. The thrice seven wandering rivers, Yai the mighty floods, the forest trees, the mountains, Agni to our aid, Kursanu, Tishya, archers to our gathering place, and Rudra strong amid the Rudras we awoke. The Quran Sirius is the only star whose name is mentioned in the Quran and that he, Allah, is the lord of Sirius. Al-Shira al yamaniya This is what the Arabs call the brightest star in the sky in the Canis Mage constellation. Russia And in the Republic of Hakassia near the lake Shira, the Shirin plate was found on which the arrival of representatives from the Sirius system to Earth was depicted with solar signs. China in China, Sirius is associated with the wolf or heavenly dog, Erlang's assistant in the fight against evil forces. Erlang in mythology acted as one of the water deities, the patron of dams that protect against floods, and a fighter with demons. In Chinese astronomy, the star Sirius was called Tianlan, heavenly wolf. Dagestan The Lax a Dagestani people, one of the indigenous peoples of the North Caucasus, call Sirius by the name of Turshi, similar to the Zoroastrian Tistria. It is interesting that the Lax call the Canis Major constellation with the star Sirius, Hami Turshi, where Hami means women. Doesn't that say about the ancient connection of the Turshi with the central female image of the Sumerian pantheon, Inanna, Ishtar, Tistria? Iraq Ishtar of Abel is often mentioned in the texts of New Assyrian times as a prophetess. The Assyrian kings sought her for advice before making important decisions. Unlike her hypostasis associated with the star Venus, Ishtar of Abel 
was identified with Sirius. Interestingly, the Mayans, Incas and Egyptians began counting annual time cycles between July 22nd 27th. The new year was celebrated at the moment when the star Sirius rose in the morning sky at the same time as the Sun. This is the time when the Earth has two visible suns in the sky. One sun is golden and the other was red in ancient times and now it is white shimmering blue. This star combination celebrates the long-term connection between the Sun and the stars of the Sirius system. Mahenjo-Daro Although the ritual calendar of Mahenjo-Daro has not yet been deciphered, it is not difficult to see the symbolism of certain red star at the rise of which offerings are made. Ancient Mesopotamia In Sumerian Akkadian astronomy, the star Sirius was associated with the god Ninurta and was called Arrow fiery red as copper, thanks to which Ninurta defeats the dragon Asaga. You arrow Ninurta, the first of the great gods, which is brighter than all the stars in the bright sky. Uta Ulu peerless in battle, mighty heir, favorite of the father of the gods, Ninamnir, a true ploughman, gathering barley in heaps, the guardian of Nisaba, the savior of all living souls, I, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, whose god is so-and-so, whose goddess is so-and-so. I turned to you, I look at your face, because you know how to do good. New Zealand and Australia The indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maori, believed that when they saw Sirius, they saw the Rehua, the wisest being in the universe, living in the tenth highest heaven. And the Australians called Sirius the heavenly boundary, and also the eagle. Mongolia In the myths of Mongol-speaking peoples, the image of Hüchedei Mergen is associated with Sirius and Orion constellation. Hüchedei Mergen, the prototype of Gesa, is represented by the mighty rider deity on nine grey-winged horses, shaking the universe with thunder and incinerating enemies of the human race with lightning the patron saint of epic heroes fighting on earth with forces of evil and other monsters. In the very epithet Huchidei, the concept of the sky is encoded, which also has the color symbolism of Huch, blue, heavenly. The second part of the name Mergan means a sharp shooter, wise, gifted. Azerbaijan In Azerbaijan mythology, Sirius or Simug and Nabruz were noted by the eight-pointed star. Sirius was luminary organizing the great space and time, the star of all travelers. The question arises, why did ancient people feel a deep and mysterious connection with this star for thousands of years? This is the most interesting video and uh, I would like to continue the topic raised in the video in the light of Islam. I was interested to learn if there is anything about extraterrestrial civilizations in Islam. Because, you know, just briefly, when reading Quran, if it's quite difficult to find uh, direct information about this, but as one expert said, uh, if you haven't found something in Quran, uh, don't rush to say that it's not there, but uh, maybe you were just uh, looking not the right way, because uh, in Quran, some information was not known to people, but then it was uh, sent to people and revealed to people as we began to develop in science and technology. So, for example, this is about uh, uh, human embryo development, uh, different stages in discovery in oceanology and mixing of two seasons of different densities. And so, uh, in Quran, we see that all praise is for Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Surah Al-Fatiha 1 2. 
So, part of scientists believe that we are talking about the higher and lower worlds, the earthly material world and the spiritual world, but at the same time, many researchers suggest or state that uh, we may be talking about other civilizations scattered throughout the universe. In favor of this hypothesis, there are arguments further uh, in texts of the Quran, for example, in Surah 42, Ashura advice, we meet such a verse. Among his signs is the creation of heavens and earth, and what is spread on them of, of all the creatures, and he is most capable of bringing them together whenever he wills. So, what's important here, this ayah. Uh, also uh, confirms the previous especially the uh, end of the verse attracts attention to itself that uh, it can be assumed that uh, we are talking about the plural plurality of beings who will answer to the Almighty, not just living beings. Then I turned to the text of the Hadith and was surprised to find that uh, for myself, that uh, uh, there we can find information that directly points to the existence of various extraterrestrial life forms. For example, in one of the collections of uh, hadiths, is, there is an entire section devoted to this topic, and uh, one of these hadiths you can see on the screen. Uh, also, uh, there are hadiths that uh, indicate even specific number of worlds created by God. So the numbers are different, but the fact is that uh, you know it's there. Uh, also of interest, there is a different area of research. These are certain messages that are encrypted in the text of Quran in the form of num uh, numerical ciphers. For example, in 1970s, 1980s, uh, it was found that there is inexplicable connection between the numbers in the world. Uh, of the Quran. For example, the word month in the Quran repeats 12 times, the word day 375 times. The Quran refers that there, the one creator created seven heavens in rows, and the word heaven in the Quran is also repeated seven times. So uh, I later continued to find what is astronomical information can be found in the Quran. In addition to the sun and moon, as uh, the Quran mentions, only one star Sirius is mentioned in the 49th verse of the 53rd surah. Uh, of the Quran, Naj, uh, an, an Najm star says, uh, and only here the river series. So interestingly, uh, we talk. There, there are. There is. We are talking about the power of series. So why was it distinguished among all other stars? So we find. Uh, different uh, interpretations that some Arab tribes worship this star. But we know that the number of idols that people worshipped at that time was humongous, was huge. And almost every tribe had, uh, you know, uh, different stars. So Sirius was not a, a single star that uh, people attached special, attached special role and attention to. So what's this about? Uh, so let's take a closer look at the lines from this surah and please display the verse uh, together with proceeding uh, it. Here you can see it on the screen and you can read it here. I would like to comment a little. So uh, we see that the fact of uh, mentioning of Sirius in uh, the last lines, it's, uh, it's, you know, in the chain of most important processes of, uh, of the universe. So, I mean, the, there's an indication of primary creation and it, it belongs to Allah. And then after that, the proof of the truth of the statement is immediately provided through the disclosure of information about the process of fertilization the ovum, it is further said that, that the secondary creation belongs to Allah alone, and then it is indicated that Allah uh, is also the ruler of serious power. So there is kind of like a very interesting chain of uh, very interesting information. So uh, it's quite difficult to call the mention of Sirius accidental here. So realizing this, some researchers of the Quranic text went further, and, and uh, therefore uh, compared to the information from 
this Sura with the uh, data of model astronomical research, and they came to a most interesting conclusion. What if uh, in this Sura, what if this Sura also contains a certain digit cipher? So, in therefore to five to nine verses of Sura star, it is said because. I will read it out loud. It was taught to him by an angel with mighty powers and of great perfection, who manifested himself in his true form when he was on the higher horizon. Then he approached the Prophet and descended until he was only two bows lengths away or even closer. So, these verses describe the moment of the ascension of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to heaven to Allah. And this most important moment is described with some details, including the night about the Sayyid, uh, it, and he was at a distance of two bold links. Comparing verses 49 and 9, the researchers found the digital cipher 49.9, which indicates the period of rotation of series B around series A, which has long been calculated as approximately equal to 50 years and only recently we, there was revealed information that according to a number of scientific institutions the value of this period is 49.9 years which is more precise calculation so i would like to the tech support to yes uh, you can see this on the image on the screen you can see the rotation uh, of series b and the form how it revolves around series a you know these uh, curves have some uh, kind of like a bow-like uh, image. So, at least I have found this information uh, of the Smithsonian Observatory of the Harvard Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics. And then we are witnessing now another miracle of the Quran. And I think we should pay close attention to the solution. To, the, to this fact, this is the most interesting fact to understand and the hint that was uh, given to us in the Quran about Sirius by the Almighty Allah. So such are the conclusions I came to. Thank you so much, Ildar. Um, I also paid my attention to Quran when I investigated the topic of Sirius and I also was interested in the quote that you gave us earlier that it was taught to him by an angel with mighty powers and of great perfection who manifested himself in his true form when he was on the hor higher horizon. Um, this quote is um, also, you know, I found the analogy in the Egyptian mythology. He is pure of life in the horizon like Sahu Orion and Sept Sirius, the dog star. It is assumed that uh, the Egyptians used the term horizon to refer the orbit of Sirius B. Uh, just what you told us before. And once again, the sacred text led us to Sirius. And in the treaties of Hermes, uh, Trismegistus, the virgin of the world, there are such world, words. Tell me, mother, how did the earth receive the divine emanation? emanation and Isis answered I may not tell you the story of this birth for it is not permitted to describe the origin of thy descent O Horus son of mighty power so what we see that Isis whose symbol is Sirius characterizes his son as the son of great power and based on the quotes that you know, you, you gave us, and we know that is, uh, Isis is connected to Sirius as well, we can have really interesting parallels. And based on the quotes that you gave us, we can see that in the Quran, Allah is not only the Lord of Sirius, that He is the Lord of Sirius, the mighty star, but also the one who has incredible power. And I also refer to the Indian texts, um, and in Indian texts, uh, power and strength is a Shakti, it sounds like Shakti, um, is ancient Indian uh, lore is referred to as the primary divine creative force, the feminine principle. And in religious legends, this creative force is represented in the form of goddesses, who are the spouses of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. And if in Indian philosophy the creative force is represented in the form of goddesses by the spouses of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, then 
Before the Holy Quran times, the spouses of Allah were the sisters Alad, Alad, Al Uza, and Manat. And here, it will be useful to recall the Sumerian Meh, which is transformed more power forces of Alatra. And no matter how much the Sumerian rulers claimed ownership of Alat or the merits of the Anunnaki, the Quran put everything in its place. And to understand who is in reality is the true um, owner of Ma power. So, right now we need to uh, deal with the series. Shall we get started? So, an interesting fact in this, uh, in pre quarantine times, there was a veneration of Sirius around Mecca, and the main deity related to the topic was the goddess Al Shira. She was referred to. Um, to the Hejaz. Another reverted star from the constellation of Sirius was Mirzam, and it rises directly to the front of Sirius, um, heralding his appearance over the horizon. Even the etymology of the name of this star gives us clues. So Mirzam comes from the word Razama, which means collapse, bend. And also, which is very important, make a sound that needs to be followed. Accordingly, the word Mirzam means one who bends, tying, one who folds, saman, the collar. The word Jauza is Orion in Arabic. Putting this together, we get the phrase that is binding Orion, folding Orion, herald of Orion, or summering Orion. I know that a bit later, let's, Scranton will tell us a bit more about the connection between Sirius and Orion, and we will understand how deep is the symbolism here. Uh, that our ancestors gave us. So, the question arises, why the worship of the stars and other celestial objects was a common religious practice among pre-Islamic Arabs and other uh, Semites peoples? Why uh, were the temples of the settled Arab tribes who lived in cities such as Kaaba and Mecca uh, designed so that certain angles face certain stars such as Sirius? Was it an accident or was it the deep design of those who knew? And the keys to understanding this question uh, we managed to find in ancient Arab city Hatra. For ancient Arabs of Hatra, the main deity, the creator of all things, was the goddess Alat, mother of the gods, creator of everything, earth and sky, joy. She was the mother of the god Dushara, but she remained virgin and unmarried and was designed by a four-sided square stone um, of the Kaaba in the temples of Alat, and I'd like to emphasize that there were many temples like that, only women served. An interesting fact on in which we will return a little bit later, and also I would like to emphasize that the story about the goddess of Alat um, goes far back into the past. So the Kaaba, says the Quran, is the holy house of God. This is the first temple built for people. We pointed out to Abraham the place of the Holy House. As you know, Kaaba is the main shrine of Muslims, has the shape of the cube with a marked corner. And such a cube has been a significant spiritual symbol among the peoples of the world since ancient times, indicating the transformation, the converting of a person into spiritual being that is essentially a second birth. According to reliable hadith, the black stone of Kaaba is the same stone that came from paradise with the prophet Adam, peace be upon him. At first the stone was white and so bright that it illuminated the east and west, but it turned black from the touches of sinful people. The hadith says that the black stone is the right hand, the most high on earth.
It is also known that uh, the Dogon sanctuaries, the white stone, is symbolized um, and was playing a big part in their culture. It symbolized the uh, star Po series B. First of all, the Po star is white, like the Po green. Uh, as per Dogon, uh, isn't that interesting, right? And we can also make uh, interesting parallels here. Also, um, in the legends of the Slavs, it is mentioned white burning stone alatir, which fell from heaven. So I'd like to emphasize that. Um, pay attention to the image of alatir. The same eight-pointed eight star is a symbol of the same rhombus a cube placed on one of the corners. If the cube is a 3D figure, then the star is the same cube but in 2D. And this is how many people symbolically depict Sirius. Uh, let's take a look at the etymology of the word Alatir. Um, in the old Slavic script, uh, A was used in the meaning of God or higher power, all containing the set, everything that is, the density of the volume and all the information about the image. English all and German alle translated as everything. The material embroidment of completeness, density is a stone, for example, a diamond. Isn't that interesting? And according to ancient Russian beliefs, it is from under the Alatar stone that the springs of living water take their origin, which bring food and healing creation to the whole world. Exactly under it, the power is hidden, which has no end, and exactly on the Alatar stone sits the red maiden Zara, which constantly awakens the world from the night's sleep. Please pay attention um, to the fact that under this stone the power is hidden that is endless and has no end. And it's what we took uh, our look at the beginning in the Quran. And in Egypt there is also an image of the female goddess associated with Sirius and also sitting on a stone. The goddess Isis uh, was symbolically depicted sitting on a throne. This is precisely what was associated with the ancient images of the Great Mother in the sitting position in the form of a cube. The hieroglyph associated with the name of Isis was depicted as a side projection of a flat square stone, a parallel pipette with uh, an emphasis on the fact that the goddess sits on its top. Let's remember the modern Kaaba with an emphasis on one of the corners. So let's Let's move on. This hieroglyph was often placed on the head of Isis as the symbol of her name, one of the ancient epithets of the Great Mother associated with spiritual exaltation, exaltation with symbolic holy place, the connection of heaven and earth. And now please recall how, uh, what epithets were uh, given to the goddess Allah, the same connection of heaven and earth. And now, uh, let's compare all this with the knowledge that the ancient Arabs in the pre-Quran era worshipped a secret white granite stone with ornaments, a four-sided square shape which um, denoted the goddess Allah, who was considered the concert of Allah and the mother of the gods. It turns out a very interesting cube uh, was depicted as female goddess connecting the earth and the sky creative originated female power and the same knowledge as a blueprint is um, for different nations repeated of the world. So, uh, let's take a look at the connection between Sirius. Some Arab tribes uh, revered Alad as the goddess of the sun, but more often she was associated with the planet Venus and identified with the goddess of love. Uh, 
And according to uh, John Mansour Damas Damascus, who lived in the capital of the uh, Caliphate, connects the word Kaaba with the word Kubar or the star Aphrodite. Uh, when we found this information, we thought that maybe there is a mistake here or maybe in inaccuracies in translation. But um, let's actually sort out what is the star of Aphrodite? Why is it not serious? We found out that Aphrodite, according uh, to ancient Greek mythology, was born as a result of virgin constellation. Uh, a conception and emerged from the sea foam in a shell like a shining pearl, mother pearl, radiant, calling. And as you know, the pearl symbolizes the soul, as well as those who brought the divine pearl of the power of Allah. Let's remember that in the Allah temple only women served and it means that they were the ones who brought pearls, a huge spiritual help to all people. That is why the Kaaba is the place of the spiritual birth of a person and his transformation. And that is why women were uh, praised at those times. This place in ancient times was called the Gardens of the Allah Sisters. And that is why the Penta Arab goddesses Alat, Aluza, and Manat dominated in their importance over the gods for a very long time, more than 6,000 years. Now it is understandable why feminine principle, the great goddess, unites many ancient mythologies. This isn't an accident, and we understand that. Even in ancient times, uh, the feminine cosmic principle was dominant force in the universe. The earliest evidence of the worship of the goddesses are figures of women made of stone, bone, and clay. These figures are called Venus of the Paleolithic Era. Think about it. Their age is sometimes dated to 40, 50 years BC. These, these are images of the Mother Goddess who contains the creative power of all life. With many names and forms, the Goddess played a central role in the worldview of people in different parts of the world. The Sumerians have the goddesses Nihursag and Inanna, the Akkadians have the mother god Aruru, Ishtar, and the Khan uh, Nian has the goddess Anat. In ancient Semitic uh, mythology, there are known goddesses Astarte, Asherat, or Asher, in Armenian Persia, Anahita, in mythology of uh, the Ingush and Chechens, the goddess Aza is known, Indian goddesses Parvati, Lakshmi, Sarasvati, and the others. Lesser Asian goddess Kibele, among the Eastern Slavs, the goddess Makash, ancient Arab Alat, Aluza, and Manat. All these goddesses embodied the creative feminine principle, the bearing force which in ancient times was called Alat. In essence, the concept of Alat is one. This is generally a word of extraterrestrial origin. We got it from Phaeton, Phaeton and Phaeton from Sirius, and it came to Sirius from more advanced civilizations. And now, let's remember the first picture that depicts the goddess Alat. Pay attention to the object she's holding in her hand. Isn't that the technology of additional consciousness of, that we were talking about for many times today? Of course, it is very uh, nicely highlights the origin about 
a lot that we got. Of course, it is still early, very early to draw conclusions. The topic of the Alad sisters, the topic of the role of Anunnaki in the history of mankind was carefully edited and erased from the face of the earth. It is easier to get water from a stone than to find it the, the truth, but thanks to the broadcast with uh, Igor Mikhailovich and the books uh, written by Anastasia Novik, our group of researchers still managed to collect this um, material, but it is very early to put a dot at the end, of course, and we will continue our research, and everyone who is interested in this research, who is interested in digging to the truth, we invite to take part in this amazing project. If you're interested in that, please send us email to info at alatra.tv and we gladly will invite you to participate in this project. It is very interesting. So, why did we mention these facts? To show that such fundamental knowledge about the power of the divine creative feminine beginning of a lot and her important role both in the processes of the development of the universe and in the spiritual awakening of the individual has always been with people and brought by those who faithfully serve God. And why are they lost and distorted uh, beyond recognition in our time? Because they make people free both spiritually and physically with the primordial knowledge of what matter consists of, the primordial knowledge about a lot, you can build a beautiful, comfortable world in a short period of time, and it is very easy to do it. But we will talk about it in more detail a little bit later in our today's Kaleidoscope of Facts. Thank you, Marina. And um, um, the uh, constellation of Orion can be easily identified with the uh, starry sky by the three bright uh, blue light stars that make up the Orion belt. They are aligned, uh, they are aligned side by side uh, in a single line and uh, point south is towards the Sirius star. Sirius is the bright uh, star that appears to be a binary or even um, possibly a triple star system. Modern scientific research has shown that uh, we are um, connected to the Sirius star system and move together to the space, uh, rotating in a spir in spiral around a common center. Uh, therefore, the uh, fate of our planet and series are tightly linked. Uh, in the book um, um, by Robert Temple, The Secrets of Sirius, uh, Sirius B and the Sun are part of the same ordered uh, system, occupying the same cell of the universe. In other words, uh, communication between our star systems does not have to be carried out by radio. Uh, it is also possible, for example, uh, instant communication and even immaterial communication of souls. Oh, Renka, this is very interesting, Renka, and it it is very much echoes with the Dagon cosmology, and in Dagons, I found out that uh, to denote st uh, stellar and planetary systems, the Dagons use the term placenta. Uh, 
Our solar system, as far as we can tell, is called the Ogo Placenta, and the Sirius star uh, system is called the Nomo Placenta. And as we know, Nomo is the collective name of the great cultural hero, the founder of civilization, who came from the Sirius system to create the civilized society on Earth. Uh, so, Grayol and uh, de Terlin described the Dagon concept of co cosmic uh, placentas. Two systems underline different calendars, giving the necessary rhythm to people's lives and activities. One of them, the closest to the Earth, will have as its axis the Sun, which is the sign of the fragment of the Ogos placenta and the other, more distant, Sirius, the sign of Nomos placenta. Very interesting, um, very resonates and with the understanding what is the role and mission of Anunnaki's in the universe. That is so, what did the Dogons mean when they said that the placenta nomo is the uh, manager of the universe? And of course, the very symbolism of the word placenta, something that um, nourishes and protects, makes you think. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, in the book, uh, the Aryan mystery, unlocking the secrets of the pyramids uh, by Robert uh, Bowell and uh, Adrian Gilbert, uh, they talked about the um, stellar orientation of the pyramids of, uh, on the principle in the uh, sky, uh, same as on the Earth, they found that uh, the pyramids are oriented to the uh, constellation of Orion and Sirius. Uh, many mehalites of our planet are oriented towards uh, Orion and Sirius. And, um, um, according to the book Anastasia Novik, Sensei Force, uh, Primordial of Shambhala, an understanding of the significance of uh, these uh, stars of the ancients can be can be found. Uh, the book says that the people lived in the belief that the stars are a cluster of small lamps of uh, the blessed Ba, the souls of not the mother of the stars. And the ancient Egyptians gave their gods Ba. For example, the Orion constellation was called no other than the soul of the god Osiris. Sotis or Sirius in our language was the soul of the goddess Isis, the uh, faithful wife of Osiris. Uh, in 1952, the researcher Samuel A. B. Messerl published the first Egyptian version of the book, The Pyramid Text, in the translation and commentary. Messerl highlighted the fundamental principle of the ancient religion, the belief that the uh, descended Pharaoh is born again as a star and his soul rushes to the sky to find peace in the stars of the Orion Osiris, the dying and reborn God. The dog star was identified with Sirius, Orion with Osiris. Uh, Sirius was known to the Egyptians as Espede or Espedete. The ending, um, ending T is the characteristic of the feminine gender. Sometimes this word is written as Sept and pronounced accordingly uh, Sept. Uh, Oren was also called Sech, uh, which translated as uh, Sach and uh, is pronounced Sach. 
In the pyramid stacks, Saha Aka Orion is called the father of the gods. Orion was also a supporter of Ceres. Uh, spawns uh, Orion's Ceres, he supports his faithful uh, spouse, uh, Ceres uh, Isis. In the um, treatise of Hermes's Trismegistus, on the creation of the world, it was um, world. It was written that the supreme creator sent the gods Osiris and Isis to Earth in order uh, that uh, they could harmonize uh, the heavenly divine laws with the, the earthly human laws and to the teach mankind. Marina? Thank you so much, Renka. We can talk a lot about Egypt, especially in the concept of our today's conference and also I would like to add a little bit that um, uh, a little bit about one um, temple Dendera in Egypt this is the um, the temple of the God of uh, love joy Milky Way night sky and the stars on the ceiling of the Hathor temples uh, chapel the so-called Dendera zodiac is depicted according to the Russian um, ufologist and researcher Valery Uzvarov there are only five zodiacs both round and lineal, lineal um, which among the other things provide information about uh, the events and global catastrophes that have occurred in the solar system over the past 18,000 years. There are texts describing not only when and where certain asteroids fell, but also what they did, what consequences they had for the planets that changed their position and where the conditions changed. Can you imagine what information is there in that temple? Images describe the solar system right up to the global uh, catastrophe. catastrophe. The Earth, for example, was in a different orbit. It was much closer to the Sun. Near to the Earth, uh, there was no Moon, uh, there was no Venus. Uh, orbiting the sun. The asteroid belt did not exist, but instead there was a huge celestial body, a planet Phaeton. Mars was closer to the sun than the Phaeton, and these three planets, Mars, Phaeton, and Earth, was inhabited. We talked about this in the fifth issue of Kaleidoscope Effects, uh, Paleo Contact, um, and I really, really recommend you to watch it because it gives you very deep understandings of different questions. So, the current state of the solar system is the result of global changes, which are uh, captured in the paintings of Dendera. And I'm very interested who who are the ones who were able to uh, provide such uh, changes and how is it how is it possible that ancient people had such information isn't this evidence of the connection of a high advanced extraterrestrial civilization which transferred this knowledge this valuable knowledge and it is very very interesting especially that uh, currently um, our um, our t type of, of the solar system is described as uh, artificial and of course as per um, the words of Valery um, it is said that after the global catastrophe the surviving inhabitants of Mars and Phaeton moved to one of the planets in the constellation of Orion and that is why in many texts it is also says that um, um, it, it is oriented to the Orion and even uh, for the pyramids of Giza um, Orion is the reference point and who are these good people with the in, in, incomprehensible level of science, scientific development capable of repairing the solar system in the text uh, on the walls of the pyramids after 
reconstructing of the solar system, there is a mention of an unknown object. It has a large mass. After long research, it appears to be equivalent to the ma uh, mass of the Earth plus the mass of the Moon and its position behind the Sun, as assumed. The Sumerian texts call this planet Nibiru, um, and based on the calculations of the famous astrophysicist Kirill Batusov, there is absolute symmetry and therefore it is impossible for us to see the symmetrical planet, but its existence well was well known uh, to ancient civilizations. And the ancient model assumed the um, presence of the central fire in the center as well as the Earth on one side and the anti-Earth on another side. Um, uh, there are many reasons to believe uh, that in the distant past the stars were visited by more advanced beings and the connection with Sirius and Aaron. Uh, sun after sun was uh, preserved as the real, original source of the light and energy. If our sun was responsible for supporting the physical existence, Sirius was considered to the one which supports the spiritual principle. Thus, uh, the star was preserved as the uh, herald of the all divine things on earth. People know uh, that uh, great teachers came to us uh, from there. They came to us from another world, uh, distant uh, and different from us others. Many researchers express the opinion that the planet Nubira, which everyone is looking for, is one of the stars of the Sirius system. This is very interesting assumption, because we know that the uh, translation of the word Nubira means literally behind the sun, which fully explains its astronomical position. And then it uh, becomes clear that all the so-called teachers who came from the Sirius are Anunnaki. This question is still objective to more in-depth research, but it is already clear that the knowledge encoded in both petroglyphs and ancient rocks carvings, as well as the modern crops uh, circles, are uh, clues that, uh, where, uh, that uh, we have yet to unravel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranka. It is very interesting. And of course, we still have to do a lot of investigations and research. And of course, today we have Laird Scranton. Dear Laird, studying the meaning of the constellation Sirius and Orion in the history of mankind, we faced the questions of what is symbolism and what should be taken literally. And of course, I would like to understand what energy processes lie in the interaction of these two star systems. Could you please tell us about this a bit more in detail? Um, so the processes of energy that occur in the microcosm, in the quantum world, are the same as those that happen on the atomic scale. They're the same that happen on the scale of solar systems. They're the same that are on the scale of what happens with universes. And so one of the things some of the cultures were actively trying to do was to emphasize that parallelism and to demonstrate that parallelism to us. Because once a person like me understands that there is parallelism, that you can count on that parallelism, the entire process of sorting out the symbolism becomes much simplified. And so the Sirius stars were a big piece of that because when we talk about the root dynamics of energy, uh, from our perspective, those, those energetics begin in the quantum world with the action of what are called virtual particles, particles that sort of move in an almond shape around each other. That dynamic is called angular impulse. And it's the same dynamic that is illustrated by the two Sirius stars if we were to track the motions uh, over time, understanding that the two stars are also moving through space as they move around each other. We end up with um, a diagram that looks, uh, that 
consists of crisscrossing almond shapes, almond shapes that crisscross back and forth. Um, so the Sirius stars were one of the important examples that the teachers of this tradition gave to help us understand, help us uh, intuitively understand that the energetics that control the motion of stars are the same energetics that control the motion of virtual particles. Uh, there's another very important example that they gave that, that survived, and that was comparisons between a tiny spiral of matter that the Dogen tribe called the, the Po Pilu. It's a, a spiral that um, is said to exist at every point in space and time. It's a tiny little vortex. The Dogen say that there is a parallel in the macrocosm to that spiral, and it's a structure that we can observe, although with a little, a little difficulty, because the macrocosmic structure sits, it centers on the belt stars of Orion, but it emits such faint light that we can't see it with our naked eye or with a telescope. We need time-lapse photography in order to be able to see it. And when we image it, the image that's produced is the picture of a spiral centers on one of the stars of the belt stars of Orion. Um, the Dogen refer to it as the chariot of Orion. Um, other cultures refer to it as a wheel or a chariot. Uh, the Dogen treat the the Orion belt stars as the guardians of the gateway, and they consider the Sirius stars to be a gateway. So I wouldn't say that, that the Sirius stars have a non-material beginning, but their dynamic associates with that microcosmic gateway between non-materiality and materiality. And there's an open question as to whether an actual gateway exists in the microcosm at that spot defined by those those two stars um so far in my estimation um very much of what i thought originally to be symbolic has turned out to be literally true i can imagine there might actually be a real gateway at sirius which may be one of the reasons why um ufo contacts have associations with sirius From what I know, Sirius was, as our sun was, the Sirius stars were the product, uh, byproduct of the formation of uh, Barnard's Loop. Barnard's Loop is a, a birthplace of stars associated with the Orion Nebula. And it's thought that both our sun and Sirius uh, were sort of born from Barnard's Loop. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Scranton. And I have realized that you have given us uh, the missing important puzzle uh, of uh, the real uh, vision, the whole picture, how these uh, systems are in and series are connected. And it's uh, wonderful that our uh, researchers uh, can um, help us to understand more and more and uh, get the answers for the question that we're a secret for a thousand of years. I also would like to, to say thank you to Marina because she mentioned the topic um, that it's uh, no longer a secret and uh, we know that the planet Earth experienced in the past dramatic climate changes, the changes of the poles and the great floods. And uh, also, uh, we know uh, this by the information that has come uh, down to us from uh, myth and legends uh, of different people from all, all over the world. And this myth and legend, they are remarkably similar and supported scientifically proven facts. Um, and um, we know that uh, we have the... Um, 
uh, scientific proof of uh, these scenarios of the this myth and what we can um, understand from this we know that myth and legends they are not uh, a fiction but a convenient and simple form of transferring knowledge and experience through generations and without losing the many meaning and if we um, talk about such historical event as um, uh, the great flood um, so uh, aliens uh, are one of the uh, um, actors there and also there is a mention of different technologies and um, for example we can um, uh, we can look through the legend about uh, the legend that uh, talked uh, by Hopi they are um, uh, um, the tribe uh, tribal leader named white beer who lives in the state of Arizona in the United States and uh, he told the scientificans um, the legend about the celestial friends helpers that uh, named Kachins um, when their continent was flooded Kachins relocated them to a safe place in several types of uh, vehicles flying object, objects uh, in the form of uh, pumpkin halves and uh, or in the form a uh, form of an egg flying birds uh, with the uh, outscratched wings and also they move them by water but um, on rafts boats and canoes that were unusual for them at that time the hobby had the no navigation or radar instruments but the kachins uh, accurately uh, guided to the uh, ship to the right place and uh, they uh, have built the new cities this lands uh, for example the city of uh, Palaktali uh, the red earth uh, and in the center they uh, erected a three stone building uh, where they taught them the natural and exit uh, science sciences including the, the structure of um, substance and it was an enriching irritation that uh, contributed to the several and development of Hopi people. The same uh, teachings we can find at uh, Zoroastrians in the sacred scripture Avesta. Uh, um, his name, so uh, the leader uh, of the entire sky, uh, Chishurya, uh, his name uh, translated as uh, relating to the constellation of three luminaries or the powerful de uh, deity of the star Sirius, which consists of the three stars. According to the language, uh, sorry, according to the legend, the creator Ahura Mazda said a brilliant and blessed uh, Tihuchi uh, to fly the demon of uh, drought and unbelief. For 30 days and nights, uh, Tishtar was uh, dissembled uh, in its uh, brilliance and each form produced rain uh, for 10 days and nights. Uh, he was in control of all the water and the wind element, uh, wielded a facey sword and a hammer and construction and creation. In other in other words, he posed the technology to control nature phenomena. He also had a key that gives access to knowledge of events in the um, multivarietal form and the ability to simulate future uh, situations. But if we move uh, forward with the map of our planet, we can get to uh, Russia and we can find the myth about the flood and the help uh, from the sky. In Bashkir legends, uh, a myth hero named Ural uh, on a winged horse uh, dried the earth and gave it immortally. If we move uh, to China, we can learn about a series of floods. Emperor's um, grandson uh, uh, Digong loved people and uh, he decided to um, 
deal with the flood by himself and to save the people from the disaster. Uh, to do this, he used the treasure Shijan uh, from the uh, Celestic Palace, and um, this uh, treasure, this little piece of Tijan, if you throw it, uh, the immediately dams and even mountains can grow in this place. Uh, having obtained the Shijan from the Sky Palace, uh, Gong went down to the ground and began to build uh, dams. People were, were able to come down from the shelters of the mountain caves and start farming and setting down. Um, also, in uh, Chinese legends, we can find information about his grandson, uh, Yu. Um, he went to the Supreme Lord and asked for the Sijan, and the Lord gave him uh, Sijan and told to go down to the ground, to the earth, and to control the flood. And uh, to help him, uh, to um, he helped him uh, gave the uh, dragon uh, Inglong, Perhaps this is also a flying technology. You remained uh, in people's memory as the flood uh, restrainer. If we analyze uh, many uh, legends and myths, we have much more of them, but we cannot talk about them all. Uh, we understand that um, we have very many um, common information, and uh, this information is um, approved by the facts, and um, thanks to the technology they post, uh, they were able uh, to influence nature phenomena and provide um, positive assistance to people, uh, they helped people to survive, to settle in the new environment. Uh, people uh, developed a very respectful attitude towards them, which over time remained in the form of um, reverence for them and uh, this Mm, some kind of um, distinction of serious constellation among the constellations. Also, through the myth and legends, uh, the knowledge were given. And uh, we know that Anunnaki had uh, an extra powers and technologies, knowledges that um, were not available um, to humanity now and this that time. These technologies were described with uh, allegories and metaphors um, in different places on the earth and in different times. And why uh, did people use allegories and me um, metaphors because uh, they were understandable and comprehensible to people of all the time. It is mentioned that uh, they live by the Creator's laws and are appointed to uh, Him to maintain order uh, in the universe. They have never left the humanity and left uh, an incredible mark on history. The following video will show you the uh, recorded phenomena and facts uh, that occurred in our time. There are many cases which are not explained by science when UFOs appear near the places of natural disasters. There are a lot of evidence for this. Many UFOs are recorded around the world near erupting volcanoes. In 2010, eyewitnesses recorded glowing lights near the awakened volcano, close to the Eyjafjallajökull glacier in Ireland. According to experts, as the familiar scenario goes, the eruption of this volcano should have been followed by the awakening of large volcano Katla. Coastal countries in northern Europe would have been flooded. But after the appearance of fireballs, the activity of the volcano suddenly decreased. Was it a coincidence? On December 26, 2004, Near Sumatra Island, the Earth's crust was shifting, causing one of the strongest earthquakes in recorded history. It caused a massive tsunami that reached the shores of Indonesia, Sri Lanka, southern India, Thailand and other countries. According to scientists' calculations, an earthquake of that magnitude should have brought more powerful destruction, 
However, this did not happen. Fireballs were also recorded near the tsunami. Why do they appear where a disaster occurs and the scenario of events changes? On March 12, 2011, due to prolonged earthquakes and disasters on Fukushima Island in Japan, there began explosions of Fukushima nuclear power plant reactors. Geologists and radiologists are confident that after such a disaster, radiation was to spread all around the planet, but this is not happening. Meanwhile, eyewitnesses observe a record number of glowing lights over Fukushima. There are many eyewitness accounts about UFO observed over the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, both on the day of the tragedy itself and some time later. In the affected areas, a significant drop in the level of radioactivity was recorded for inexplicable reasons. A former Minister of National Defense of Canada, Paul Hellyer, said that back in 1960s government research confirmed the fact that extraterrestrial civilizations visited our planet. Many UFOs were recorded during the Cold War, he said. And of course there's been a lot more activity in the last few decades since we invented the atomic bomb, explains Hellyer. In his opinion, representatives of extraterrestrial civilizations are concerned about the use of nuclear weapons on Earth. Dear friends, thank you for being with us. Stay tuned for more interesting information as we learn about UFO sightings during catastrophes and natural cataclysms, who is creating the crop circles, and much, much more. And, you know, the world is ours to discover. There is so much truth in primordial knowledge that can be gathered from the books by Anastasia Novich and programs with participation of Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Renata, could you tell us what topic we are studying next? Yeah, uh, thank you. Today uh, it is important to talk uh, frankly and truthfully because uh, it is for us, humanity, literally the question of the life and death. It is necessary to connect the seas of truth uh, scattered around the whole world and put them uh, in the context. Uh, this helps all of us as humanity to fully understand the mutual responsibility we have for the life of each other and every individual. Uh, the ancestors from the stars would return. This is one of the prophecies about the end times. And this prophecy was voiced over today on this kaleidoscope effect. As we understand now, our ancestors did not go away. They are here with us the whole time. And it is us, the mankind, who has the most forgotten about them. Turns out uh, it, is you, um, it is us, after role who is uh, returning to them and we are really living in the era of the end times uh, do we uh, this is uh, the key question we are going to study in the June's kaleidoscope effects current uh, problems of the science is uh, facing today uh, have a direct link with the uh, prophecies of the prophets about the end times. Uh, this is also provided by many ancient cultures around the world uh, in, the, in their uh, predictions about our time. It turns out they are uh, all coming from one source. What is the um, meaning of the uh, end times and the time of crossroads? How real is the apocalypse uh, in fact and what do we actually know about the golden age? This question is tightly connected with our political religion elite and their actions which is uh, direct our attention to solve the climate, economical and social crisis which is uh, completely ineffectively measures. Uh, 
uh, we will look at uh, where they are leading us in reality if we let them. Today, everything depends on the choice of each and every one of, on, every one of us. The end of crossroads is approaching. Are we aware of the choice we are uh, mankind uh, making as a humankind? Uh, there are two waves uh, ahead of us. Going one way means the end and another is beginning. We are living in an era of the end times. The world is on a verge Are the prophecies being fulfilled? Present days have been foretold a long time ago What is written about this period in religious writings? Have our ancestors warned us about this time? What is the era of crossroads? Era of the end times? Or a new beginning? What is the golden age? Myth or reality? What is the standpoint of science? Can we change the vector of the events? Kaleidoscope of facts, signs of end times. June 13, 2021, at 1200 GMT. Initiated by participants of Alatra International Public Movement from Poland, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Alina, maybe you can tell us about uh, what you learned about the Igigi. Right. Hello, everyone. Of course, the topic of Igigi is um, of utmost interest. And it's really very interesting to find out about it because um, the roots of it go to the ancient Sumerians. And to date, up to one and a half million cuneiform texts are stored in museums around the world. And every year, archaeologists find thousands and thousands of new documents in cuneiform texts. And it is exactly clay tablets that are today the most refined formal knowledge transfer that has existed in history. And uh, all the peoples, um, they um, just consider it as written monuments. But of this, one and a half million, only thousands have been transferred to date. And uh, as a, just uh, as also, by the way, our colleague, academic researcher and writer Matt Lecra also speaks about this and he personally studied the cuneiform tablets and what they say about the Anunnaki and the Igigi. But since um, Matt Lecra was not able to connect us today, we would like to talk about and to remind us what he said in our previous videos on the TV about the Anunnaki and Igigi. And according to Matt Legra, what um, especially struck him most of all was that the cuneiform tablets describe the entire period of the history of human existence 
which was repeatedly destroyed by cyclical cataclysms that occurred on our planet and that we mentioned to date, right? And in fact, the restart button was pressed, which led to a new beginning of humanity and civilization. The Sumerian tablet shows us how deep their knowledge was. And lots and lots of artifacts uh, confirm that uh, there are mm, highly, more highly developed civilizations than we are. And the Sumerian tablets, they show um, uh, how deep, right, their knowledge was, in fact. And uh, uh, especially hundreds of tablets that mention the supreme divine creatures of the Anunnaki, but unfortunately about 50% uh, of the information was translated and provided the whole public with substitutions. And how it happened, why it happened, we will talk about it today. Uh, but let us uh, go right back to the territory of Iraq, where in 1849 the most extensive library of clay tablets was discovered during excavations in the city of Nineveh, uh, Nineveh Iraq. And 30,000 tablets were found reflecting thousands and thousands of years of human history. And this find was named the Library of Cain Ashur Benipal. And uh, Austin Henry Leight actually discovered these tablets uh, together with his colleagues uh, in 1849. Um, Austin, he sa uh, just said that he could not, or he was not able to read Sumerian, and uh, so he sent these tablets to London to the University of Oxford, where they lay for several years, while Oscar uh, just appealed to the entire world scientific community, um, and he asked them to learn this, uh, uh, just to decipher them. So they assumed that it was exactly the Sumerian language, and uh, um, after it, there was the Akkadian civilization and Babylon, but all these cultures that had disappeared thousands of years before they were found, and no one knew how to translate these um, clay tablets. John Smith was actually the first Sumerologist in the world. He was a talented self-taught assistant in the Egyptian Assyrian department of the museum, so he um, actually accepted this challenge and he mastered the Sumerian Akkadian language. And Judge Smith was, uh, was the first person in thousands of years to learn to read in this language. But it should be noted that out of the 30,000 tablets, most, most of them remain untranslated up to date due to the complexity of the translation and the stone, well, you know, is not perfectly preserved. Uh, so um, really some of the data is missing uh, because, you know, the um, clay tablets, uh, uh, they uh, were just, it was difficult to, ma to make them, but, uh, but Judge Smith, uh, he also took up this case, so of course he wasn't able to translate everything uh, because he died of an illness in 1876 still. After him, the scientists continued the translation of the Sumerian tablets and it is still developing, well, slowly though, but um, allegories and interpretations are used through the prism and worldview of the translate. So we should take that into account. And just imagine the very first table, the epoch of Gilgamesh, that world famous epoch was the one that he had read. Today, it would, it's just uh, the most famous, right, epic. And, uh, of course, there is information about the Igix in, and in it, but, uh, well, it's not complete, unfortunately. And I would like just um, to tell you a few words about them, that uh, Anunnaki, right, uh, gods, and that the gods had a lot of work to do. They shared a responsibility, someone in heaven, someone on earth. And since the Gigis had a difficult job, to clear the channels of these rivers, given life, and they worked on this side for 3,600 years. Uh, they were, of course, not that smart as Anunnaki, but they were just powerful creatures, it's for sure. And we know that um, um, actually uh, it was the Tiger and Euphrates rivers that were vital for the maintenance of life as they made it possible to support agricultural activities. 
And we, uh, from the first part, we learn about the Anunnaki gods and the gods uh, had um, all just council of seven uh, Anunnaki, and there was a decision made about the creation of a person. Uh, of actually of man, um, just uh, the origin of man, so that they would have to work instead of Igigis. But we know that the Sumerians used in their, um, uh, okay, the, the just quote trains information about the times of Atlantis. And we know that uh, from the video about uh, Atlantis in search of immortality. Um, and we know that these so called yes, Sumerian gods, they were uh, just um, doing different experiments, right? When the children of El appropriated, who appropriated the names and epithets of the seven messengers of God, they created outrage and slavery, inequality on earth. And uh, therefore, well, we can assume that for those who are really interested in there is important information in this legend. Um, Matthew Lagrari decided to study the subject himself, and the fact is that uh, actually Igigi they came to Earth, and that uh, another fact that the Anunnaki had a lot of work to do, and Igigi, of course, um, um, also helped for 3,600 years. They helped to clear the channels of the rivers that were the channels that supported the life of people in this region. And today we have information about the cyclicality of cataclysms. Uh, so, uh, actually, they actually helped the development of the agricultural sector and, and they helped people because without them it would be impossible to revive the civilization without water deliver, for example, you know, that there is no life. Um, and because it depends on a lot on agricultural sector. And Igigi helped to restore the infrastructure of this region. And we see that uh, um, well, people were also taught to use these skills. So we see that Igigi were helping people to gather in, con in connection with the Anunnaki. And, but uh, nowhere it is sad that Igigi left our planet. So do they communicate with us today or do they transmit information to us? Can we understand it? Let us watch uh, the video together. Uh, but before we go to a video, I would also like just to remind uh, some information about Igigis because it's really very important and interesting. You know that on TikTok we met, we came across an interesting comment that the Igigi are the helpers of the Anunnaki, and it's interesting that uh, the name Igigi itself, well, uh, it is found in the po poem, famous poem Inuma Elish, when uh, Marduk asks a question to the Anunnaki, Igigi answers him uh, where they are described as great gods. Robert Temple, his book The Serious Mystery, uh, also connects the Igigi with the Anunnaki. He knows that Sumerologists have not been able to explain that just, you know, all this tangle of oddities around these faceless but at the same time important deities. And in the story of the king of Itana, uh, who lived after the great flight and set out to reach heaven, the divine seven is mentioned as well. These seven deities are called Igigi, which, well, you know, uh, leads the author to the relationship to the terms Igigi and Anunnaki. And although now, well, thanks to TikTok and uh, thanks to Jana, we know that the Igigi are not just related to the Anunnaki, they are the helpers of these highly evolved, highly spiritual alien beings. In Sumerian, you know, Igi means an eye. And its designation even in Sumerian, uh, well, it looks like an eye. And uh, it can also be translated as sight, vision, face, front. And all over the world, um, we find lots and lots of figurines uh, with just a symbol of eyes. Uh, um, 
convey, which convey the meaning of observers who came from other planets. So this fragment was found in northern Mesopotamia along with thousands of similar fragments excavated from an ancient Mesopotamian temple, now called the Temple of the Eye, because of this and other ancient works of art found there. So these eye figurines, they were embedded in the mortar from which the adobe temple was built. Rem the remains of this temple were allocated uh, just near Tilbrak, uh, uh, just in present-day northeastern Syria. Also, there is another temple of the eyes and excavated in the Habur Valley. Um, and is dated to about 3000 BC. Among the finds were several thousand titles made of black and white alabaster, uh, having a pair of, of several pairs of eyes. And uh, according to the scientist Mello, when uh, their ex voto uh, donated to the all seeing goddess, the patroness of the city. And um, the scientist, uh, right, uh, Crawford, uh, started the spread of this iconographic um, type or these artifacts. And so, uh, in the, his just book, The Eye Goddess, um, he just collected all these artifacts from all over the world. And these, for example, uh, they were found in southern Italy and they belong to the 6th century BC. So Crawford notes that uh, there are a lot of figurines found all over the world, and um, just uh, but they are all unique and they do not uh, repeat each other. Also, looking at them, it was interesting to know that some of them have very interesting caps, kind of caps, and um, so similar caps can be found on other artifacts. Uh, well, if we can call this. Um, just um, kind of closes. So maybe it was some kind of technology or device necessary for space travel, which was had to be put on hat. And in the Syrian Arab culture, the concept of eye is associated with many natural factors. So, for example, uh, just when the, uh, the sun, when it is red or shining bright, it is called ein eye, the source from which water flows, and our galaxy is also called ein eye. That is. And interesting that Anunnaki music album also contains um, the, the one that we've heard today. So it also contains the sign of the eye in the center of the galaxy. And next, figurines are well found in, Tur in Tripoli. Sorry. And it's interesting that uh, there are many of such figurines in Tripoli culture. And you can just uh, note that in what simple style they were made and uh, uh, with an accent on eyes, big eyes. Next, uh, figurines were found in Turkey. You can have a look at them. And these are ones from the Pyrenees. Next, uh, um, just example is from Petra, Jordan, and we can you can see uh, big eyes in each of them. Another very interesting Sumerian engraving was in the museum of Baghdad before the looting of the museum, and um, these are uh, well engraving right. Uh, this figurine carries a lot of interesting information. So. You can see just on the level of solar plexus, you can see sign uh, which uh, you you can well it it could be presented for highly spiritualized um, beings and also. Uh, you can see uh, six uh, dots and the with the seven swans and the ikigi emblem and. Also, uh, you know that these uh, six dots, uh, they um, just uh, represent the artificial um, uh, consciousness or just con uh, complementary consciousness. And also, actually, you can see another sign of uh, um, just, uh, well, uh, the eyes on the handbags. And uh, often ancient deities were depicted with some handbags. Now we already know that this was part of the technology. And uh, as we saw, 
And today in the video of Jean on TikTok where someone kind of is displayed on her costume and it was so also um, visible, it could be seen that something similar to such like purse or bag. But it's interesting that an art artifact with us was found and let us um, watch a video together right now. So who Igigis are? Jean, is it true that Anunnaki also draw different patterns on the fields? No, it's not true. That's a gigi fooling around. Miracles are one of the world's major mysteries, but they became a real sensation in the beginning of 1990s, when they appeared all over the world. The first patterns were really just circles, but over time they became more and more complex and varied. Some people think that crop circles are easy to create, but it is not as simple as it may seem at first glance. There are certain features by which experts determine the authenticity of the circles. Greetings, we are at the crop circles. This year they were formed in the Gulkevich district of Krasnodar region. The nearest point is the village of Sokolovskaya. The formation looks like nine circles. From above, if you look from the bird's eye view, it resembles a butterfly a moth or a caterpillar, whichever you like better. Someone sees the sun, planets, stars, the moon and so on. It's a classic pictograph with the entrance hole in the central circle and the finishing circle by the road. We measured the circles, their diameter, width, length, and we measure the entrance hole, take samples of wheat ears and send all of these to the laboratory. We also take soil for analysis and wait a certain period of time until a laboratory gives us an official report as to whether or not there is any anomaly in these circles. We have a number of indications by which we determine the authenticity of circles. I will name at least three. The first one is that there are no living creatures of any kind around. There are never any insects in real circles, neither butterfly nor flies or bird fly there either. All living creatures avoid it. This is the first sign by which we can say that the circle is genuine. The second sign is the presence of an entrance hole in the main central circle, which in this formation is somewhere around 20 and 22 meters. If there is no such hole, we also reject the circle. This is an indispensable condition, so to speak, the classics of the genre. And the third way not to make a mistake is instrumental. It is very accurate because people have not yet learned how to lower the level of radiation. We have only learned how to increase it. And in these circles, as a rule, radiation levels are lower than the background radiation around them. These are the three signs by which we determine whether a circle is genuine or not. 
In this case, the radiation proved to be low, and in the entrance hole of the circle, the thermal image showed 500 degrees Celsius. It seems that it was all scorched by someone with some kind of a beam, by means of some unknown technology. There are video footages on the Internet where eyewitnesses managed to record the appearance of a pattern. Like crop circles, flying plasma balls also raise many questions. Now we know, however, whom this phenomenon is related to. Well, first of all, there are balls. These are remote control probes. They can be actually very small, like this. That involves a certain nanotechnology. They are surrounded just with a plasma field in order to penetrate through the dense objects and relieve tension in the atmosphere. In other words, it is not affected by air environment or air resistance when it moves in the plasma field. Its nature is similar to the nature of ball lightning. Ball lightning is also an interesting phenomenon, if we talk about plasma formations. So these telemetry probes, the so-called remote probes, and these lightning balls have a lot in common. And more often, when you see a plasma ball, it can be just an aircraft, or even a spaceship surrounded by this plasma. Plasma is one of the key elements of this technology, which facilitates the movement of these aircrafts. As Jana says, Igigi are just fooling around. But really, some of the interesting things they do. They are not only doing it in the fields, but they have been observed doing crop circles in some interesting places. Rodrigo, please tell us if you have seen crop circles in Chile. Bueno, muchas Thank you very much for invitation um, to participate in this conference. I would like to say that it is there is uh, very complex figures in the fields of Chile, and I will divide them into two groups. The first group was formed around 20 years ago back, 20 years back, and it was formed out of 400 trees and now we are talking about trees somewhere with a height of 20 meters and it happened in the forest they they were felt folded in halves in a diameter of 100 meter and it is very difficult to imagine that someone could fold like these trees to create such a circle but we found we found eyewitnesses uh, and um, 
they didn't what they didn't know what was happening in the forest right there, but they were on the beach, 15 meters, uh, 50 meters from the forest, and they saw. Uh, something was moving above the forest it was something like plasma balls and then they flew away into the sky and um, there is even there is also zone with two five by six meters on their sides and it looked like that these circles were simply cut and mm, cut in the grass and laid uh, and um, like that we do not have any some kind of apparatus or machine that could create such a uh, to lift so big triangle and leaves it somewhere there and also very similar similar triangles were found uh, in other places in Ireland in my opinion and I think we should be very and uh, we should be very careful and continue to study such events in in order to understand this phenomena. Moreover, they are globally. You have uh, gathered a lot of information about UFOs appearing during natural cataclysms and other disasters, such as explosions on nuclear power plants. And um, we would like to hear a bit more about uh, these events. Sí. Bueno, efectivamente, eh, en Chile eh, y en Latinoamérica en general, cuando se han dado situaciones de cataclismo fuerte, in Chile, there is a region with such a strong cataclysm, so there were um, sometimes very interesting things, because we know that UFO is uh, seen very often there. And I want to say about what, that during an earthquake, humanoids were seen there, or in other words, giants. When in 19 in 1860, it was a very huge earthquake, very strong, and there were three epicenters of this uh, earthquake, and in one of them appeared some kind of spheres, and above the ocean, over the ocean, and it is interesting that there were no tsunami at that moment, so before the earthquake um, these spheres could be seen, and then in the morning these friends, they were dressed in blue and they were approaching to the village from the sea along the beach and then they were seen as they simply left plunging into the water and if there was it was also visible as these creatures they showed themselves quite actively. They started to wake up people who stayed, who came there on the beach and said there that to leave because uh, the tsunami is coming, was coming, and we can say that lives were saved. So we can say that in such a places uh, uh, um, luminous spheres were seen in the north in the city of Sant in the north of Santiago it was also seen two spherical two spherical ships so to say 
and it was like they took something from the ground as if is some kind of train was chosen and we can say that yes very often there are quite enough uh, uh, registered uh, objects when some UFOs are seen and it's like they are some observers of what is happening, but sometimes they are also interfere. Rodrigo, could you please tell us in what cases do they um, interact? I can hear you. Can you repeat, please? Tell us in what cases do they uh, come? Ah, sí, también eh, hay que, para mí las intervenciones más delicadas. Yes, for me, the most difficult moment when, when the UFO are appearing is when in the places where in the places related to nuclear weapons or where there are some technologies that launches nuclear missiles and it was registered in Russia and in America and in 2006 there was a story by, by a lieutenant and he said that he saw um, some some UFOs uh, and, and they took control of nuclear missile and it lasted about 25 minutes and it was impossible to understand what is happening and it was they see this object above the base and the same happened in Ukraine also in the missile base and for a, about five minutes a computer system was uh, taken under a control of UFO that was registered and in other in other cases some eyewitnesses some people who work in the um, in the army, they, they also tell stories, and the stories were confirmed that James Fox, the author of one of the works on this topic, he told that about the fact that sometimes uh, it could be noticed in the sky when, for example, there was a um, a launch of such a nuclear missile missiles uh, if UFO intercepted and tore them apart that is destroy them in the sky and this allows us to understand that it is a warming for us that they watching us and we should not um, cross the line essentially and so you know that this will continue on that we have for example to follow or to just don't study that further on essentially because we do remember what happened or what has been before and because of what in June of next year by the Pentagon what had happened was um, that they were planning to essentially they were planning to essentially create or well to conduct their researches on the UFO presence and to make it public in the end of the day and because of that they were supposed to tell about all of those cases that had happened in the past regarding the UFO where it was observed and um, which allows us to understand essentially that this is the type of the consciousness that can localize uh, some kind of stress to take under control and to neutralize them if necessary. 
Спасибо большое, Родриго. Это очень Thank you very much, Rodrigo. You presented really very interesting, exciting information, and uh, we would also like to share um, our well experience of one very interesting contactee, uh, Victor Karshno. So he said that uh, these uh, high beans, right, high, high, highly developed beans, they do not interfere. They can only observe. Uh, the development of our civilization. Unfortunately, Victor Karshino is no longer alive, but uh, we will tell the most interesting moments out of his experience. So he was one of six residents of Riga who in uh, 1989 uh, went to the Perm Anomalous Zone for research and where he had contact with the an extraterrestrial civilization and it took place telepathically and Karshino treated with big caution of the research approach. So on the very first night, he asked his friend to watch him. Uh, he explained to his friend that he heard a voice in his head, and uh, uh, if uh, Victor suddenly w um, just went crazy, so um, he asked his friend to watch him so that he would not harm anyone. Then, for his own confidence, he underwent diagnostics in a psychiatric hospital, and of course everything was fine with him, and his contact was really confirmed from different uh, points on the subject of reality. Yes, this is very interesting uh, context here, and one of, in our opinion, strong evidence of his contact with highly developed extraterrestrial civilization is the mention of an interesting technology. He calls it the Matrix. It was created uh, and it looked uh, the same way as his body, uh, but he was created by this alien race for him so that he could explore the space in, and without harming his own body. According to his stories, he could connect to it when necessary while being in his own body in consciousness and move in the matrix, but being able to see through the eyes of this matrix and a little bit later he learned to take objects by his hands uh, by, by the hands of the matrix and interesting moment is that uh, the control over the matrix was revealed to him gradually uh, as he learned sounds fantastic but this fact has been verified in any assignment of course we understand what assignments we talk about right the special um, services got interested in his unique abilities. So, for example, the center of flight K, Korshinov, was proposed to be transported into space in the matrix to detect the Phobos 2 uh, automatic interplanetary uh, station, which, which had left orbit, and to troubleshoot it if possible. Uh, this one of tests was showed the veracity and seriousness of his contact and it is interesting this this test actually uh, you know proved the seriousness of this contact and very interesting fact is that Korshinov says that in the space he met many such matrices um, it is also important to know uh, Karshino's understanding of contexts in general. Uh, after all, as in his time and especially today, as you know, there are a lot of contactees and as uh, the statistics say, only 80% of the reported cases of contacts are actually true. And this is a very important point. It's important to understand that. And Karshino also spoke about this. Um, well, he said uh, that there are uh, so-called high astral contacts, uh, well, as I call them, and there are low astral contacts, uh, meaning, well, with the lower s subtle material beings, and the difference in this context uh, is really huge. According uh, to Korshino, in the low astral contacts, uh, 
Well, uh, the image of a saint or an alien may be, so to speak, or just, uh, so to say, to your request, right? And information can be transmitted. Uh, people will kind of, um, these contactees write the right dictation letters uh, or something like that. But what really matters is how uh, contactees feel after that, because, um, you know, these entities simply take away the life force of a person, and in the end, they may even lead to suicide. Uh, and at the time when contact with higher extraterrestrial beings really occurs, even if it is telepathic, well, such a contact always enriches a person. And as at the beginning of our today's uh, conference was said, as Rodrigo told us, that even the majority of people have their diseases disappearing, and it means that person, well, is not consumed um, with this contact with the uh, high astral beings, but rather enriched. Another very important point. The knowledge that was transferred to Karshina was transferred not only for him, and he was constantly reminded of this. Uh, well, this knowledge was uh, transmitted for all the people, not just for Karshina. So it is also interesting that even when Karshina communicated as if with one creature, he always heard the word of we, that is, these creatures are um, uh, beings, they completely lack the concept of pride and selfhood. This is a very interesting fact, because studying, while well, studying the Holy Quran, I also noted that um, the narration on behalf of Allah um, comes precisely from the pronoun we in the plural form. Uh, right, and Karshino, uh, well, uh, he um, just called about the highly developed civilization, and um, he was also interested in the question of why um, these beings got in touch with him, why not with the heads of government? Uh, so uh, he thought that, oh, if it happened to me, probably it was not true. And after all, um, actually, um, the just uh, these extraterrestrial beings, they said that uh, they had contact with the heads of government. And uh, so you can uh, read uh, just the information. Uh, so he was thinking, just question, I was thinking like, if uh, they had a contact with the heads of government, I mean, these extraterrestrial beings, then they could correct our course of development as a society. And, but they said that such attempts were made, but they were not successful. And also, uh, that any ordinary person can bring great benefits to society, well, as these um, uh, highly developed beings has, have said. And any just ordinary person can change the cause of civilization development with this information uh, that Korshino was spreading. But again, emphasizing that a very important point that they, um, highly developed beings, they have no right to produce a direct impact on civilization development. And you know, this information is also uh, proved by many interviews that we arranged during the preparation for this conference. We asked the question, why do you think uh, they chose you? And the answer sounded almost the same probably um, for all of them, so that I could convey this message to people. And what they transmitted to Korshinov and me and what other contactees said gives us a very, very important understanding that we ourselves are responsible for the fate of our society. And each person can do a lot, uh, to be honest. Let's, uh, we talk a lot, but let's see the excerpt from this very interesting interview with Korshinov. The fact is that, you know, there are quite a lot of representatives of the civilizations overseeing our Earth now, a large number. I can talk about those whom I know directly. But just as there is good and evil in the world, so in space, there are civilizations that are not really kind to us. There are civilizations with whose representatives I communicate that have been here for many, many thousands of years, since the birth of life on Earth. And they themselves mentioned that their civilization was one of those that participated in the process of colonizing the Earth, meaning the Earth was colonized by these civilizations. This is our maternal civilization. And so when I was informed of this, I naturally asked the question, so are you gods in our understanding? They replied, no, we are not gods. For many millennia, you mistakenly have been taking us for gods because we had gone away 
and appeared in fire, flame, and so on. But we are human beings, just like you, meaning we are protein civilizations. We are just far ahead in our level of development, and now at this stage, we are like mediators between you, Earthlings, and the highest cosmic mind. In other words, we oversee the Earth, and we make sure that all the processes on Earth take their natural course so that you develop naturally as an intelligent civilization, and we make sure that you make as few mistakes as possible. On the same trip, I had meetings with them. The meetings were not like, say, when you are invited to remote meetings, but I met with them as I am sitting with you now. It was a little different, because now I can already tell you what it was like. It was a journey of consciousness. My consciousness, as I thought at the time, only my eyes eyes and brain and nothing else, had been taken out of my body. I saw my tent under me, where I was at the moment, the fire, the figures of the orderlies, the river, the clearing, everything, and my consciousness began to move in space eastward for an indefinite distance. The fly was rapid and for a while even the vision disappeared. That is, the vision was disabled. But there was no fear. I knew that it was done on purpose, for some reason. And then when my vision came back to me, I saw a clearing lit with a bright blue light below me. The height was about 300 meters above the surface, and from this height I saw human figures with two arms and two legs. It was impossible to see faces. The light was coming from everywhere and nowhere. I mean, you know, the light source was not visible. The trees that bordered this glade seemed to glow. The grass glowed. The figures of the people gleamed with such silvery metal. I mean, I had the feeling that there were some people underneath me, dressed in armor. That was the first visit. It literally lasted for a very short time. That is, they showed me that they exist. They brought me back with the promise that the next night, or rather the next morning, just as it was the first time, they would repeat this communication experience. The next morning I had another session, let's say with a visit to their camp again, where I saw their ships and I met them directly, like this, face to face. They had absolutely beautiful athletic bodies. They looked like young people, and according to my understanding, they were two men, the ones who came up to me, aged 35 to 37, no older than that. As it turned out later, by that time they had already been way over 400 years old. They had fair hair, let's say the color of ripe straw, exceptionally symmetrical faces, regular facial features, straight noses, you know, such very wide set, amazingly beautiful eyes, straight mouths. Let's say their haircuts looked typically earthly. I mean, they had not long, but rather a short haircut. Their average height was 1 meter 80, 1 meter 86, 5 feet 9 inches to 6 feet, as I estimated it. But then, much later, I found out that they don't have such a clear gradation. So 1 meter 80. Well, their average height is 1 meter 80. Slightly taller than ours, yes, but neither giants nor dwarfs. They were all clothed. Again, later it turned out that these were their work clothes, in such silvery overalls made of very soft fabric, which fits the whole body and has no seams. Very elastic. It fits, you know, uh, the anatomical details of the human body are clearly visible through this fabric. I mean, it was clear they had practically nothing under the overalls. Well, maybe they wore light underwear. Nevertheless, they were not cold. This fabric somehow kept them warm, and they actually explained that these clothes they had were very comfortable for work in such, say, earthly conditions. Uh, please uh, pay attention to Jana's costume or uh, suit. Um, uh, uh, it was really without any seams, and even uh, it was. It is very difficult to make one in just a nurse. When I asked if they were mortal just like us, what was their lifespan in terms of time on their planet, they said they lived on average from 400 to 700 years. This is by our earthly standards, yes, because it's a little different for them. Other rhythms and everything else. And the third thing that struck me was that everything in space was so similar. I mean, our civilization and its path of development and the path of development of all highly developed civilizations is similar. Because I asked, like, if you are not gods, if you are, shall we say, intermediaries, then if you are our fathers, well, since they participated in colonizing, 
then who's your father? They said we were brought in at our time just like you and yours. In other words, we have colonized the planet in our system and have made our own evolutionary way and now we have reached such a level that we are already a member of the Council, the Intergalactic Council, which includes almost all highly developed civilizations and which oversees all processes taking place on the planets, not only in the solar system, but in all galaxies in space. And they also told me that there are tremendous species in space, a tremendous number of types of civilizations, and not all forms of existence would be understandable to us if they showed them to us now. And I was shown a planet in our solar system where I saw, let's say, a completely lifeless surface, according to our concepts, with such wandering, let's say, such semi-luminous flickering spheres, they say this is also a form of the existence of consciousness. So later, much later, they explained to me that there are laws, laws of the cosmos. And one of the main laws says, non-interference at any level. That is, they have no right to correct whatever a human has done. And they adhere to this principle so strictly that much later, when it became necessary, to, let's say, to correct some defects in our ecology, I asked them, well, why? Looks like with your technology it's not hard to help. They say, we have no right to disrupt the natural course of your civilization development and the things you do. You are the masters of the situation. We are observers only, and you are the masters. So we should develop on our own. They have a right to carry out, as it were, an indirect correction, that is, through the consciousness of people, show the paths of our development. You have the right to move along this path, although it is erroneous. You have the right to move along the other path, although it is erroneous. But the shortest path is this one. You have the right to move along this path. You choose, you see? It is very simple for them, because they explained to me that there was an energy cocoon technique to travel long distances, that's what they said. In other words, a person is able to control his energy flows, natural flows, surround himself with an energy cocoon, and move in a dense body in seconds to any point on the planet. And they say that we are literally programming, we need to materialize at a certain location. Well, materialize is my word. They said just move. And so they do it. It looks beautiful and a little strange, because a person stands completely still for just a few seconds. A halo appears around this person. If a person is about 1 meter 80, 5 feet 9 inches, then approximately a 2 meter 6 feet 5 inches halo appears. A dimly glowing ball appears, then it starts to kindle, and it passes all colors of heated metal. And when it flares up to, let's say, like electric welding, just like electric welding, this ball shrinks and disappears. This is what happens, an instant, and it disappears. As it was later shown to me, a process of moving one individual from one point to another point with a flight around the Earth. So a person got turned into this ball, the ball glowed so brightly that a person could not be seen, he shrank and disappeared, and then immediately reappeared. He flew around, flew around the globe, and appeared at this point in space. It's not an obstacle for them, and they say that in such a cocoon you can move, say, not only from one point of the planet to another, but also in outer space. They travel between their two planets in exactly the same way, without any protective means, because there is no need for them. Uh, it's an amazing technology, right? But uh, we just understand that uh, such a technology could be possible, access, uh, accessible only in the creative society without uh, in the society without any commerce or uh, just uh, an ego. And what's interesting, what we've heard today and uh, uh, about uh, the circles, uh, field circles, right? Uh, or about kind of as Korshinov has just said about kind of ball which was like a portal for traveling for instant travel and uh, I, w I was also amazed by the uh, just this technologies uh, you can see an artifact right now um, we just uh, who is um, kind of um, traveling uh, in space or in, in kind of of uh, uh, and uh, so actually but we can assume that uh, just this, the same technology as Viktor Korshinov has just uh, described us. Also, in all the artifact, we can you can see a kind of um, fireball or plasma ball, and we still have a few artifacts. Please have a look at them. 
and right you can see a ball or and uh, a person inside it and the last artifacts here and right now let us watch an interview with an eyewitness from the u.s who also observed a similar phenomenon ran up against a tree and stopped myself and I'm panting and I'm hearing the dog is coming straight at me very close so I turned to look back to see if Christopher had pulled loose and it was running up behind me that's what I was thinking and when I look back I, I got my hands this way and when I look back I froze I said oh my god and I turned real slow and put my back against the tree and I looked straight at this little tiny it looked like a, a child, a three-and-a-half or four-year-old child. It was glowing light, the color of the moon, that very soft glove. has a triangle in its, underneath its glove. I'm on the back left corner of the house, and the floodlights on all four corners were on. And I saw this taller entity, very tall, seven-foot, walking straight towards the corner of the house, looking straight at me, and it was so quick. There's another prime example. It's a white orb. It was a ball of light. And in that ball of light, there are people or beings in them, dogs included. There's several in that one. And when we came back up to the top of the hill, there was the same two red objects that were originally there were still there. But this third one is now on the ground between us and the highway. And it's white now. It's shaped like an egg laying on its side. And it has this light revolving that was instead of orange fire, it was white. And it was sparkling as it went around it. It was this magnificent looking thing like this. Uh, actually, there's two photos together there. The one above is of a UFO that has several like that, quite a few. And the other is a ball of light that appeared about 15 feet away, 10 feet away. And when I took the picture, uh, it shows uh, something looking back at me. And there, if you look in the top of it, you see a face. I can see the white dot. If you look, there's a white dot. Mm -hmm. I can see it with my eyes from 40 yards away coming straight at me. So I pulled my camera out and I took a picture and the orb above the white dot was connected. So wherever it went, it was and you can see the face in the top thank you so much yes thank you so much Christopher we have another interview with Peter from the Netherlands who had a similar experience let's watch During that this period, I also noticed uh, uh, light balls. You know, light balls. Not not small ones, but but big ones, big ones. Okay. And it was it was beside me, out of nowhere, beside me, and 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 above me. And when I was uh, driving, the the lights from the street went out ball a ball fly with me and i know my my girlfriend was uh, 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 afraid but me was was like well for me it's normal but because me had many many uh, i have seen it before uh, i i want to say uh, one one of the the light balls light balls I was uh, uh, walking on the street because I had no phone at home, so I need to, to phone somebody outside. And uh, one light bulb go uh, above me, and it's like 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 go go inside inside me. Yes, inside me, and it it it, it felt it felt like a huge huge energy energy. 
really like like uh, love, love, like light, love. It go inside me, and it it seems like forever, but then it go. Coming back to our Krishna's experience and contacts, uh, so um, he also asked the question that, uh, well, if uh, highly developed alien beings uh, can move by creating such a plasma sphere around the body over great distances and, well, practically without wasting time, so uh, why do they need ships? So to which he was told that the ship is a kind of a protective shell from any strict cosmic emissions. At the same time, a ship was kind of the accumulator of human energy because a person being recharged inside uh, this flying ship and at the same time they use them as flying machines. Of course, it's really exciting information and also he was given information that um, this ship, they fly on the inner energy of a person and he was said that uh, it is enough for three or four people on the ship to concentrate their energy and direct it into uh, the sockets of special receiving device and the ship starts moving due to human energy. And Japanese scientists uh, have actually conducted a very interesting experiment. So they managed uh, the energy of a dying woman. She was over 18 years old and uh, it was la uh, recorded that, let's say, with the last exhalation, she gave up energy equal to the power of nuclear power station. So uh, that means that you and me, we are just amazing energy sources. Yes, Olga, this is very interesting, especially if you compare this information with today's video of expertise that we have seen, everything that we know about the uh, alien uh, spacecraft and and you know, comparing to the information that we raised during the previous kaleidoscope of facts, it is very interesting and everything comes back into its places. And also what I would like to add that during one of the contacts, Korshinov had the opportunity to examine their ship, uh, the Ellen ship, and it was very interesting for him since he is an engineer by profession. He noted that the ship in, in a column state was not on supports but simply hung in the air near the ground at the distance of about two meters. It was made from the uh, cast piece of silver matter, metal uh, more than 10 meters in diameter. Uh, there were no welds or rivets on it. Uh, the metal was absolutely flat. Korshinov was interested in how they got into the ship, since there were no stairs near him or other devices. At the same moment, a demonstration screen appeared in front of him in the air. This technology appeared uh, at any moment in the air when there was a need to clearly explain something to him. On it, there was a visual sketch of how a person stands under the ship and something like an elevator pulls him inside. On the same screen, uh, he was shown the process of flying from the um, uh, grassy cle uh, clearing in which they were and to their galaxy. And the entire flight demonstration uh, process lasted about five seconds. In an instant, the ship went into action, went up, turned into a point and disappeared. Then Korshnov saw another picture on the screen how the uh, thinnest vertical line of light was formed, which uh, coiled into a spiral. Uh, the spiral compressed into a point, a point flashed, and then the ship landed from above, from a point increasing in size. Uh, as Korshnov was uh, later explained, the flight demonstration was slowed down so that he could at least somehow perceive it. Uh, and in, it took five, not five seconds, in reality it was just a moment. And this uh, uh, just illustrates what uh, Jana was talking about in TikTok about the ships of Anunnaki. How does the movement occur in the azosmic level? 
By the way, I really recommend uh, to um, actually read the uh, primordial electrophysics and to get the detailed information about the azosmic grid from that book. You will be surprised that um, this information about that was known in ancient times and confirmed by the artifacts. Uh, let's uh, move on. Let's uh, watch another excerpt from the interview. And as I was told by a highly developed civilization, and today we are busy looking for planets livable for the existence of a protein civilization as one of the most rare in space for colonization, for development. So this process is underway. Are the nearest planets far from here? How can I say? What does far mean? Yes, all is to be relative. If I said that 17 million light years could be covered in two seconds, then it seemed to be very close. For us, of course, we shout loudly that we are exploring outer space, that we are already flying in space, but we are not flying. We are still crawling on all fours. We have not yet entered outer space, because those civilizations, they use such technologies that allow them to cover such distances that, honestly speaking, are still very, very inaccessible to us, Earthlings. Right, you know, when I was uh, just calculating the speed of uh, the ship, you know, from the video uh, with Jana, uh, so uh, it was really, speed was extremely high. And actually, Kushner really conveyed a lot of information that the highly developed alien beings gave him uh, about technology or about, you know, everyday life. And Kushner was, uh, well, um, visited uh, the planet several times. And, for example, he said uh, that such a fact that their houses were at a fairly large distance from each other and they uh, did not have any corners, they were round in shape. Yes, I would really be glad to get an opportunity to visit their planet as well. And also, you were talking about the round shape, and I'll, I recall that um, truly throughout the Earth, all over the Earth, we find round buildings in ancient cultures, uh, in Tripoli, or again, returning to Dogons, um, about whom we know that the knowledge of the structure of the universe not only was passed on, by the representatives of civilization from Sirius. So we can assume that somewhere in the space in their home planet, houses look exactly like this, round and without corners. Uh, and if we come back to the TikTok um, Jana spaceship, we will see that the illuminator is also made with the round um, corners. And, of course, we still have so much to uh, discover, to understand what kind of energetical processes lie inside this geometry. So this is what we will have to learn and figure out. And also a very interesting fact is that he noted that the life expectancy in comparison to the earth, earthly standards is simply enormous. Uh, but it was difficult to do determine the age by their appearance. Uh, just their eyes changed slightly and the body always looked beautiful. And uh, we uh, just are often presented uh, with the image of um, aliens as the greys, as uh, the, just the cult um, epixians, and as Karshan noted, people aliens, they uh, look just like us, people aliens, right? And even better, uh, they look even better. But that is included this information, right? So we can understand that the greys, they are not people aliens. Uh, they are civilized creatures. And uh, uh, Korshina also noted that um, these gray creatures, they are hostile to our civilization. We're going to talk about this topic in more detail, but later. And the only thing that Korshina repeatedly emphasized is that uh, he said that while we are under the protection of a highly developed civilization with which uh, he had contact, so we have nothing to worry about racist hostile to humans. Because again, we are under the protection 
protection of highly developed civilization. Also, uh, today we have heard uh, in fragments uh, with Viktor Korshinov that people often confuse higher developed alien beings with gods, uh, since throughout history they followed us, um, they flee in or flew away, but they're not gods. Uh, they're just kind of um, a link between uh, our civilization and those entities, uh, creatures uh, that uh, rule um, over uh, just planetary systems, uh, they control the energy of planetary systems. And um, or oh, this, this just actually they call kind of the highest cosmic intelligence, right? That exercises control of all system space. Peter Korshner also told that their civilization is of the fifth type, and it is really very exciting to find out because if we combine it or compare this with information that was revealed to us in the video with Igor Mikhail Danilov, um, Creative Society Prospects of Civilization, where it was described in detail by all the levels of development of civilizations and uh, the name even of the race with which uh, well caution contacted well it doesn't well um so we we can just uh, understand that he meant the Anunnaki's assistance right no. Yes, indeed. Much of the information that um, Korshinov was given is very interesting for the research. And in continuation of this topic, let's watch a video with Jaime Rodriguez, uh, the apologist from Ecuador. Understanding that there is extraterrestrial life that we are not alone in the universe is the greatest truth I have discovered in my life. And for me, it was just a revolution in my mind. Then I wondered, if these beings have technologies far superior to ours, they should also have higher knowledge. And of course, they do. Because while we are at the primary level of consciousness, they are at other levels, say, the third, fourth, fifth grade of school. Who knows? That is, they have already gone through what we are just experiencing, and this would allow them to give us some kind of advice, higher knowledge, so that evolution doesn't stagnate. And that's the way it really was. And so it was. If we look at the history books, we can see the interaction of these creatures all over the planet. I would like to refer to information that was transmitted by an alien being who visited the Ecuadorian embassy in Lima, Peru, and interacted with diplomats for six months. This alien being explained to diplomats that space functions as a kind of school, college and university, something like that. At school, we find classrooms, places where students study. These classes are planets, billions of inhabited planets. But there is a big difference between the beings who inhabit this planet and the beings who live on a different level of consciousness. Because the difference between classes on Earth is in the level of knowledge that a person has. In space, this is not a level of knowledge, it is a level of consciousness. Thus, what distinguishes us, humans, from them is precisely the level of consciousness that we operate. All beings who are in these classes must consciously develop by their own achievements, raise the level of consciousness individually. When someone reaches an increased level of consciousness, he goes to another level of consciousness, that is, he goes to another school, that is, excuse me, to another class in the same school. 
because school is space, and class is another planet with different matter to study. Therefore, there are planets where, for example, there is no money, where, that is, they have other matters. Thank you so much for sharing. This makes sense. The next video we will watch is about Apexians, who actually are called reptilians. We will learn what they are all about and why we need to understand their true nature and intentions. I know many of you are so excited about this topic. We see many misconceptions when people are confused about reptilians and Anunnaki. Let's set it straight once and for all. Well, again, why did they call the Anunnaki reptilians? Well, you know, the presence of some genetic abnormalities, right? Or some advantages, or vice versa, flaws, is not a reason to call them reptilians. And again, many are bothered with Jana's blinking. Excuse me, nine out of ten cameras do not record or see it. And people are sitting and they don't see it. Is this a reptilian? It's a most ordinary human being. Does any of us can be called after all, we are Darwinists, we are materialists. Are we not reptilians? Take a look at how an embryo develops. Don't we go through the reptilian stage? A reptilian brain. So, which one of us is a reptilian? Let's better call them the Anunnaki. Because for me, the reptilians are precisely those who are called the Apexians. The Apexians. And in this case, yes, it's a reptiloid form. It is soulless. Well, with high intelligence, they have a unified primary consciousness. It is huge and powerfully developed. Much more than ours, of earthlings, unfortunately, by many times. That one is a reptilian, because it only devours, it has nothing humane. Whereas a higher soul-filled race that has achieved tremendous results, and we call them reptilians, it's us who are actually reptilians in comparison to them. Sorry, but this is true. Even talking about resources, if we return to this question, it's just that we encountered several points of view when some people say, perhaps we, Earthlings, are just of no interest to aliens because what to take from us? What resources do we have? We have depleted the planet ourselves, while others are afraid that they may be conquered, enslaved or exploited in some way. And such is people's attitude to everyone, to the whole alien mind. Hold on, wait, but we have already talked about the fact that humanity had a bitter experience when the civilization was under the oppression of those very Apexians, they were not under protection, it was a young civilization and so on. And in reality, how long was humankind under the Apexians, right? Did they extract much here? Yes, but basically, much more important and necessary for them were not those mineral resources. Again, however, let's go back to mineral resources. There are deposits of gold. There are actually such huge ones called nuggets, but this is like slag. I mean, gold was thrown away. They extracted a completely different thing. That is, what we value, in fact. What we value has no value for them at all. But we now find their deposits and the like. If we face the truth, then gold is just a slag and garbage mm -hmm. from what they needed. But the most valuable thing for them was another resource, mm -hmm. the one that even a child fights for. I will give a simple example. We have started, but haven't finished. It is our attention. Mm -hmm. And our attention is what? It's just a very small part of the energy that the whole world is fighting for. Why? Because we are also the source of this energy. Why? Because we are not only spiritualized, but also soul-filled. What is the value of human races? 
precisely the fact that we are the carriers of the purest and most powerful energy in the world, the energy from which everything is created. Our entire universe, in all its 72 dimensions, and a human is exactly a carrier of this purest energy. Well, this very energy is interesting. Hello, yes, let's talk about this a little bit more. There is a big misconception between, and uh, a lot of people say that the Anunnaki are the reptilians, but this is not so. And let's talk about this a little bit more because this is a very, very important fact. And let's say that tw we know that 24,000 years ago, people were slaves to the Apexians or the reptilians. Yes, humans were nothing but food and they were made to work like animals on the quarries. And this information in, is presented in more detail at the previous kaleidoscope of facts on paleocontact. It may seem unfair that humans were enslaved by animals with a high level of intelligence, but this is true. Apexians, like all animals, exist according to instinctive programs, where the strong dominates over the weak. They perform the functions of orderlies of the forest, like insatiable, hungry wolves. They attack the weak and the dying. And people must develop, and in this case, the Apexians will not be a threat for us. And this is very important. And now the main reason why the Apexians are so interested in humans is because humans have this inner energy, which is coming from the soul. This inner energy is called a lot. A lot is the basis of all matter. And the entire material world is based on this spiritual force. This power is also called the power of our attention. It is impossible to artificially create it, and it is the most pure form of energy. We know that a person is a spiritual being, and from birth is endowed with a soul, from which a lot emanates. With the help of this inner energy, you can transform matter. But the most important thing for a person is the ability to become a fully-fledged spiritual being, using the a lot powers for spiritual growth. And also, a lot lies at the basis of everything. It is the most valuable thing in this world. But since we do not understand what it is, we do not value it. Yet a person has a lot of this priceless inner energy. And more on the a lot energy, inner energy, you can find in uh, books by Anastasia Nova or videos with participation of Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Now, let's come back to the Apexians. They have a collective consciousness. It is huge and powerfully developed, much more than ours, by many times. But even though they have advanced technologies, they're soulless and hunt for people's attention. Apexians remain animals, dangerous and aggressive. They drain the inner energy of the person by stimulating emotions such as fear, aggression, hopelessness, etc. Um, here we understand why over 24,000 years ago, people were made to work on the quarries and put in dangerous situations in order to stimulate more emotions. Um, now, Anunnaki have been protecting the earth from the dominance of Apexians over people for the last 24,000 years. But they do not interfere in the lives of people on the planet, respecting the freedom of choice. And this is very important. Now, we are not saying that Apexians or other creatures cannot visit the earth as there are no borders. And some people have actually seen them. What we are saying is that they cannot dominate over the human race. And besides Apexians, or as we said, another name for them is Greys or the Reptilians, there is a lot of other creatures in space, and some of which have souls, and some are soulless. And you can kind of see the picture on the screen right now. 
again, if human, if humanity chooses the spiritual path of development, then there is nothing to be afraid of. Very important is not to confuse the Anunnaki and the reptilians. They're not the same. Anunnaki serve God and protect us from the reptilians. And reptilians are soulless creatures who only need us for our inner energy. And while the Anunnaki are with us, humanity is safe. Thank you. Now we are in the third and final block of our conference. Thank you for tuning in, commenting, and sharing. Stay tuned, and we will have prophecies from Jana coming up. We appreciate everyone's participation, and we are now ready to hear from eyewitnesses that have been in contact with extraterrestrial beings or did an extensive research about the topic. Let's hear from Mary Rodwell. She is a researcher and writer in the UFO and contacts phenomenon areas. Mary will tell us more about her research. Over three and a half thousand families and children I've worked with globally who have shown me that this is absolutely a global phenomenon, even if the person who's having it doesn't always understand what it is they're experiencing and may see it in a negative context or they may see it through a religious lens or, you know, um, so they'll have a different interpretation. So that got me to where I am now with exploring this and working with people with their experiences. In terms of initially, it appeared to be that most were traumatized. What I discovered was the more they understood of their experience, the less fearful they were. Um, it was like um, a wake up call for them, especially if they didn't believe in aliens <laughs> and suddenly they're seeing them. It's like, am I going crazy? So they would be scared of being crazy. They would be scared of what might have happened even if they didn't know what happened they would be scared of the whole phenomena of is this going to happen to the rest of my family or my children so the fear can change once they understand it and what we discovered with the organization that i was a co-founder of and that's the dr edgar mitchell free foundation when we did the surveys of 4200 people globally we discovered that 85% ultimately saw this as a psycho-spiritual transformation. Only 15% were fearful um, always and saw it as bad. So it seems like after the wake-up call and the more that they come to terms with it, the more they realize that many of their interactions have been extremely positive. In fact, 50% of that 4,200 had healing procedures on board craft. So we know that that was an, also a very positive aspect of this, really waking us up as a humanity. It's saying, you know, it's time you woke up, guys. You know, we've been visiting you all through history. You know, you saw us as gods, but we're not really gods. Uh, we just had better technology than you. Um, and they're saying it's time for you to wake up. Thank you so much, Mary. Now we are moving to everyone's favorite question. When will the contact between Anunnaki and us, Earthlings, take place? Let's hear it from Jana herself straight from Alien Soul 28 TikTok account. Jana, could you please tell us, will we have unlucky close encounter during 2021? What year did it stop? 
Çıkıyor yıldızlara müptezel bayan Parmanı Baba nerede çarçaflığım Gördüğüm bu paketler benim dermanı Hoppa yavaşça açıldı tak Well Definitely the most burning questions are when will the official contact take place? Why do the mass media outlets keep silence about Anunnaki? Well, we found responses to many of our questions by going through the comments under the videos on TikTok from account AlienSoul28. And here's what we found regarding mass media. And I quote, I think if you have a look at who owns the media and listen to what they talk in the programs about, everything will fall into place. It is disadvantageous to show them on television because as soon as all people learn about the Anunnaki and the prospects that await humanity, the world will become wonderful with great technological capabilities and power will belong to people. This is not beneficial to the ch TV channels then they will not be able to keep people in constant fear. And as to when the, we can expect to have a contact, again I quote, contact with the Anunnaki has always been there and a lot of evidence of this has not been erased by those who benefit from people knowing about them. This is because if people take as an example the structure of society like that of the Anunnaki, and also begin to possess the same technologies, the concept of a hierarchy of power, poverty, wars, and any inequality will disappear all over the world. But since the situation is extremely acute now, as you yourself can see, the Anunnaki are forced to come into open contact with humans." End quote. Well, as you can see, the contact has never stopped from ancient times as shown by numerous artifacts and legends to our days using social media platforms. Don't you find this amazing that today anyone can ask Ranna a question just by leaving a comment? And many of us already did. Coming back to the official context, the answer is clear and simple. I quote, in order for the official contact between the most developed highly spiritual human race of the Anunnaki and people of Earth to occur, we have to grow up, stop killing each other, stop behaving as animals, unite and build a creative society. Now the world is dominated by anger, greed, the power of a few persons over the masses of people, selfishness, consumerism and much more, which in the eyes of highly developed civilizations looks something like primates. But people have a huge prospect and the opportunity to fundamentally change everything in a very short time in order to live with dignity as befits real humanity and to meet the other ones with pride for such a wonderful world. But are we really ready to welcome anyone to our planet? And why do we expect the Anunnaki, whose name was tarnished for thousands of years and still is, who are being blamed for all our misfortunes, to come here and provide help with our climate problems and bring advanced technology. Well, at our level of development, trying to comprehend which technologies they have is like showing what we have today to someone living 3000 years ago times 1000. And can you imagine what will happen if we get hold of advanced technologies while still continuing to behave as we do today? Will we use this technology to cure diseases, to help each other, to make our lives better? Or continue falling into the same pit? it looks a lot like us. And as said in one of the comments, giving highly advanced technologies to people of Earth is like giving a hand grenade to a monkey. This will not end well. And people must evolve in order to perceive what they are told and to correctly use the technologies that they may have in the future. 
Therefore, you need to put things in order, in little, in the first place, in the heads. Worthy means with peace and understanding, at least without aggression. This is what Janna uh, said on TikTok. And yet, the Anunnaki still believe in us. And as we can read, I guess it requires an immense amount of love for humanity to still come here and offer help, asking for just one thing, unity of all mankind. They will come when people are ready to accept them. That's the point. Look out of the window and you will understand the Anunnaki love earthlings and wait when they will come to their senses. While we are waiting for the official contact to happen, everything depends on us and the choices we make. The Anunnaki protect millions of planets, like our one today. But in this world, I mean in our universe, there are in fact billions and billions of planets on which the same people as we live, who are less or more advanced with their genetic, let's put it so, disadvantages or on the contrary advantages. Someone blinks in the wrong way, provoking in us something we don't want. Someone, pardon me, has longer ears. Someone has a shorter nose. But we are all united by one factor, the presence of soul. And since there is a soul, it means that there is also a personality. Meaning, regardless of the different bodies we have, or regardless of the bodily abilities we possess in this world, we all have one common thing, which ultimately makes us the same, if we gain it, and it's life. Angels, they are all the same. They are free. So, I have a simple question, I will return to it. How did people find out that even a small fraction of people who publicly declare that they are annulling a treaty with the Anunnaki would be enough, and the Anunnaki would be forced to leave this planet. That is the law. But the point is, as soon as the Anunnaki leave this planet, here they will come. The Apexians. Absolutely right, these evil creatures. Mm -hmm. So, guys, let's figure out what kind of image of Anunnaki is being formed. And we all understand that the books and the articles and other things uh, have been have made a huge influence on people. And we need to figure out how how come the image of Anunnaki became negative. One of the of the actually the, the, the starters um, that the founders of this uh, situation was the Kari uh, Sitchin with he, with the works um, with whose works it all began, and let's listen to Matt Lacroix who tells us uh, how true Sitchin transformations were, and uh, right now he will tell us more about how the Sitchin translations were. Remember, Mesopotamian cuneiform tablets are the oldest known form of writing, sophisticated writing that we have in the world. And there are, um, there are basically extensive libraries. Now, the most important library that was ever discovered, which is where this whole story begins, was it begins in 1849. Now, that's important to point out because I'm going to jump a little bit ahead on that date because I want you to remember that date, 1849. Because today... In this perception, if you were to go online and search for the Anunnaki and search for these stories that we're about to go into, you're going to come across a man named Zechariah Sitchin. Now, Zechariah Sitchin was one of these individuals that was, was the first to really write in extensive detail about these tablets. Now, he made a lot of bold claims in his books. I'm sure you've heard of that before. So when I read those, my mind was blown. But I asked myself, is, is this entire thing credible? That's the first thing I asked myself, is, is it credible? 
And so when I had read those, I decided, okay, I'm going to stop here and go back. I'm going to go back and I'm going to research and read these tablets myself because I want to know the story. The story that they tell is so fantastic and so incredible that we're about to lay out that I needed credible evidence myself before I could accept it. And that's why this is so important because some of the information Zechariah Sitchin translated was inaccurate. Some of it, I, I'd say roughly 50%. It, it means that people took the terms that he used and their perception developed rampant online where the term Anunnaki and all of the information associated with that was fake and made up by Zechariah Sitchin. Right. Um, indeed, uh, Zechariah Sitchin, uh, well, he uh, did actually very bad deed. Um, just in connection to Anunnaki, he just uh, substituted their image and distorted it. So actually, Zechariah Sitchin, he was not a scientist. Uh, he was just a writer in love of history. And um, his books began to appear more than 40 years ago, and, and uh, they are still being published today. Uh, just, um, well... Uh, so he just interprets, you know, ancient myth and legends as he wants, and uh, which actually contradicts historical and astronomical data. So there is no scientific foundation behind Sachin's writings, because he's mistaken just in the simplest and most accessible information. He did not even um, make an effort to analyze elementary encyclopedias or just did not look into dictionaries. So, for example, uh, Zechariah Sachin claims that all ancient languages, including early Chinese, they date back to one main source, that is the Sumerian language. But at the same time, it is generally known that, especially to historians and linguists, right, the Sumerian is a so-called an isolated language that does not fall into any of the language families and is not related to any of the known languages. In his books, Sitchin claims that the Sumerians were aliens and he attributes the creation of the Sumerian culture to the Nephilim from the planet Nibiru. He also claims that um, uh, there was kind of paleo contact and that the Anunnaki deliberately descended from the planet Nibiru in order to mine gold on our planet. And uh, they just needed people as cheap labor for their gold mines. And the famous Russian scientist, semiologist Vladimir Emiliano, candidate of historical sciences, doctor of philosophical sciences, uh, believes that uh, Sitchin partially kind of spied, uh, copied his theory in Mirishkovsky's book, The Secret of Three. Um, that written in 1923, in which he wrote that the Sumerians had uh, antediluvian or alien faces and that the Sumerians are like beings from another planet. Um, and Emiliano, he refutes all the main so called Sitchin's discoveries, including uh, the word Nephilim is not found actually in the Sumerian cuneiform writings. Mm, therefore, it has nothing to do with the Sumerians. Well, it's uh, first of all. Secondly, gold in Mesopotamia, that is, on the lands of the Sumerians, Akkadians, and Babylonians, was not used at all as a monetary equivalent until the middle of the second millennium. So there was no particular point in extracting it for any purpose. So, um, so there is uh, no connection, right, to the um, gold miners, or uh, it was not just, uh, it had no sense as it has for us today. So here is an interesting detail. Sitchin believed that uh, the main purpose of the visit of the Anunnaki uh, or from Nibiru, he was to extract gold, which they badly kind of needed to create um, just pro just protective shield, uh, just uh, to support their planet. So they wanted kind of to create this golden shield, uh, which would um, uh, just um, well uh, prevent the loss of atmosphere and hypothermia. So this all this assumption is absurd. 
good because um, a highly developed civilization, right? Uh, well, it's likely unlikely to fly sp just specifically to Earth to extract metal, uh, which is freely actually available in space because all the scientists know about this fact that. Um, there is metal, there are lots of metal in space, in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, for example. There is metal asteroid, six, so called 16 Psyche, which contains precious metals, gold, iron, and uh, according to the calculations of scientists, uh, well, uh, there is, you know, uh, there, there is so much metal uh, that is, we could count up to 700 quintillion dollars. And even if Anunnaki, well, let us just suppose I uh, wanted to mine gold on Earth and uh, uh, what? Uh, do you believe that a highly developed civilization itself is not able to mine gold in a high-tech way? They need to uh, just mine, so I hope you know that it's really hard labor to mine gold so wh why not just uh, just create this goal because I don't know I can know this technology and secondly, engineering calculations show, show that to create a continuous sphere of the smallest particles of gold, for example, a few nanometers thick of our planet, for example, the size of our Earth, so only 4,900 kilograms of um, gold are needed. So do you believe that uh, this is uh, the purpose to fly? Uh, it, does it make sense to fly to Earth and uh, over thousands of light years and mine that gold. Um, so, in this case of gold, right, it's clear that um, we have a negative image of Anunnaki. So, um, well, according to these false theories, Anunnaki, they allegedly forced people to work in gold mining, and secondly, they took away our wealth, that is gold. So, indeed, for several thousand years, we have been told that gold is the height of desires, this kind of way to happy life, and so, um, and the one who has gold, right, or who, who takes uh, gold from us, well, then it is a thief and scoundrel. Um, so there, uh, and so a negative image uh, is created. But at the same time, uh, all the scientists and experts know that uh, there is nothing particularly valuable in gold as a metal, right? Um, uh, just gold is easily processed and melts at low temperatures. Yeah, it does not have corrosion for a long time. It is really convenient to use gold for various decorative elements, but nothing special about gold. And um, by the way, yeah, just uh, if we talk about just uh, making a negative uh, image, we would say such a moment, such a point that from the books of Sitchin, right? Um, uh, so uh, the planet Nibiru approaching the Earth, um, well, it's, it was sad, provokes climatic catastrophes on our planet. So this is where the question arises, should, well, exploring all sorts of alternative theories and historical provocations. Uh, so, um, it's kind of, you know, we have to agree with uh, Vladimir Emiliano, because um, Sitchin's books really paid fantasy project. And here a question arises, who benefits from the theories, uh, which only confuse, make people uh, just perplexed and lead away from true knowledge. Then when, for what purpose, the negative image of the Anunnaki created and uh, just doubled, replicated with the help of the mass media? Who benefits from that and for what? Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sveta. And truly, we will find out about this uh, a bit later. And right now, I would like to ask a question to Rodrigo. Uh, Rodrigo is a person who professionally engaged in ufology at the state level. And my question is, please tell us whether we can trust the information that is being distributed today on the topic of extraterrestrial contacts. I think this is the wonderful question. 
Because the thing is, in all those cases, when we are trying to mention and to look at the facts, and if we're looking at the information that we, we were receiving, essentially, we are able to finally observe what is the distribution of information, because there, there is an idea in itself, um, and there is an understanding both in mass media and the culture and the science fiction and so on that um, what we have in our hands and the information that we have in our hands tells us that this is the higher level of the consciousness or uh, mind that comes to our planet and many movies are created with the specific goal and objective to cause attention, to draw attention to this topic. But you also have to understand that Hollywood in itself has created so many films and movies and everything but uh, on this topic but their interest not to present or teach us or to inform and to educate us but just to have a commercial interest because the topic is hot and interesting and in this specific person the pe reason that people have to ask themselves like by having so much information like where do they have this information is this the truth what they're trying to convey in us and so that do we have to point we trust them or do we have to check the data that we are being proposed to just what we take because there are so many things that we are receiving it essentially and um, profound we are not completely true or being completely made up and most of things can be easily checked up so the um, in-depth data there are data on the contact of people human beings with the aliens so it can all be studied essentially and we, we can also mention here that the experience of the people that are describing their contacts. They are mostly describing a positive experience that those people have. And um, on the contrary of what we see in the movies where it's mostly negative. And the, the people are saying that those are the beings that um, are much more friendly than what we see in the movies and the mass media and social media and everywhere else. Because this is such an interesting phenomenon that we have to study to understand before we do grasp the information and not to trust blindly what we are presenting in the mass media. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. So, we understood that everything starts with the information that surrounds us and right now we'd like to refer to the uh, classical literature. In general, public opinion in the literature no. Hmm. I don't know what's happening. Uh, so there is some kind of technical issue. Pardon? We can, no. listen. We can hear you. Everything is good. Can, hear you. It's fine. can you hear me, guys? Yes, we do. Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Se había ido el sonido. ¿Cuál fue la pregunta? Could you repeat the question if you had one? Because there was something with the connection. Yeah, so you just answered the question, and uh, the question was how, we, uh, how much we can trust the information that surrounds us. Ah, sí. Ah, no correction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the answer and for the detailed answer, what's more important. Yeah, so uh, I'll return. So as we understand that all starts from the information that surrounds us and um, I was interested by the science fiction and uh, in general public opinion about the uh, aliens uh, and extraterrestrial beings so started uh, from the novel by Wells called The First Man in the Moon and then with the Roswell incident described in several novels. But another thing interesting is that from 2008-2010 a huge number of different books about the Anunnaki began to appear. Many authors take Sitchin's theory as the basis and add something their own uh, while others write completely opposite information. But the key similarity between them is a negative attitude towards the Anunnaki. Uh, 
Another uh, noteworthy biography of authors um, who raise the topics in their books. Many of them are well-known personalities in the field of literature, know several languages, are international speakers in television and radio, and often the books become bestsellers. And I decided to analyze such literature, and I made the following conclusion about the image about of, of the Anunnaki and their mission on Earth. Anunnaki and their mission, Anunnaki actually in the books are very highly developed race. They have technologies that humans have never dreamed of. In addition to technology, they have psychic abilities. They have deep knowledge in the field of genetics and science. They have incredibly long life expectancy. The next thing um, that catches your eye is a story about gold, repeated from author to author. The story that Sveta told us um, was slightly changes but the general meaning is the same in all of the books Anunnaki want to make people their slaves or they created people initially as slaves and whom they can do all sorts of experiments and exploit them in any direction and an interesting point is that re the return to earth does not bode well for people and as we can see throughout science fiction literature the Anunnaki's image is being formed as the image of an enemy although the Anunnaki aren't uh, really an enemy, but still this image is the first one that appears in the head of a person who just read such books. And the question appears, I will repeat, repeat it, who benefits from this particular information and formation of the image of the Anunnaki? And it is interesting that films TV series cartoons are being made based on such novels and what is happening in those um, materials, Maria will tell us more. Yes, thank you so much, Olga. It was really interesting information. And all this information, TV shows, movies, cartoons, all this are actively forming mass opinion. Studying the materials on this topic, I understood that, yes, the topic of aliens and alien races have always been presented in the cinema, but since 2008 there have been a direct information boom and every year it's growing more and more. Based on the previously outlined information, we began to analyze movies, TV shows, and it turned out that the image of Apexians is very often presented as ex extremely po positive or neutral. I will draw several examples because there are so much of them. One of the first who began to show grace in the cinema is the film director Steven Spielberg. This is the film of 1978, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, in which the role of brothers of mind was assigned to the Apexians. They appeared on the screen only for a moment. Here you can see this image. But that was enough for people to remember this image. Also, the really popular movie was AT, the extraterrestrial, uh, from 1982. We see right now the images of this movie. He won many sympathies from people. Even I remember it very clearly. I also wanted to have such a friend. The film had a very high box office, and it left an incredible mark on the memory of people that gray reptiloid alien creature is a friend. You, we clearly see that it's a reptiloid. The film won four Oscars and many other awards. How many generations of people have grown up with sympathy for this creature? And remember who Apexians are. The race of grey is also present in the series Babylon 5, as Vrii. They also have the standard canonical appearance of the Apexians. Apexians also appear in the movie Indiana Jones. We see right now the image. So we see that this image 
image has been used more often. Also, in the cult series Stargate, there is also a race of Apexians, where is um, a highly developed race as Asgard, one of the most advanced modern alien civilization. The As Asgardians are kind to Earthlings and sometimes share their advanced technologies with people. Right now we see the and these images from the movie. But we understand that it is are the same Apexians, reptiloids. And reading the comments under the episodes where they appear, I noticed that almost all people spoke very positively about these characters, regretting as planned by the scriptwriters. I would read some comments. Yes, they were really good people. It's a pity that they died. They were almost the most developed. Cool creatures. Cool race. They can be called the elder brothers of the Earth who are the, at the most difficult moments will help us with anyone they can. This is my favorite race, the coolest race, and they have a humor. I love this little, little gray man, the most normal guys in the entire Star Stargate universe. I'm reading out these comments to make it clear how much cinema and TV series influence mass opinion. Not so long ago, some a film was released where the image of Apexians again was presented as positive. And we see how this image was imposed uh, by different means as, uh, in books and movies. So another movie is a, called Paul with the better graphic and graphics. So we wouldn't show more images because it's not really pleasant to watch. This is a comedy film where the Apexian again shown this to people as a uh, good friend and one of us. The slogan of the film is who's up for a close encounter. And it will be okay if we wouldn't know the truth. Cinema and literature have always been a very effective way to change the worldview of people through images and exciting stories. It is easy to manipulate a person's consciousness and pressing certain points. For example, in the films and TV stories, Apexians are shown as those who hunted, those who should be helped, rescued, and a person involuntarily begins to sympathize, even if it uh, looks repulsive. That is, we sympathize, and we like those who kept us in slavery 24,000 years ago, and we were a source of energy and food supplement for them. What a crazy substitution! All these movies are someone's fiction, and they are not based on the real facts. The facts say otherwise, the Apexians are not friendly for humanity, and those who always have been helping for humanity, the Anunnaki. Why was all this done? So we accept the Apexians in our minds beforehand, simultaneously with the positive image of the Apexians. As Grayman, the sci-fi television series V is being released in 2008. This is the sequel of the series of the 1983 and 1984. You see right now this, the image. And uh, what is interesting, they impose on us that the great green reptilians look looking creatures are good guys, are friends but beautiful people, like right now you have seen on the screen, this is embodiment of evil and only closed in a human veil. I will briefly talk about uh, this uh, TV show because there are several substitutions which is important to disclosure. An alien race has arrived on Earth visitors, their ships, hoard over the 20 largest cities in the world. The representatives of this race were the Queen of Visitors, Anna, beautiful, charming woman. 
Most Earthlings believe that the visitors arrived on time when people needed their help, and people are happily accepted. Visitors pretend they help humanity, but in fact they pursue their own goals, survival at any cost, with anthropomorphical appearance, enclosed in the skin, they are blooded, bloodthirsty, tailed reptilians, and expect to gradually take over the Earth and destroy humanity. As a result, it is discovered that visitors have long been embedded in the special services, religious structures, and with the help of their technologies such as blue energy, free energy, medical technologies, they are gaining people's trust. A small group of people begins to resist them secretly. I will now tell you what was alarming, really alarming. During all this, during this TV show, it often talks about the soul, but the essence is being completely distorted. It is believed that the soul is the ability to experience emotions, from fear and anger to love, but are the qualities of the soul, the divine particle of the spiritual world, is the ability to experience fear. Furthermore, in the TV shows, the visitors understand that they have no soul, but people do. Then it said the main strength of people lies precisely in the soul. Throughout the whole TV show, experiments are carried out on people in terrible agony in order to reveal the soul and destroy it. But if the visitors begin to experience emotions, they gradually acquire that very soul. The Apexians also carried out terrible experiments on people in order to get the pure energy emanating from the soul. You see these parallels right now? And I would also like to note that according to the scenario, the visitors have an official meeting in Vatican with hierarchies, where the higher clergy are seduced by blue energy, free energy, and visitors receive blessing and support from Vatican, that is, they stupidly being laid on the possibilities of free energy. So, you see Vatican. So, there were so many fans of this TV series, but it wasn't discussed so actively as right now. Exactly in the last few years, that there have been bigger informational pressure on people, this TV uh, series received, as I say, second life. People with fear await aliens with beautiful, attractive appearance, high medical technology and free energy, gra gravity controls. And it was filmed only two seasons, and many fans of the series believe that it was shut down and prohibited. But is it really so? Do you know uh, how this TV show ends? The visitors wins. And it is a very strange way. Anna has the gift of transmitting bliss, peace, and love to representatives of her race, and in the end of the TV series, and to humans as well. And by this, she subjugates most of humanity. There is peace, love, grace. What is uh, the, the best human qualities is being shown as weapon against people. And here is uh, one quote which I will read out. I just remember that really clearly. Visitors armed themselves with the most powerful weapon in the world, love. This is a very serious, dangerous substitution. And I believe that the TV show wasn't prohibited. It was left as a day on purpose, so the people would have this sense of hopelessness. And I would like to note an important fact that in the very beginning of the TV series, a famous journalist asked Anna a question, are there ugly visitors? This is not a just a question, it is a focus 
on which the viewer's attention is focused for some purpose. For what? Not in order to instill in advance the fear of humanoid aliens in the mind of people, good-looking aliens. So in the future, Anunnaki would be associated with this uh, TV shows. And as we know, Anunnaki really good-looking, look beautifully. So we are being opposed to fear. Again, Anunnaki have high technologies, medicine, and free energy. And thanks to such movies, we are being opposed that they are bad. So the visitors were endowed with the qualities of the Apexians, high social organizations, incredibility developed intelligent technology, but absolute heartlessness, roughlessness, and bloodthirdness. The series shows the essence of the Apexians, cold blooded reptilians, soulless animals. And the plan of those, as they say, the power of those who rule this world is the acquisition of technologies of alien race to enslave of humankind, not paying attention to the essence, to the fact that they are cruel animals. At the same thing, at the same time, they impose fear on us from the good looking extraterrestrial beings. Why do image of Anunnaki and the essence of the Apexians being mixed? I will briefly mention also about the film Prometheus, directed by Ridley Scott, known for series of film Alien. In the film of Prometheus, made a parallel between some of the engineers who created the first humans and the Anunnaki. According to the movie, the engineers created people from the DNA, and it seems that Ridley Scott was inspired by those Sitchin who presented the Anunnaki as the embodiment of evil. The fact that, according to the film, the engineers are Anunnakis indicated by Sumerian tablets and bas reliefs was the image of Anunnaki. And there are much more. We see this image right now. Engineers created in this film the embodiment of cosmic evil, which turns people into food for new terrifying forms of life. The film Prometheus and the whole alien universe in general was created in contrast to the fact that in space there are human races that are native to us. There are beautiful worlds, there are those who protect us and love us, and for many years they publish such movies which inspires people with the idea that the omnipotent evil runs the cosmos. Who benefits from creating such a fiction, distorting the truth, when the facts and history speak of something completely different, the fact that the Anunnaki are a human race at a high spiritual and technical level, this is a race which carries only goodness, love and protection, and we can live now, learn and develop through the protection of the Anunnaki. And all the movies and TV series listed earlier, they are beneficial only to 1% who has dreamed to possess alien technologies and, and have absolute power over people, to lock humanity on one planet, preventing it from development, like not to explore near and deep space. Not to only just uh, explore Mars. And you know all these substitutions in literature and in cinema that forms mass opinion are imposed as someone was doing it on purpose, waiting for the moment when time will come for the official meeting of the Anunnaki with people, the Anunnaki who protected us from the invasions for 24,000 years. And this fear is being imposed. And let's face it, without the protection of Anunnaki, we wouldn't have, we would been, have already enslaved and destroyed. If an alien, hostile race, has the ability to get to our planet that it has incredible technical capabilities. And we are absolutely vulnerable to such technologies.
but we are protected by the Anunnaki. So right now we can safely make this broadcast, this online conference, Kaleidoscope of Facts. Misleading information is spreading very fast, like a wildfire, but never by itself. What we know is that for the information to spread fast, we need to put resources and attention to it. So for the truth to be popular and out in the open, we, the people, have to inform each other and spread information among us. We are ready to travel to Vatican now. I would like to yield the floor to our next speaker. Unfortunately, we cannot hear the broadcaster yet. Can you hear me now? Thank you so much. I will start from the beginning. I wanted to say that um, against the background of such a mass worldview, we also see that the rhetoric of the Vatican has changed in relation to the aliens. But first, um, let's start with the story. So in uh, 16,000, Giordano Bruno was uh, found to be heresy and burned at a stake. He becomes the first person in history to be executed for believing in the existence of aliens. First person throughout the history. Although extraterrestrials have always been present in the Christian painting, as we can see at the painting Madonna with Saint uh, Giovan uh, Giovannino, um, also the, the, the other painting, the uh, Crucifixion of Christ, also Olga Prutenko mentioned it when she was talking about the developed civilizations, that uh, people from developed civilizations could create a plasma um, around them and move in the galaxy. And also the next painting, The Miracle of Snow, and on this uh, uh, painting precisely, the, the sky is filled with the UFOs. And if we um, come back to the contemporary world, on August 24, 2006, various sources reported that um, the head of the Vatican's Pontifical Observatory, the Reverend George Coin, has been dismissed. The Daily Mail reports, according to sources close to the Holy See, the Pope is unhappy with the position that Coin has taken in the debate about evolution. Uh, the astronomer has repeatedly uh, defended Darwin's um, evolutionary theory and criticized the idea of intelligent design, which is supported by Benedict the Sixteenth. In November 9, 2009, uh, the Pontifical Academy of Science, Sciences, the scientific department of the Vatican, held a conference with the participation of 30 scientists and the representation of the clergy. The topic of discussion was life on other planets, the possibility and significance for the Church. On May 13, 2014, during the sermon, Pope Francis said that he would welcome aliens, alien life forms into the open arms of the Catholic Church. Also, one of the priests gave an interview saying that maybe the aliens will save us from the coming end of the world. At the same sermon, Jose Gabriel Funes, Funes Director of the Vatican Observatory said in his interview, 
We have a lot of questions, assumptions, plans, and first of all, we are interested in how the aliens will perceive our way of life, our faith, whether we can establish a dialogue. In another interview, he also said, how can you uh, rule out the possibility that life has evolved elsewhere? In the words of St. Francis, if we consider earthly creatures as brothers and sisters, why can't we speak of an extraterrestrial brother? In any case, he would have been a part of creation. So recently, in the newspaper Avenir, uh, which is considered the voice of the Italian Episcopal Conference, an article by the theologian Giuseppe uh, Tonsilianitti was published. Under the heading, Cosmic Salvation is Already Real. No alien Christ is needed. The author notes that the topics related to space deserve attention in our era as they affect the thinking of modern man. I would also like to quote the participants of the TV show, uh, American well-known TV show, This is Supernatural, where a conversation took place between the host, uh, Sid Roth, and his guests, Chris uh, Putnam and Tom Horn. So, I will read it out. Uh, so, Chris Putnam says, the archives of the Vatican were, have been written and collected for centuries. I read it, I read in these articles two chapters about the Vatican's long-standing interest in the issue of aliens. They, they have whole environmental doctrines on this issue. It is called the diversity principle, according to which God can create everything that is possible, and they consider the existence of aliens an inevitable um, consequence of God's omnip omnipotence. Also, the participant uh, Tom Horn, ufologist, he added, I had the extraordinary opportunity to visit Mount uh, Graham in Arizona, where the Vatican Observatory is located and where the so-called Vatican Astronomical Advanced Telescope is located, where, where Vatican astronomers study deep space. Also, we had the opportunity to talk uh, to one of the Vatican's leading astronomers, Guy Consolmagno. The important thing was that he boldly declared that very soon the peoples of, of the whole world will look at these aliens as saviors. These were the, the words by Tom Horn, and also I would like to quote the uh, words of Chris Putnam. He continues, um, there is a complex observatory located on the top of Mount uh, Graham in Arizona, which houses three very powerful telescopes, one of them of the most modern type, the second a radio telescope, and the third large uh, binocular telescope, which is the most powerful telescope in the world with which they get even better images than with the space telescope on Hubble. The infra, um, infrared camera built into this telescope is called Lucifer, a very strange name for the camera. The name was given by German astronomers from the Max Planck Institute, and the Vatican is part of this whole conglomerate. So, they work together, and all this technology is used in the field of astro uh, astrobiology, with which uh, they are looking for the alien life.
Tom also said that they were very surprised that um, they were even allowed to get this information and the way astronomers uh, related to this. They were um, surprised that they are corresponding to this topic. Um, also, I would like to quote his uh, words. So, the Vatican is not just studying alien life. Corrado Balducci, a representative of Vatican, said that extraterrestrial, extraterrestrials exist not only in other words, but worlds, but also on the Earth. The Vatican Embassy collects information about aliens all over the world, and the Vatican representatives believe in all this very seriously, regardless of our personal opinions and what we think about this all. This um, information is freely available and, you know, it raises more questions than it gives answers. And we were thinking, like, if the Vatican itself is interested in extraterrestrial civilizations, maybe we should also look into it. Thank you, Irina. Uh, you know, friends, while searching for information, We've come across uh, this statement on the website of uh, the Vatican Observatory, and I quote, For 400 years, the Vatican has been advancing scientific inquiry and promoting awareness of how our universe works. And here are a few examples of our contribution throughout the centuries. This is still a quote. Unique among large observatories, the Vatican Observatory has specialized in long-term survey projects from the 19th century map of the heavens to modern catalogs of galaxies, open clusters and peculiar stars. Observatory scientists study a range of related sciences such as quantum gravity, meteorites and moon rocks and possible life on planets orbiting other stars." End quote. Given the best possible equipment and the best scientists in the world being affiliated with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, one would think the contributions to the world of science and society in general would be impressive. Well, this may very well be the case, but the works that are openly available are more philosophical in nature. But what could the Vatican scientists find to cause the rhetoric to change from no aliens to they are out there and we should establish good relationships with them. Are they talking about a specific race? Any chance this has something to do with the impending global cataclysms? And what is interesting, around the same time UNICEF released a video in which an alien child is being integrated into a school on Earth. Yes, we see this image now. And what could be the reason for creating such a commercial? After all, someone had to approve the project and allocate funds from the budget. If you look for answers from bloggers and YouTubers, their assumptions on this subject are frankly frightening. You can see all sorts of things, including the theory that they want to feed us to reptiles, drawing attention to the coat of arms of the Visconti family first chosen by Archbishop of Milan, Antonio Visconti, on which a serpent devours a man. And in the same video, the author draws attention to a striking resemblance to a giant reptile of the Pope's audience hall building used by the Pope as an alternative to St. Peter's Square for conducting his Wednesday morning general audience. The outside shape of this building looks quite similar to the spaceships of the visitors from the popular TV show V Maria talked about previously. Also, many YouTubers wonder what is inside the Vatican's top secret library and vault. Well, historical books and artifacts, as well as the results of scientific research, concern everyone on this planet and should be available to the public. Since they are not, people are speculating and usually only bad news are being kept secret as long as possible and come up with all sorts of theories. But as they say, there is no smoke without fire. Wouldn't you want to know the truth?
Yes. The truth is exactly what we need right now. And thank you so much for everyone who is watching this kaleidoscope of facts with us. We are reading your comments and we are very exciting, excited that you're participating with us. Please, if you would like, record a short video feedback of you watching this conference. And we send it to our email and our email is info at alatra.tv. And we will include your video feedback in the next Alatra News segment. And also, if you are a true researcher, just like all of us, please join our team of volunteers and we can keep exploring this topic with you together. Again, that email is info at alatra.tv. And thank you so much for being with us. We also know that we live at the end of times and all indications show us that current climatic events will turn into a catastrophe of global proportions. These facts are not to be taken lightly. Let's hear what information Jana has for us. Jeanne, it is said that we are approaching terrible cataclysms, and that is a cyclicity. Is it true? Yes, it's true. This arm of Safara is approaching the near point of intergalactic interactions. You call it the Orion arm in your Milky Way galaxy. Every 12,000 years it crosses this point in far and near interactions. Last time it was in far interaction, which caused serious catastrophic changes on Earth. This time we are approaching the near point. The devastation caused by cataclysms is expected to be even more catastrophic. It happens once every 24,000 years. Jana, you said our planet, which is in the solar system of the Orion arm in the Milky Way galaxy, has to pass the interaction point which will cause changes on the planet Earth. Can you help humanity to avoid such devastating consequences? Yes, we can. But for this, it's necessary that the entire humanity would ask for our help in advance and voluntarily. Yes, what Janna is talking about in this video is a disheartening fact that already has confirmations all around the globe. And it shows that we are living in a time of crossroads, a time of a global choice for humanity. All the prophets have spoken of this time and of the great opportunity people will have to unite to build a society worthy of a human. Let's watch a segment from the conference held on March 20th, 2021. Creative Society, what the prophets dreamed of. Elizabeth Romova will talk about the harbingers of the last days in the world religions and the facts indicating that they are becoming true today. All prophets in Jesus Christ great, gave great emphasis on the Day of Judgment and the last times before it. In order for us to know the uh, coming of this time, the prophets left us a great deal of the foreshadowing. If you have never been interested in this subject, you may think that our times are no different. But they are not. And today we are going to give you the facts that will open your eyes to the truth that thousand of years ago the Prophet spoke of our times. One of the signs of the last days, according to the Bible prophecy, will be that uh, there will be life in the Dead Sea in Israel. And its waters 
will be made healthy and there will be plenty of fish in this water. Dead Sea is uh, nearly 10 times salter than the ocean. Nothing survives in such a hypersaline environment. But in 2016, breaking news, Israel reported discovery of freshwater ponds uh, thinning with fish and wildlife on the stones of the Dead Sea. Another forerunner of the approach of Judgment Day is the blooming in the desert. A habit narrated by Abu Huraira stated that the prophet peace upon him said, the hour shall be not established upon the time is uh, constricted and the year is like a month and a month is like a week and the week is like a day and the day is like an hour and the hour is like a fire of, of flame of fire. In 2018, rains hit uh, always dislated uh, by dry Saudi Arabia, flooding the desert and causing floodings resulting a desert in bloom. Some can think that it's great the Dead Sea is coming to life and desert is blooming, but it's not. Uh, let's uh, see uh, some hadiths in Islam which say that an hour of judgment will not come until the rains begin to fall, the flooding rains. And what is interesting is that in recent decades, rainfalls had increased many times around the world, leading to unprecedented increase in the numbers of floods. Since 1970s, the number of floods in the world has increased more than 200 times um, before that uh, there used to be a tenth severe floods per year, and there now is 160 or even more per year. And the year 2020 has broken many records to rainfalls and flooding in many countries around the world. The next prediction is related uh, to the previous one is uh, appreciates a great number of sinkholes and failures. According to the authentic hadith, the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, said, and an hour of judgment will not come until entire tribes sink into the ground. Scientists openly uh, declare now that all over the world there are many times more crust sinkholes, especially settlements. How did the Prophet know this? And probably the most obvious and most terrible forerunner, uh, which is indicated in the script, is uh, increase the number of earthquakes. Abu Huraira said. Uh, that the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, an hour of judgment will not come until the earthquakes become more frequent. The Bible in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 21 says, there will be a great earthquakes and in various places, famines and uh, Besselines, there will be terrors in great signs of heaven. And in conference, at the last conference on December 20, Creative Society, together we can, we uh, cited statistics on the increased number and strength of earthquakes around the planet. Over the few months that have been passed at that moment, the level of seismic activity continued to grow, and the first week of March, it was 232 large earthquakes accurated the Earth, which is more than five times higher, and this is exactly what synchronizes of cataclysms look like. The reason uh, for the increase of the number of earthquakes, volcanic eruptions of the planet, a weakening of magnetic field and poles shifted as well as over climatic cataclysms of the planet. It is astronomical uh, uh, cyclonic order of 12,000 years, and many scientists have come to this conclusion. The, fro the prophets were well aware of the fact that every 12,000 years our planet goes through a period of terrible cataclysms. And therefore, information about this cycle has been preserved in various scriptures. For example, in some texts of Hindu scriptures Mahabharata and Manushmirtu, the original cycle length of 12,000 years is still preserved. Zoroastrians, Greeks also believed in this cycle. And even in the Bible, in the third book of Ezra, chapter 14, verses 10 to 17, it's clearly said about the cycle of cataclysms in 12,000 years.
Before that, we spoke only about the uh, harbingers, but Armageddon is described by the prophets separately, seeing the dynamics of the growth of cataclysms on the planet. The understanding comes that the Day of Judgment is really very close. In all the scriptures, it is said that uh, there is one day the mountains, now motionless, will begin to move, the sun will burn people with fire, everything will be turned to ash, and the sea will make an oath, and revolve these stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heaven will shake. There will be no stone left unturned here, everything will be destroyed. There is how the prophets told us about the earthquakes, solar radiation, droughts and fires along the rifts, a huge tsunami in the final, the exhalation of the earth. Jesus Christ said the day uh, to run the mountains to do turn. And today you will hear about how we can implement the second scenario, which the prophets also spoke about. It's responsibility to make a choice between two paths. Let's make the right choice. We, as a society, as the citizens of the planet Earth, are now in the crossroads, at the moment when we have to make a choice. All the prophets have spoken of these times, and they said that humanity will have two ways. This is either Armageddon uh, and the annihilation of humanity or unification and the Golden Age. Today we have talked about many historical facts that confirm almost limitless possibilities of the Anunnaki, that they can create planets or entire universes and that they can certainly change the cause of cataclysms. But we also characterize as uh, beings and uh, found a lot of evidence for this as highly spiritual. And what is the most valuable right that God gave to a person? This is the right uh, to choose, of course, the right to choose and the right to conscious growth, transformation, as a single person uh, and as humanity is a unit. And the Anunnaki is a race that consciously serves the spiritual world, which is in constant contact uh, with the spiritual, or which are in the constant contact with the spiritual world, will never violate this right of people to choose. The Anunnaki as beings who value time and their potential are with us now, and they are extending a helping hand to us, but we must take it ourselves. So what prevents us from doing this? pride and the consumer format that we have been well uh, forming for about 6,000 years. The information that we have surrounded ourselves with and that teaches us to do nothing. But that was until recently. And on March the 20th uh, at the conference, Creative Society, where the prophets dreamed of, a sign came true. The religions of the world have been cleansed and the words spoken by the prophets were straight of their husks and they sounded throughout the world. The truth about the world in which they bequeathed, the prophets bequeathed us to live was revealed. And you and I have this honor to build it. In the time of the prophets, it was not possible to make their dream reality, but now it is possible. Now there are technologies with the help of which we people can communicate with the whole world as we do today. We can make this news fly around the globe and become the foundation for the unity of people. Also, thanks to the technology, the information that is shared in the videos uh, with the participation by Igor Mikhail is available to the whole world. And with Jana on TikTok, right? Um, well, it was possible to communicate uh, from China and Thailand and Finland and Australia, and there were no barriers and restrictions. So thanks to this technology, we now have this opportunity to simultaneously interpret uh, today's conference into 13 languages of the world. And the truth about who the Anunnaki are, where with the, just how beautiful they are as a race, and that we can take an example from them and build not only creative society, but also an ideal society 
So this is now heard all over the world. It's time for us to grow up, take responsibility, build decent conditions on Earth, and accept a helping hand to serve this world for us and for our children. Yes, thank you, Olga. And already today, millions of people are working towards a better future. More than 99% of people want to live in the creative society. But the only thing is that not all people know about this project just yet. We should not just sit and wait for someone to change everything for us. This will not work. By peaceful means, we need to unite and create the world in which all people will benefit. And there is nothing stopping us except the artificially created division, learned helplessness, and the fact that we have been slaves of the system for the past 6,000 years. But this cannot continue this way. In the creative society, life of each human will be of the highest value. Therefore, we can forget about violence, wars, and conflict. Wouldn't that be great? Just think about this. Healthcare and education will be free and available to all. Each human will have all the basic needs met. Now, let's talk about technology, which will make our lives better and easier. It is the technology that will not be available to us in the consumerist society in which we live today. Technology, we can include free energy, prolongation of life, wasteless production, ability of managing microworld and manipulating manner, instantaneous acquisition of any skill, exploration of space and other galaxies. Wouldn't that be great? There are amazing and tremendous opportunities which will make the life of each human enjoyable, worry-free, and meaningful. Most importantly, by building the creative society, we will be able to not only survive, but we will be able to become part of the intergalactic society. Just think about this wonderful opportunity. Let's expand our worldview and look past the patterns that have been formed in the consumerist society. Our future and the future of our kids and grandkids depends on the action on, of each person today. So why don't you just find out more about the project? Go on the website, alatraunites.com. Learn about the Project Creative Society. And once you understand for yourself all the significance, all the value, and all the benefits, then share this information with every person you know. Because together, we can inform over 7 billion people on the planet and move towards the realization of this incredible project for all of us. And as we said before, the Creative Society is the world that all the prophets dreamed about. And this topic was raised at the historic event, Creative Society, What the Prophets Dreamed Of, on March 20th, 2021. The greatest of all people, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke about the significant day when people from around the world would gather and speak the truth in order to remove all the chaff from world religions. And now I would like to invite everyone to watch uh, the trailer for this historic conference that took place on March 20th, 2021. Where is the truth? And where is the lie. So many opinions, speculation, distortions. How can we find the truth in all this? How to sort the wheat from the chaff? How to understand what the prophets really wanted to tell us? You will find answers to these and many other questions in the video conference. Creative Society, What the Prophets Dreamed Of, which took place on the 20th of March, 2021. 
People from all over the world have voiced the truth and cleansed it from millennial distortions. Now, everyone can learn about the world, all the prophets really wanted for us, and the truth all the world's religions speak about. We just saw how people themselves fulfilled the prophecy on March 20th. On the TikTok account, Alien Soul 28, there are also prophecies about our future. There are always two choices of development for a civilization. We are ones that choose and implement prophecies the chance to build a creative society offered to us is huge it is available and so close to us we just need to take it let's hear from jana herself as we know major cataclysms are about to happen on earth where they will start. We are trying to resolve this issue. We are attempting to negotiate so this doesn't happen. We feel very sorry for Korea, for Japan, because very good people live there. We are doing everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. What you said about China is shocking. What actions can they take? Can they avoid this process? Of course. If Maitreya visits their country before the start of global cataclysms, then China will escape this fate. But that is not in his plans for now, as far as we know. And to a large extent, it depends on what is happening in China itself. People are blind because consumerism has obscured the truth from them. And if people eventually are able to step over their pride, then Maitreya will definitely visit them, and they will become the greatest country in the world. Before the main contact with humans, a delegation from the Arab countries will be formed. The Arabs will be the first to be given the highest honor to be the first visitors to Vanfim. Why exactly the Arabs? Because they are actually the ones who will support the events that are coming, the changes that are coming in the near future. And it will be the Arabs who will be the ones to recognize the one who has come. They will be the first of those ten thousands whom the greatest prophet Muhammad spoke about. Was there really a prophet? Of course he was. After all, he is the greatest of humans. Oh, great changes await India. It will be a prosperous country with happy people who will have no need for anything. But that's of course if they recognize their Kalki avatar, if they invite him to visit India, and if he accepts their invitation and comes, well, then Kalki avatar will be able to find a good and faithful follower and a close friend for him, who can please Kalki avatar with his care for people. But so far this friend has no idea that he is destined to become a friend of Kalki avatar himself. And also, India will be the only country that will be granted the right to grow real grapes from Vamfim, the wine of which will be brought to them by the Arabs, the most worthy of all humankind, who will have the highest honor of visiting Vamfim. Shan, the people ask, what is the future of Afghanistan? Afghanistan will be a beautiful country and everything will be fine there, because there are really good people living in Afghanistan, hardened by grief, but who have retained their humanness. But unfortunately, Afghanistan will not be one of the first countries to join the Creative Society, but it will not be the last one either. Jana, could you please tell what languages will people speak in the future? 
All humanity will speak one language, and it will be one for all people. Jana, what would you wish to all of humanity? The most important thing – to survive. To survive in what is coming. Thank you, Jana, for informing us. We sure do have a lot on our plate, but we know that we deserve a better future for all. These prophecies are not for a particular group of people, but for all of us. And it is time to unite and build a creative society as one human family. Dear friends, we are coming to the end of our broadcast, but as you have witnessed, it is only the beginning. We, the people, have a choice to make now, as time is running out. With Anunnaki on our side, we can become the civilization we were meant to be. Peaceful, loving and understanding society where human life is the priority number one. And let us imagine for a minute what type of life we can have in just five years or less if we choose to build a creative society. We can become a real civilization. And what are the three conditions to become a civilization? They are unification of all people, absence of a tyrant, and possession of free energy. These are the conditions to make an evolutionary quantum leap to be able to manipulate matter, instantly heal our bodies, prolongate human life, instantaneously acquire skills and, yes, fly to other galaxies and colonize new planets. It might be that Jana's tic-tac blinking that got you here today, but we hope you have received more information that you came for and now understand the true essence of Anunnaki, why they are here and how they can help us if we choose to. We live in the most wonderful time where primordial knowledge is available to us and we no longer need to guess or stay deceived. Let's break the 6,000 year cycle of lies and manipulations. Let's not miss this chance to become a real human family. No one is going to do it for us. Not the media, not the governments. Anunnaki can help us, but they cannot interfere with our free choice. Do we really want to ruin this contact and focus on things that do not matter? Or are we ready to make a quantum leap into the future we all deserve. With the technologies we have, even right now, we can build a creative society across the globe in less than five years. We just need to unite under one idea to build our future together. This can happen very quickly if each of us takes personal responsibility, informs everyone and starts acting where you are planted right now towards a creative society. The great news is we do not need to fix anything that is broken, rotten, and falling apart. We need to start building a new and exciting future for all of us, and the old will disappear. Thank you so much to our viewers we really enjoyed your active participation in the comments. And we know that we have answered all the questions that you had. But if you still have any questions, let's continue our research together. Please reach out to us. Let's work together for a better future for all of us. We would like to thank every volunteer of Alatra International 
public movement for their time, attention and effort before, during, and after the conference. We are the creative force behind the Creative Society, and everyone is welcome to join us. Of course, we would like to thank Igor Mikhailovich Danilov and everyone's favorite Anunnaki, Zhanna, for the truth that is coming back into the world. Let's build a creative society together. If those very archaeologists showed to the community all artifacts which they found, and historians would call things by their proper names, if we go around museum stashes and extract everything that is available, pay attention and face the truth, then everything we said turns out to be absolutely known facts. So it turns out to be quite strange on the one hand. We talk about science fiction, which is confirmed by lots of evidence. Yet why is this not welcomed and not supported by our scientists and everyone else? Because it is disadvantageous. For whom it is disadvantageous in the first place? It is disadvantageous for politicians and priests. That's it. And why is it disadvantageous? Because both the former and the later one will lose power. Priests have invented such a world, where life is only on our planet. But what about other billions and billions of galaxies, with billions, a huge number of planets, which are even similar to ours, and on which even we can live, so to say. There are a countless number of them, and lots of them are empty, so far where we still have to come. And there are a lot of planets inhabited by others. However, this undermines what? This undermines what is written, written by priests. After all, none of the prophets spoke about this. Priests made it up themselves and wrote that God created a human. He took him from dust and by various means. And a human is only here on this little planet. How many people did they send to fire somewhere else? Those who spoke about science, why? They are scared to lose their power. What does this indicate? This indicates that El lives in each of us. That's true. It is enough to create conditions, and He will be reborn. Isn't that so? To give a modern person opportunities to become this El, and He will become Him, any person. Therefore, while developing, we must think, and first of all, create such conditions so that we would never have else anymore. So that everything vile, everything inhuman could not develop. Everything that stands against a human must not be present here. Well, everything humane, that on which we can really unite and bring benefit to ourselves and to our descendants must be encouraged and developed. Isn't it right? It is right. So, my friends, not everything is a fairy tale in this world. And even any fairy tale contains a lot of truth. Whereas today our science fiction story is just a... just a little reality from the huge, tremendous world, with its enormous opportunities, so, let us roll up our sleeves, put on comfortable shoes and go ahead. Right? Right. And for the start, let's learn at least to simply love each other. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends.